So I'm Praveen from the Galaxy Technologies. So I'm the trainer who's going to take uh, classes for Docker and uh, Kubernetes course. Okay, so today it will be introduction class for the Docker and uh, Kubernetes. So what I'm going to teach inside this Docker and Kubernetes it's like a demo for uh, Docker and Kubernetes. Okay. So actually today I was just waiting a uh, few more people need to join. So that's the reason uh, I was waiting for them. So okay, let's start now. It's already uh, 15 minutes late. So before that, let me introduce myself. Myself, Praveen Kumar. I have total 11 years of experience in IT. So I started my career as an AX administrator. It's one of the Unix flavor. Then I switched my domain from AX to the Linux administration. And uh, I worked on Linux administration for a couple of years. And then I moved to AWS Cloud. So I have very good experience on the AWS Cloud and Azure Cloud and uh, very good exposure on the devops so from last three years onwards i started working on devops because i got opportunity in my organization to work on the devops and uh, in devops especially i have very good experience in uh, kubernetes because from last one year onwards i started working on uh, kubernetes especially until residence so I was a single person in that project who handled uh, end to end like uh, from containerizing to deployment and the managing the kubernetes cluster building the kubernetes cluster like creating docker files for applications java microservices and uh, writing the jenkins files creating the helm charts and uh, deploying that applications into the kubernetes cluster and managing the kubernetes cluster and especially into the azure kubernetes service as a uh, kubernetes service so very good experience on the ak side okay overall so this is about my professional experience coming to the teaching experience uh, initially i used to teach linux administration course with the real time scenarios to get the job for the student and afterwards i switched from uh, linux administration to the aws training and still i am taking aws sessions and uh, then and uh, devops sessions also so this is uh, the second batch we are taking as on the kubernetes course okay so this is about my teaching experience. Now, before we are going into the Kubernetes, first of all, why we need Kubernetes? Can anyone tell me what is Kubernetes? Anyone have idea? Uh, Kubernetes is a uh, container orchestration tool that is used to automate. Uh, okay. So, what do you mean by orchestration? Guys, those who don't want to speak, uh, please go on mute. Clustering. So, what do you mean by containerization? Containers. See here. Previously, I hope like most of you guys know, like you might be you are from the infrastructure background or maybe from the testing background or maybe some of you are from uh, programming background, right? So most of you know, like we have, we were dealing with the physical servers, right? So if any application want to deploy previously in 1990 to 2000, 2005, we were dealing with the physical servers, installing an application inside a box, physical box on top of that there will be operating system will be there and on top of that we'll install deploy the applications to run any application and then virtualization came into the picture then we'll install one hypervisor on top of one physical box and then we can create multiple virtual machines that is a virtualization uh, revolution came into the picture and after that now in the current scenario we are using dockerization every applications are installing inside the docker most of the companies are preferring and migrating from virtualization to the dockerization so what is dockerization that we'll start discussing from tomorrow onwards what is docker why we need it so i think uh, those already completed devops or maybe most of you guys might know what is docker dockerization so containerizing the applications so why we containerize what is containerization that will start discussing from the docker sessions onwards so nowadays every organization their applications are converting into as an dockerization, which means containerization. So containers will be created. 
so in the real world in the enterprise world lot of uh, servers will be there okay maybe lot of uh, machines will be there inside that lot of uh, docker software will be installed on top of that multiple containers will be running so like that lot of machines will be there so individually each machine is going to run with the docker but how it is going to manage okay so we will call as an orchestration so orchestration means what basically you might be heard musical orchestra so what is musical orchestra what is musical orchestra so one person will be guiding everyone instructing a bunch of people with set of rules set of like a, a rules so that they are going to follow him right so uh, let me show you the picture so if you see here one person is going to stand with the stick and he is going to instruct the bunch of people based upon his instruction the best music is going to come right so everyone is going to listen this person so he is called as an orchestrator okay the same way here you have bunch of uh, docker machines which are running with the docker so who is going to manage it like auto scaling of uh, a container if we due to heavy load the container should be auto scaled or the container is died then new container should be created load balancing so lot of things will be there so who is going to manage from the back end so that is called orchestration tool so there comes the kubernetes so kubernetes is an orchestration tool which manages all your docker containers docker nodes okay so kubernetes is not only the orchestration tool we have few more orchestration tools are also available like lot of orchestration tools are available like uh, kubernetes is one of them and we have a docker swam and uh, we have a cloud foundry and uh, mesos these are the like enterprise uh, orchestration tools most of the companies might using mesos which is from the apache and a uh, cloud foundry or docker swam and kubernetes so apart from this uh, there are some other tools also available these are the tools will not be using in the enterprise level so some small tools might be there so these are like famous four tools which will be using in the organizations enterprise organizations okay so here among all this why everyone like most of the ratio is using by the kubernetes so why because the first reason it's an open source okay it's an open source and it's created by the google and google was using this kubernetes for their back end uh, containers from 2006 onwards itself okay so you might be heard google downtime for last year it's only i think 1% okay so very very less downtime google will provide because back end they are using this containerization technology with their own uh, software called uh, orchestration tool this kubernetes okay and later on they hand over this kubernetes tool to the cncf cloud native uh, computing foundation so they hand over to the cncf organization because this is an open source see in open source also again we'll have multiple things like paying we need to pay some fee for licensing or maybe for support but kubernetes is completely free free of cost we are going to get the software and we have a very huge community for this kubernetes also and that's the reason majority of the companies are using kubernetes and compared to docker swam so docker swam is a product of own docker okay so but lot of benefits are available into the kubernetes compared to the docker swam like lot of components features are available in the kubernetes which are not available inside the docker swam okay and uh, kubernetes is will support two types of uh, containerization one is a uh, docker and another one is rocket d so these are the two container technologies are available in the market so kubernetes will support this docker and rocket d 90% every organization will use docker maybe few companies might be using rocket d containerization so kubernetes will support both it's an orchestration tool so front end it can be docker or it can be rocket d okay and uh, why uh, another major reason is scalability okay so here kubernetes will help us per scale your applications very very easily okay 
So what are the applications we are deploying into the cluster like uh, into the Kubernetes cluster? So it will run on the Docker containers, but in the Kubernetes terminology, we call it as a pod. So easily we can scale up uh, within very, very less time. We can scale up the applications. Okay. And uh, another important reason is version control. So what is version control? Uh, to track the changes. Yeah. With the version number. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. a GitHub. Okay. So what do you do in GitHub? What is the advantage? Why we call it as a version control? Multiple developers should be able to handle the code and they can check out and another person can also work on the same and uh, they can combine the code and they can uh, manage uh, multiple resources. Okay. Uh, maintaining the different versions of uh, any software uh, that version control can be managed with the, with the help of version control. We can manage them. Yeah, they can also roll back and go back to the previous version in case of an issue. Yep. The major is we can roll back, right? Version control means we can maintain multiple versions of that. Like developers will write do a lot of changes to the code and uh, what are the changes we are doing so that can be uh, saved as a version so we can go back to the previous version if you want the same way here also. Like in Kubernetes, if you see version control, so update deployed parts using newer versions of applications, uh, images and roll back to an earlier deployment if the current version is not stable. So here, whatever the deployment we are doing, okay, we deployed one application like develop uh, developers change the code and that will be available in the source code. And by taking that source code, we created a Docker image and the Docker image will be deployed onto the cluster but it is not working as per expectations. Again, we can roll back to the previous version what it was running before. So that will be immediately it is going to be run. Like for example, uh, in Kubernetes, we have uh, six application deployment strategies. So if we go through this uh, website, so we should know like uh, different uh, ways to deploy the applications. Most of these are the six strategies to deploy the application. So recreate ramped uh, blue green deployment, Kenry deployment, AB testing, shadow deployment. So here what it will do ramped means uh, as a rolling update or incremental version B slowly rolled out and replacing version A. We'll discuss uh, most of this RAM or blue green or canary in our coming sessions, how we are going to update our applications. So here we see one uh, chart. Okay, this is the one. So here if you see uh, ramped means if you see here rollback uh, duration, it is taking a lot of time. So rollback means you're going into the previous version. If your application were deployed with the RAM, it means a rolling update option. It will take a lot of time, but uh, cloud cost will be less because means if you are deploying this into the uh, cloud environment, then cloud cost will be very, very less, but it is taking a lot of time to roll back. So if it is taking a lot of time to roll back, there will be a uh, lot of uh, downtime will be there for your application, right? So if you take the blue green, the very famous we use in the real time for our applications to deploy. So we use blue green deployment and you see rollback duration it's not even taking like very very less time so there is no even one percent is also it's not selected it's less time but uh, cloud cost is more little bit more why because it is going to be create separate set of uh, containers to run like two parallel set of containers are going to be run so e easily you can switch to the older version so we'll see how we can do this blue green deployment okay so version b is released alongside version a then the traffic is switched to version b so it will take very very minimal time to roll back to the previous version but cost wise it will be a little bit more but here important is rollback duration so how quickly we can go back to our previous version which was running early for our applications so this is how we can do with the kubernetes so version control we can do we can switch back to the previous versions okay 
so that is another good advantage and i was talking about scalability software can be deployed for the first time in a scale out manner across pods and deployments can be scaled in or out at any time so we are going to see how we can scale out and scale in our applications very in a quickly manner and easy and fast how we can scale out and scale in our applications like containers how we can do that so that is an another advantage inside this kubernetes okay so now um see we'll have two types of uh, kubernetes will be there one is a manager kubernetes service and another one is you are going to manage like manually you are installing the kubernetes on maybe on vmware virtual machines or maybe aws virtual machines or it may be any cloud whether azure or google cloud you are creating virtual machines by using any terraform script creating infrastructure and you can use terraform script to install kubernetes it's like a manual process you are installing in those virtual machines means you are managing them because you are installing downloading the software from the kubernetes uh, google page and you are installing it manually and you are going to support it no one is going to help you but uh, if you don't want that you can go with the managed service so what is managed service so we have a case in the azure and e case in the aws and gk in the google cloud so they are providing you this service so they are going to take care if anything happens to the cluster so we don't worry we can raise a case with the vendor so they are going to take care of our cluster environment okay managed service so most of the organizations will use uh, managed service or some people might use uh, the open shift like uh, inside the open shift it's nothing like it basically kubernetes is like a plain version and uh, red hat guys they took this uh, plain version of kubernetes and they did some modification and modification to a few object objects and they wrapped up it's like an open shift okay so it can be anything but mostly it will be in the cloud like either aks or maybe uh, gke or maybe eks okay or some companies may be using um, manually installing okay again manually installing also there will be two process okay so one is called as an uh, cops and a cubadium means when you are installing manually so no one is going to manage it's managing by you then i have a question installing. i have a question yep so you will be teaching us uh, google kubernetes or aks which which one gk gks right yes okay great thank you okay so manually we are going to install on uh, cops and cubadium uh, so these are the two methods we'll discuss like uh, how we can use and i'll show you any one of the method uh, how to install even in not about the managed service manually if i want to install how we can do that that we can automate by using some uh, terraform script or uh, any like uh, if you are using azure then we can go with arm templates or maybe aws we can go cloud formation okay in real time that way we'll automate so that we whenever we want to create a new cluster we'll create a virtualization virtual environment with a terraform script and we we'll use the same terraform script to install this cluster software and the same terraform scripts you can use in the real time to create your managed service also whether it's an aks or gke or eks in the real time we don't go to the console and gui and we manually we don't create our clusters we'll use uh, terraform scripts only okay or maybe arm templates so this is about manager services again it depends upon the organization which organization is choosing uh, uh, which um, like a manager service whether aks or gk again it depends upon lot of dependencies and maybe uh, how the applications are running if they are running any dependency with the windows applications or windows databases should be connected then they might use aks okay so it's completely depend upon the applications what they're running based on that they will choose which manager service they want to go which is very more comfortable for them so now uh, we'll talk about the resources what we are going to discuss so compulsory we need to know about first uh, the docker so we should know what is docker and uh, how it came into the picture and uh, how to create images of the docker images and writing the docker files and uh, um, basically dockers will be for stateless applications stateless stateless means it 
doesn't require any data should be stored but if any data should be stored that is called as a stateful application so for that we need to create volumes so how to create volumes in the docker and uh, how to store this docker images once we create the docker images and uh, where should we store it's like an artifactory like nexus or jfrog artifactory we can store those docker images so we'll discuss all this uh, docker components because uh, as i said see end of the day in kubernetes also it is going to run on the docker it's like it creates a container and it's run as a docker container so we should have very good knowledge in the docker architecture how it will work okay to troubleshoot the docker and the logs to see of each container how it will works and once we finish with the docker then we'll come into the kubernetes okay so we'll discuss uh, kubernetes architecture like uh, what is master server what are the nodes and what are the components are running on master and what are the components will run on the uh, worker nodes how it will work how it will communicate and how we can access uh, cluster through api calls how we can send api call to the master so that it will respond to us that will discuss kubernetes architecture and components and uh, as i said kubernetes uh, can be installed uh, in many ways like as i said this is uh, one of the method uh, cops and kubedm which we use in the real time environment and uh, like for example we are developers or maybe we are administrators like devops engineers then we want to test it locally before i want to deploy it on the real environment then i can have a kubernetes cluster environment even in my local also with the help of minikube but in minikube you don't have much features not all the features you are going to get to test it so when i was working on the kubernetes for deploying the applications containerizing the applications i created my own environment in the cloud and there first i'll test it everything and then i'll same thing i'll implement it on the cluster i never used minikube but i will show you how to create minikube environment and uh, some basic things how you can test it because again we need to have separate environment to test it because everything will be not available inside the minikube limited uh, resources we can able to get and as i said another one is on uh, kubeadm and uh, that is one way to install the kubernetes cl cluster on any environment like whether it can be vmware environment hyper v virtual mean on premises data center or maybe in the cloud you are creating manually virtual machines on top of that we can install kubeadm on any of the cloud and cops is also same like uh, cops will reduce the workload like in kubeadm you need to follow a lot of steps in cops previously this cops was supporting for only aws but now cops is also support for uh, digital ocean uh, azure and gk also in this clouds also uh, there we can able to install with the cops again this is also it's like a, we are managing the cluster no one is going to manage only virtual machines will be managed by the vendors and we are going to manage the cluster apart from this as just now i said um, managed service aks eks and gk see everything is same the kubernetes cluster concept will be the same only thing is you if you are using gk you are going to raise a case with google cloud whenever the issue comes or maybe a case that is the difference little bit differences will be there apart from that cluster functionality cluster features everything will be same and uh, given this networking we should understand how the pod networking will be there how internal it will communicate each other different work nodes will be there so that networking part will be covered and uh, the resources of the kubernetes like what is namespace what is the purpose of namespace in real time definitely we'll use multiple namespaces to deploy our applications so what is the purpose of this namespace and uh, how we will deploy our containers like applications inside the cluster multiple ways are there like replica set daemon set stateful set and deployment so this is we are going to discuss and uh, here this pod is nothing but a it's a container okay so while we talk about pod we'll talk more about it's like a wrapper wrapping up a container on top of that is called as a pod okay so to deploy this pod we'll use either deployment or replica set or daemon set or stateful set each one will discuss in detail what is the difference between each one of them and uh, which one is more suitable to deploy our applications and when we're deploying these applications as a pod 
then we have many other resources we need to add it in the manifest files like configuration file like labels and selectors like we can provide labels right you know what is the purpose of labels so identify easily some like you have hundreds of containers are running you want to figure it out which are production containers or which are um, staging environment or which are specific application related so you can give the labels and you can filter it out okay and selectors means what so you are selecting one application to go and uh, like for for example you want to configure load balancer so how come this load balancer knows that this load balancer should be belongs to so and so application so with the help of selector so what are the selector name we are giving in the application configuration that selector name will give into the load balancer so that it will identify okay i am going to create this load balancer for this set of applications so that's why we configure selectors and uh, config maps config maps is also very very important in uh, configuring the real environment like in real time uh, some applications are dependent to communicate with the database or maybe some applications are dependent on intern another part like um, let me show you in the diagram so that easily you can understand let's say assume this is our cluster environment and these are like some uh, worker nodes are available and uh, assume this is the master server in real time your database might be inside your kubernetes cluster also running as a container or maybe it is uh, running as a separate database maybe database as a service assume if you are taking aws maybe it's an rds service separate it's running and this is eks cluster assume so one of the application want to connect to the database so this application will go and connect to the database so to connect to the database this application needs credentials to connect the database and the url to connect the database if it's a dns url is there the dns url should be configured inside this application when you are deploying the application so when the application is getting started so in the process it should go and connect to the database so where we are providing those credentials and the url of the database so in the config maps we will provide the credentials and the url of this database so that it will use at the runtime and it will go and connect the database and it will establish the connection okay so that's the reason and another reason is maybe you are having multiple applications like we call it as a multiple might be microservices so one this one want to this container want to connect to this container there is a dependency to run your application so how it is going to connect so in the config maps we'll define this application name equal to it's a like key value pair and we'll give this uh, service name of this container so that it will go and connect to this one so in the deployment process it will be uh, hierarchy will be there like first it should deploy this one application because without deploying this application if you're deploying this application this is a dependent on this one if it is not available then this will not work your container will be not in the running state because it is expecting something to communicate with this one so this url okay service url service we call it as a service disk or url we don't give ip here because containers will not have a permanent ip they are, they are not uh, immortal right they are mortal so anytime they can die so we, we give service disk or url so that url also will define in the config maps so that is the reason we use config maps for every application so not only this one config maps we also use to change the values right for example in the application to run the application as i said this is one of the example to connect the database or maybe to connect the other microservices or other applications apart from this there will be some configuration will be there for that application like what is the log file location and uh, what is the timeout session timeout timing all this will be in the properties file that properties file we are converting into the config maps so those things we can change in the runtime that is an advantage of the config maps and the difference between secrets on config maps is in the config maps you can see these credentials as a plain text format so we should not give credentials or any key pair key values like instead of username password sometimes we use keys to connect to the another database or another service so those should be encrypted encoded not encrypted encoded inside the secrets so we use secrets to encode the 
uh, credentials or any key pairs inside this secrets or else everything we'll use in the config maps so how we can use it that will be discussed and uh, jobs we can schedule the jobs also it's like a cron jobs we can schedule the jobs and uh, Init content. What is the purpose of init container? Whenever you want to uh, create a container, application container, before that, init container will be created and it will go and check everything is working fine or not, and then it will allow to uh, deploy the actual container of the application and how we create, what is the purpose of it, also we'll discuss. And another important is um, services, network services. What are the application we are deploying? So it will communicate internally but how it can be accessed to the external world so that we can configure either node port or load balancer or cluster IP what is the difference between these three and when we use this uh, services in which scenario for database we use cluster IP for a web application we use uh, load balancer okay we don't use much on uh, node port mostly we use load balancer or cluster IP internally it will be cluster ip and externally we use load balancer and uh, again here also we have a volumes concept so persistent volume and persistent volume claim so when we use uh, storage as i said basically this dockerization will be for stateless uh, application means the data is not going to be stored what are the countries getting created if it is generating any data if you don't want that then we call it as a stateless application but whenever any application like for example you are deploying database so database obviously we want the data compulsory so if you want the data then you should have a volume because if the country got deleted the data will be also erased so what we are going to do we are going to give like external uh, storage to that container so even the country got deleted still the external storage will be available when new container gets created and it will take this volume like in the traditional data center how storage guys are giving uh, lunch to the physical server basically physical server is also having uh, internal hard disk but still we are using storage guys will allocate uh, storage to the physical boxes as a logical storage so we'll create file systems as an administrator and data is getting stored even though server is crashed completely damaged still we have volumes data with us we can attach those volumes to some other machine so that we can access the data same way here so we have a lot of uh, different entities we can uh, create storage like if your cluster environment is in the aws then we can use uh, ebs block storage so we can create a storage and we can create as a physical volume and uh, that physical volume can be used to any of the pod as an persistent volume claim if I created 100 GB of physical volume, that 100 GB of physical volume, we can give it to any of the pod, okay, as a physical volume claim. It is claiming and it, it should have physical volume should be available. If you are using Azure, then Azure disk is there and in Azure, Azure file is there. So multiple storage benefits are there in the Azure. And uh, in Google Cloud, we have GC, GC or GCP persistent disk is also available. So apart from that, you can create uh, iSCSI storages or like NFS storages also you can allocate that we'll discuss in the storage part, like how we can allocate storage to the pods if that application or database is storing the data. And uh, like NFS, host path, MTDIR, multiple uh, storage volume classes are also available. And uh, um, deep dive into the kubernetes security like we call as a role based authentication so we can provide access like for example if we are installing kubernetes okay if someone knows that ip of that master server they can able to log in as a root if they are logging in but here i can give access like for example there are 10 namespaces are running in each namespace different applications are running if I'm giving access, if I give you the IP and access to that cluster, then you can able to access the complete cluster and everything. You can delete the parts of every application. You can delete the cluster. You are going to have full access. Instead of that, we can create uh, access to specific resources only so that we can achieve with the role based authentication with the Kubernetes security. So how we can create that, how we can create service account. 
how I can give a user to access specific resources only that will be configured inside this R bag. And uh, see, Kubernetes resources we can learn it anywhere, right? Uh, we can learn it in YouTube or Udemy courses, but most of people know what are the components of Kubernetes. But if you get opportunity to work in any organization, like in your organization, suddenly they thought to uh, switch to the virtual machine environment to the containerization with Kubernetes. So how we are going to start that is very very important. So you know, okay, you have learned Kubernetes. What is Kubernetes? What is volume? What is what? But if you get opportunity to convert your application the for example, if it is Java application and Java guys converted that application into the spring boot because if it want to run as a microservice, then the application level changes also is required. So they converted into the Java Spring Boot. Their work is done. Now it's DevOps in your turn to write the Docker file for that to containerize because it was running on the virtual machines. Now that software you want to run it on a container, small container. So for that you need to write a Docker file. How we are going to write? So you are going to work with developers because what to write a config file, config map file. How come you know that application is dependent on what things? So whether that application is dependent on connecting database or maybe another pod so that they will know so how to work with developers and how to write that application properties so and uh, how you are passing that properties at the runtime everything will be decided in the docker file so how we are going to docker file create docker file and after creating docker file what you are going to do how you need to run it on the kubernetes cluster so how you are going to do it so you need to configure Jenkins pipelines, okay, declarative pipelines, so that first what it will do, it will create an image and it will create an artifactory and uh, that will be stored on the Nexus or JFrog. And then from there, how we are going to deploy that microservice or application into the Kubernetes cluster through the deployment through the Jenkins, how you will do it. So here comes the Helm charts. So Helm charts are the package manager for. Kubernetes. This is specifically for Kubernetes. It's like a uh, yum installation in uh, Red Hat and CentOS and apt-get for uh, um, Debian and Ubuntu, pip for Python. These are package managers. Same way here Kubernetes we use Helm package manager. So we have very good understanding about Helm. What is Helm? How we can create repositories of Helm? How we can store Helm charts? How we can create them? What's the directory structure of Helm? So all these things. What are the advantages? Why we should use Helm chart? So by using this Helm chart, we are going to deploy the application onto the Kubernetes cluster by using the Jenkins server. Okay. So here comes the real-time scenarios. So I'll take some uh, open-source Java applications or Node.js applications. Then we can deploy onto the Kubernetes cluster. So for that, we'll create Helm charts, and I'm going to create Jenkins server. And we are going to do continuous integration of the application. And uh, once the Docker image is created, and the Docker image should be deployed onto the cluster. Okay. So once it is deployed, we can do the testing, like as I said, blue green deployment, like in real time, how you configure blue green deployment, like um, without downtime or with, with very less downtime, how you can do that. We'll see that. Okay. And uh, how to do the scaling. Of your application whenever there is a high CPU utilization how up, uh, Pods will get scaled up and scaled down based upon the CPU utilization or memory utilization We'll see practically and uh, Another important thing is you will get requests like for example application guys want to uh, See the logs because whenever we are doing because for the first time whenever you are deploying to the Kubernetes cluster They want to see the logs. Okay, you cannot give them the root access to the master server and you will not ask them to go and check the logs they don't know kubectl kubernetes they don't want to see that so they want to see in the dashboard so how you can configure that with the help of uh, efk elastic search fluentd and kibana how we can configure inside the cluster to get the application logs and to get the kubernetes logs so that they can also view inside the dashboard and that logs you can again configure with any ticketing tool like uh, 24 cross 7 or pager duty so that you can configure those uh, uh, 
logs means whenever like any you can mention the keyword whenever the application uh, is down okay so regularly this ticketing tool will go and check and monitor it and if that specific uh, syntax it founds then it will immediately raise a ticket and uh, it will if you are any on call person it should trigger a call this all the things you can configure with that kibana so we are not going to dis uh, discuss about how to configure that we will discuss only up to configuring the dashboard and how to see the application logs and uh, kubernetes logs and how we can configure filters like i want to see specific uh, pod uh, logs or if you want to see specific uh, namespace containers how we can see that we'll configure inside that efk and prometheus and grafana will see for metrics like uh, cpu resources and uh, metrics all the things we can monitor inside this prometheus and grafana okay and finally we'll discuss about a little bit like what i faced in the real time scenarios a little bit of troubleshooting how we can solve if you are using managed service mostly um, you are not going to solve the issues you are going to contact the um, vendor so they are going to come but at least before contacting them you need to go and check what exactly is the issue where exactly we are facing mostly it will be infrastructure related issues only okay so that is how we discuss about the troubleshooting in the final session okay so this is about the curriculum and what we are going to discuss i think it will take 20 to 25 days of time in daily it will be one hour or one hour 10 minutes depend upon the topic it may go to sometimes one hour 10 minutes or one hour 15 minutes or one hour okay so monday to friday will be there classes saturday sunday there will be no sessions will be there okay so this is about the course okay so if you guys have any doubt you can shoot Uh, do you have any batch in evening no as of now no okay monday what is the timing i mean daily uh daily it will be 7 o'clock 7 a.m ist 8 a.m to 8 15 a.m ist no is it 7 to 8 or 8 to 9 7 to 8 acha okay 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 and other thing so the topics which you are showing here okay so mm -hmm. it will be just a fast uh, track program kind of a thing or you will be you know like explaining as in detail because all these things i think it can't be covered in 20 days see that is what uh, in detail in the sense everything see uh, even if you take only single docker can also we can teach for one month so how depth we are going right. means so what up to what level we are expecting like so docker volumes it will be completed in one hour for docker networking it will be finished in one one hour so that way we are going to practice okay it will be a practice session right yes practice session only practical okay yep. and other thing so i mean so at the end of okay, it so you will be showing us the entire i think right implementing uh, all yes. the services everything right and so find here i am going to discuss and show you practical of each and every topic okay see apart from this there might be having lot of other components also in the kubernetes okay hmm. so we are not going to discuss all the component because kubernetes is having lot of components so hmm. majorly when we are deploying the applications these are the components are required remaining are optional so some organization may use it depend upon their application requirement some may may not use it So, but most of these um, components, these are the important components from the cluster. So, whatever is defined here, we are going to discuss and do practical of them. Okay, hey, Pravin, okay. do hey, Pravin, do we get any access to cloud servers? No, you guys need to create a Google Cloud account, which is free for one year. Okay, we can okay. use that uh, one year free account, and we can do practical inside that Google Cloud. Oh, in the Google Cloud, not in AWS or Azure, right? No, AWS is not good for uh, Kubernetes. Uh, you need to do lot of configuration, and it's very lazy uh, in uh, AWS. And in Azure, they are going to give you only one month of free. And that too, if you have one credit card, you can create free account only for one time. After that, after one month, they are going to uh, remove that free tier account, and again, it will be chargeable. So instead of that, for Kubernetes, Google Cloud is very best to practice GKE. So you'll get a lot of time that free data account you can use it. 
Yeah, I agree, but down the road, I may have to work, uh, work on Kubernetes in uh, Azure. So at yeah. work, probably if I need to do it, and now if I practice in uh, GS GCP, is that okay mm -hmm. to continue to switch to Azure and uh, work work there? Yes, see 80 to 90% will be the same everywhere. Like what okay. you are installing, managing, like not using any managed service, you are installing mm -hmm. by your own is also same. And they also the only thing is uh, the support. And the thing is how you are accessing. If you are using, for example, AKS, you might mm -hmm. be using PowerShell to access the Azure cloud. Okay. Okay. And uh, as I said, for example, in Azure, you have a concept called Azure file. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is like an, uh, um, and storage so which we can create volume and which we can uh, attach it to the worker nodes and with that we can assign to the pod so that other features what cloud is providing that may help you but the cluster wise concept is same what are the commands you're executing what are the resources you are using inside the kubernetes cluster everything is same how you are accessing it how you are creating it like for example in azure we have networks uh, NSG rules and uh, in GKE also we have little uh, NSG rules. The configuration of that infrastructure might be a little bit different, but cluster point of view, everything is same. So 90% it will be the same. Okay, thank you. So in GCP, normally whatever you're teaching, we should be able to use it, right? In free tier. Yes. Free tier. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so do we get oh. any uh, all these uh, recorded sessions? Yes, you will get recording sessions. Okay. At the end of the this course, do we get any sample project to hands on on this? Ah, assignment kind of a thing. Yeah, I will see. Uh, I'm not yet prepared. I'll let you know once we start the session. Okay. So because this is our second batch, so. Okay. Uh, we did not have any kind of project for that. So if we have, then definitely okay. we let you know about that. Because assignment will help us a lot uh, in you know yes. like practical implementation. Yeah. Yeah, but that the Node project or Java project in real life, if you take it and if you work on that, that should be more than enough. Yeah. Yeah. See, if, if you are installing one application, ten applications, everything is same. Only you need to configure that application dependency extra like some application is dependent on more things which are running outside of the cluster maybe rabbit mq messaging queue or maybe database okay or maybe to some other application maybe dot net application is trying to connect which is dependent on uh, web ui so apart from that remaining conquering one application or 10 applications in the cluster it will be the same okay uh, and one more thing. What? So uh, yeah, every day you'll be taking class. Okay, so one request is, uh, you know, like at, at the end of the day. So if you can give us some, you know, like assignment kind of thing on a daily basis. Okay, so we okay. will try to implement that. And if you have any questions, we'll ask you in uh, the next day, next day class. So that can help us a lot. Yes, yeah, so sure, definitely. Any, you know, like, to give assignments, I have a lot of things we can ask you to do. So we'll see how many yeah, people will do that. where we can learn a lot. Yeah, definitely I'll do. Sure. Uh, what is the course fees for this? That you can check with the uh, Galaxy. Okay, later on you can ping them and ask. So classes starts from tomorrow, right? Yeah, tomorrow mm -hmm. onwards. So tomorrow onwards we are going to start the Docker. So Monday to Friday it will be ready. Acha. Okay, and one more thing. Uh, so uh, my agenda is, you know, like I'm planning to, you know, like change job. Okay, I have basic idea of, you know, like all this stuff. So will this course help me in uh, changing my job? Yeah, definitely. Because see, uh, in real time, they will ask you how you deploy the application. So that completely we are going to discuss. And what are the questions they are going to ask in the real time also? That is also we are going to discuss. And uh, one thing I missed here, like um, live, uh, we call this a liveness probe and readiness probe. That is also in a lot of interviews they'll ask you. So you can easily tell that you uh, worked end to end to creating from the Docker file to deploying the application of the Kubernetes cluster. So easily you can uh, crack the interview on the Kubernetes because nowadays, 
for every devops engineer companies are expecting kubernetes also so with this course you can able to clear like kubernetes questions whatever they ask you maximum 80% of the questions you can clear so what about ingress controller i have one doubt okay so with this course will we be able to clear that uh, kubernetes admin examination like uh, see this is not exam point of view because in exam no one will ask you about helm charts or uh, auto scaler this they will not ask you. this is to get the job okay on kubernetes and if suddenly if you already are working the devops engineer and uh, you don't know how to deploy the applications for that it will help you for the real time scenarios but not for the exam point of view Oh, okay. Yeah, I should agree so, that uh, practical experience is more important than exam. So you will help us in a, like. Uh, uh, Pravin, one question here. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, so for this, what is the prerequisite and how much coding knowledge is required for this? Do we need coding knowledge is not required. If you know Ansible, if you might have written some Ansible playbooks, this because here we use YAML. For mm. deploying any applications, implementing anything, everything will write in the YAML file. So if you have basic knowledge about YAML, that is enough. In YAML also, it's nothing only it's the syntax, and we need to take care about the space. And apart from this, if you are already DevOps engineer, then uh, or or at least you have completed DevOps course. Okay, that's enough. If you don't know what is DevOps, what is Git, then you should start with DevOps and then you should come to the Kubernetes. That's it. That is the physics side. No need of any programming language, okay? So mm -hmm. you should know a little bit of YAML. That's it. I have knowledge on this Git and uh, uh, these tools, but not in depth knowledge. That is fine to continue. Yeah, basic knowledge like Git, Jenkins or Maven and Artifact. Oh. These four are mandatory. These four things we will uh, use inside this Kubernetes. One is to store the source code. One is to create an Artifact Jenkins. With Maven, if it is a Java project, and another one is store the Docker image or artifact inside the Nexus or JFrog. These are the three to four things we use while discussing this course. So, if you have idea about these three, then it's enough. Uh, can you repeat this? Git. What is Git? And Git, Jenkins, Maven, and uh, Nexus or JFrog artifact. Okay. So these are basic uh, things to get into the coconuts, right? Yes. Okay. So one more last question. If you can you put uh, directly coconuts and container? I am working on these two years from last one or year, one year. Can you show put a resume? Can we get you in a try to outside the jobs? See again, like uh, 50 when you are putting resume in uh, like Kubernetes in your resume. Again, whoever is uh, calling you, if they have very good requirement on Kubernetes, they'll ask more questions on Kubernetes and remaining questions they'll ask about you about Jenkins pipelines or uh, Git or maybe some other uh, topics. Okay, so how you are telling see, by doing the course, I cannot tell you that you go, you can clear the interview. How much interest you are showing, how much practical you are doing, apart from what you are learning from our side and uh, how much. Uh, extra time you are putting efforts to learn the Kubernetes or another thing based on that you can easily crack the interview. Mm -hmm. uh, so will you help us in creating a resume at the end of the course? I will share you the resumes which includes uh, Kubernetes. Okay, so that okay. you can copy the lines whatever you are good because you need to mention in your resume what you know. Okay, so that you can copy from that resumes and you can mention in your resume what knowledge you have after that once you prepare from your end if you send us then uh, we can validate it okay whether it looks good or if anything is extra because even if you don't know if you are not confident about any topic then instead of keeping that you should remove that lines okay okay and other things i mean will there be uh, at the end of the course can you give us mock interviews kind of a thing? Mock interviews, like I said, in the final uh, session, I'm going to uh, share you some questions. What kind of questions they will ask in the interview on Kubernetes? Okay, so that video it will help you to like uh, attend the Kubernetes interviews. Like, see, some companies 
they if they literally need kubernetes then they only ask on questions on kubernetes or else they'll ask both uh, either your devops questions and uh, 50% will be on the kubernetes so i in the last session i will share uh, some questions with you so that you can prepare on that Yeah, yeah, sorry to disturb you guys uh, Shankar here uh, just to give you an uh, overview of this course it will help you to improve your uh, experience on Kubernetes and where you can get the real-time exposure that's it if you are looking just to attending this course and getting a job uh, you are just blindly attending this course and don't expect that uh, once you attend the course you will get a job it never happens until you learn and uh, you should be the up to the market uh, demand level how many people has seen there is a jobs only for kubernetes just let me know you should at least have the skills which are required and this is part of our devops uh, tools it's not like kubernetes is alone a separate uh, course of course we can treat it as a course but it doesn't help you much to get a job if somebody have that opinion please remove in your mind and we don't take additional extra services we can guide you in the right direction that how can you uh, prepare your resume and also how can you attend the interviews we can just guide you but depending upon on on us on this one may not help you that's all uh, i would like to say if somebody have some questions regarding interviews or all this stuff uh, moreover we don't deal much as a typ typical institutes okay which you are going through uh, unnecessary uh, what i can say commitments we don't take if you are really want to learn kubernetes in good level of course uh, this course will help you yep that's all over to you praveen thank you shankar yeah praveen one quick question is uh, i know tomorrow when we start docker we are not jumping on the GCP. Probably we'll start on some Linux machines or something. Is that true? Yes, exactly. Okay. Well, how about uh, is it uh, does uh, Windows Bash will serve the purpose or do we need to have a real uh, Linux machine? Sorry, what is Windows? Windows Bash. Mm -hmm. the Git Bash. Git Bash, which is a you know the Linux component, is that uh, serve the purpose for uh, Docker or do we need to have a real Linux no, machine? Uh, see again it depends how you create virtual machine if you create in your local by installing uh, vmware or maybe you can create any you can use for this purpose aws account aws is giving you a free tier account for one year for practicing of docker you can create aws free tier account and uh, we can create one uh, free t2 dot micro instance and there we can do practice okay got you and uh, one thing I want to add what uh, Shankar has said like so we don't get job only specific to Kubernetes. Okay, so it's a DevOps engineer role Only you might be working as a DevOps engineer or you don't have job on DevOps So when you're trying for a DevOps job, this is will be another tool will be help you because For DevOps engineers nowadays every company most of the companies are expecting knowledge of Kubernetes. Okay, so in that way it will help you it's not like only you are going to work on only Kubernetes stuff. No, okay. DevOps engineer itself need to work like we have. You need to work on Git. You need to work on Maven, and you need to work on Ansible and cloud. Okay, whether what are the cloud uh, the project is using. Apart from that, also you need to work on the Kubernetes. Okay, so why people are in showing interest? Because nowadays ma majority of the companies are mi migrating their applications from uh, legacy applications to the microservices. Okay. So for that purpose, they are doing dockerization. So to run the dockerization back and it needs Kubernetes. So that's why they are looking for an experienced person who the DevOps engineers who knows the Kubernetes. Okay, so DevOps engineer only will take care of this thing also. It's an additional work like how he is doing Ansible playbooks and how he is doing Terraform scripts and how we need to manage cloud. Same way you need to manage Kubernetes also additional work. So that's why people are showing interest to learn Kubernetes like DevOps engineers who are already working or who are searching job on DevOps engineers. So in today's session, we are going to start with Docker. 
So what is Docker? Why we need Docker and why it became very popular that we are going to discuss. So before we are going to start Docker, we need to talk about some history. Okay, so in the initial days, I can maybe 1990 in that period. So what we used to have, we used to have a machine, right? Only the CPU, RAM, the machines we used to have. And on top of that, we used to install the operating system and we make use it. Okay. And uh, once technology revolution, okay, comes into the picture, like one software came into the picture, like a uh, lot of things has been changed. Like for example, internet. So once internet started, so what is going to happen? A lot of web, like what we can do in the internet, we can able to access the websites. Okay. So with the websites, a lot of companies can do business. So before internet, nothing was there. Like we used to have our independent uh, machines, standalone machines, and we will install some personal softwares, okay, standalone applications, and we used to manage it. But once internet came into the picture, then we can able to access a lot of websites, and those are called as a web applications, okay. So during that time, to run that website, okay, it's a web application, what? that web application might be running on some servers and uh, we can able to access them in the through the internet right so to run those servers in the background to run that application on the servers whoever is maintaining whoever the owner of that website okay so they need to run some n number of servers depend upon how many users are accessing it okay so they need to maintain some n number of servers so what it contains server means it will have CPU, RAM and uh, internal hard disk, it will be there. And uh, we like, if I am the owner of that application like website, then I'm going to deploy the applications on it, okay? So the place where it is called as a data center, like uh, I cannot keep all those machines inside my home, right? So we'll search for a place and we'll keep all those uh, machines in one place and uh, that place is called as a data center like not only the servers the servers need uh, switches routers and um, internet connectivity okay and uh, to maintain the temperature it should maintain uh, like uh, air conditions should be there so otherwise the machines will crash so a lot of equipments peripherals were needed to run that uh, data center so let's say initially when the initial uh, stage when we launched that application let's say uh, the application version is maybe 1.0 okay during that time i required only two servers assume this is in the period of 1999 or 1995 something like that okay so then uh, version like my applications are upgrading okay maybe i'm adding new features to my application like we see a lot of versions of the application right for example in your all laptops you might be installed java to run some java application so the java also might be changing the versions and it will recommend you whenever your laptop connect to the internet it will ask you to uh, upgrade the software even for in your mobile whenever you connect for wi-fi so it will ask you the recommended apps are going to be updated. So if I click yes, then it will update all the applications. Means back and it will change the versions. So what will contain the version change? Maybe some new features or maybe to fix for any bugs and vulnerabilities. So when we are changing the versions, we may need a few more servers because we are adding few features, okay, to our application. So two servers are not sufficient for that. We need to add few more servers. So then again, uh, we'll add two more new servers, maybe in the year like 1998, our application has been upgraded with new versions. And uh, maybe in the version 3.0, we need 20 servers now. So when the features are changing, means users also increasing. So, so now we need 20 servers. So what we can do, so based upon our business is increasing the servers counts are also increase like for example whenever we start uh, we started uber then initially maybe very less users might be accessing the app to book the cab but maybe slowly once it is becoming famous a lot of users will try to access when a lot of users are trying to access then the 
servers count should also increase because that much of traffic cannot able to handle very less servers so the same manner we are going to increase our servers so here the problem is if it is a startup company and uh, i don't have enough uh, budget to buy the 20 servers okay so what are the budget i have it is not sufficient to buy not only here 20 servers along with this lot of other equipments you need to buy as i mentioned servers switches routers or the resources should be increased so the budget whatever we have it is not sufficient because we are like a startup know. company right okay so for a startup company it is not possible to uh, invest that much of money not only for the servers other uh, devices also need to purchase along with the air condition so during this time so revolution like uh, virtualization came into the picture okay so what is virtualization till that time we were using the physical machines and inside the physical machines uh, everyone used to install the operating system on top of that application used to run but in 2005 i think around 2004 or 2005 I'm not sure exactly so during this year virtualization came into the picture so what we can do with the virtualization we can virtualize our environment so taking one physical server we can create multiple virtual servers inside one physical machine so here i only need to buy 20 servers so i can buy only five servers and inside that five servers i can fully and the advantage is when it is before virtualization we might not using the full resources of our physical servers maybe one server might be using 60% uh, of the CPU and 40% uh, of the RAM and another machine might be using 40% of CPU and uh, less than 30 to 40% of CPU RAM. So a lot of resources we are wasting, but once virtualization came into the picture, so we can able to utilize efficiently. Why? Because we can create n number of virtual machines inside this. So this will be the physical server, and this will be the operating system, and this will be the hypervisor we are going to use and uh, VMware and uh, Hyper-V from the Microsoft. So these are the top uh, companies who provides this virtualization software hypervisor. So here previously we used to install operating system and top of that we can able to install hypervisor. And then we can create multiple virtual machines here. How much resources you want based on that you can create them and later on also we can able to increase the resources or decrease the resources maybe if i'm allocating for this machine 16 gp ram 8 cpu then i can able to decrease also if applications are not consuming the complete uh, resources we can decrease or if this machine is allocated with 8 cpus and 8 gp ram and it's performing very slow because of the ram is fully occupied then we can increase the utilization so here whatever the resources contains this machine we are going to use it in efficient way no need to waste any resources so and uh, we don't need to buy the huge servers physical servers we can reduce the space so this way virtualization came into the picture and a uh, lot of companies not only the startup company it helped a lot for the existing data centers who were having very huge uh, uh, large scale of servers they are also started migrating their applications to run on the virtual machines okay so this way it will help a lot and even for startup companies also it will helpful and this is also advantages virtualization was providing to run it on your local uh, laptop also like vmware is having vmware workstation and uh, you can able to install like vagrant is also there you can able to run on your local machine and you can create multiple virtual machines if your laptop uh, supports that feature and uh, we can able to create multiple virtual machines inside our local also okay so now after this now uh, the company even startup companies like for buying these five servers also for startup company again it will be a little bit burden because maybe each server may be cost around uh, three to four lakhs right so again for startup company it will be a burden for to buy this much guys please go on mute 
so even for startup companies this is also burden okay because uh, to buy this single server it will be 3 to 4 lakhs of rupees and uh, to buy instead of 20 if they want to buy 4 to 5 servers then still it's costs around uh, 15 20 lakhs which they cannot afford scenario again from 2013 to actually AWS came in the 2006, but it's became popular from 2012 to 13. So cloud came into the picture. So what is cloud now? So cloud, no, you no need to buy anything. You can just taking the machines as a rent basis, and whenever you don't need, again you can give it back, and uh, you are going to pay monthly wise. So you no need to have 20 lakhs with you, and you don't need to buy anything. You just take the servers as a rent rent basis and use it and monthly you can pay some thousands of rupees because you are a startup company so instead of uh, investing lakhs of rupees initially so it's better take commissions as a rent and then you can pay monthly wise and if once it is uh, clicked in the market and you are getting a lot of uh, money from that business then later on in the same cloud itself you can take per permanent like instead of taking rent you can pay for complete one year uh, we call it as a reserved instance and you can use it for your organization once your business is stable okay so the once cloud came into the picture again a uh, lot of changes and it became revolution because every company is not every company maximum 60 percent of the companies are migrating from their existing on premises because most of the people were thinking okay virtualization came in the picture they used to save a lot of money but once cloud comes into the picture so companies can save a lot of money like uh, licensing part administration okay if i have uh, 500 servers linux servers we should have at least uh, 10 uh, linux resources right and uh, to, to run the same there will be database engineers will be there monitoring team will be there uh, windows teams will be there a lot of infrastructure resources are required in the traditional data center once it is moved to the cloud then no, we no need these these many resources. Okay, very less resources. AWS administrator can manage database, uh, Linux operating system, storage, backup, everything. AWS engineer can take care. So a lot of uh, money we can save. And the main agenda of the application guys, like uh, product companies, they can focus on their product instead of managing the infrastructure backend, right? So they can completely dedicatedly focus on their product. So if someone else is managing our infrastructure, we're just using it. So for startup companies and for their existing companies also, that is the reason they are migrating it to the cloud environment. Okay. So now in the cloud also, what we are going to do, we are going to uh, create virtual machines and uh, we are going to use it. We just connect it and whenever we don't want, we can shut it down. So this is also good. Okay. So now what is the link between this? Why we need to discuss about the Docker, but why we are discussing about all these things? Okay, so here comes. See, whenever uh, whether it's on virtual machines in the AWS or virtual machines on the VMware, or maybe when it was uh, before, if you talk about physical machine. So basically, what happens whenever developer writes the code? Okay, so. What what is going to do when the developers are developing the development team is developing the application? Um, what kind of application they're developing? Let's say if they are developing the web application. So if they are developing web application, they might use any language. Maybe if they are using Java or uh, Python, they might be taking. So when they are using Java, they need some uh, framework to develop the Java application. They need a framework called uh, Java is having Spring framework. Okay and uh, python is having uh, uh, django okay so framework they needed and along with the framework they need some libraries so before they are developing this uh, application they will do a lot of research and uh, then they will find out what libraries will suit it and they need libraries and some dependency softwares also is required okay and some OS level features also required. I mean, some dependencies from OS level configuration settings might be, or some softwares also might be required. So to have this, what they are going to do, they will run all this inside the machine. 
on their local machine and they will start developing the code and okay obviously we have source code management that is later so once they develop put the code so what they are going to do that application will be given to the testing team so what testing team will do testing team need to do the testing so this application is going to be given by these developers to the testing team guys so testing team what need to do they need to download the same uh, framework and uh, libraries and uh, OS level features. So if they downloaded framework same, but the, if they download different versions or libraries also they download but different version here. It might be using a 1.7 and here they might be using testing guys might be using different versions and uh, whatever the application is developed. It might not work properly. Okay, they might face issue again. They'll come back to the developers and again. They'll check the versions everything again. They will start using it. So once uh, they do the testing everything once it is fine, then it will uh, deploy onto some uh, staging environment or pre prod environment. So operations team will do the operations operations team means will means they will do the testing like this is functional testing. They will do operations means in the pre prod environment. They will check how it is functioning. Okay, we I think most of you guys know about the difference between prod and pre prod. So pre prod is like almost like prod, but there will not live uh, uh, connections will be there, but they'll try to check how if it is a live connections, how it is functioning, everything they'll do it here. And here the functional testing is uh, what the logic is working or not, they are going to check it. Okay, whatever the customer requirement is there, whether as per the requirement, everything the logic is correct or not. And then it will go into the production. Okay, assume this is like a pre prod. So Again, when if it is running, so here again we need to manage everything. Okay, so same versions of libraries, same versions of uh, dependencies, same version of Spring framework and uh, OS also. Okay, so here when the developers are working on their independent machine, they might be configured with the OS. Okay, some settings or maybe some software dependencies. So that should be same here. If that is not working here, maybe. If it did not match, maybe for example, if it is a kernel version is different, and your kernel version was different, then the application might not function because maybe there isn't like uh, this particular framework version or this particular library version will only work with this specific version of the OS. Okay, OS kernel version. Then here the versions has been changed. Maybe kernel version, little bit latest version has might be installed by the operations team because operations team doesn't know, so they will just if they tell seven version is required, then they'll just install latest seven dot six, for example. But this might be tested with seven dot four, not might be seven dot six. So again, they might face some application might work, but some issues might be facing. So again, they will resolve all these things, and they again they'll check the dependencies and the libraries, the compatibility versions, and they will run it on the production or maybe pre prod. So this was the previous scenario. So now. Once virtualization came into the picture, when the virtualization came, so what is virtualization? So here, what we can do virtualization? So here we will have an uh, hardware and uh, operating system, and then uh, hypervisor, right? So multiple layers will be there. But now, without installing operating system, also on on bare metal, we can install uh, hypervisor. But previously, uh, we used to have hardware uh, operating system compulsory windows operating system so hardware and this is an uh, os any bare metal os and then this is an hypervisor it's a virtualization vmware or maybe hyper v from the microsoft and then here we used to install virtual machines we used to create a virtual machines so the advantage of this virtual machine what we can do so here this developers develop uh, development team can give the complete image so the, once they are doing testing here inside this machine they develop this application and they can take the image and this complete image can be given to the testing team right so when they are giving this the testing team testing team no need to install any dependencies nothing because this image contains everything because you are giving along with the operating system in the previous scenario, you were not giving the operating system. So operating system might contain some 
configuration might be some dependency that you might not give it in here only you are giving uh, Java this application converted into the jar file and that they are going to test it by installing some libraries dependency but you are not giving the operating system because you are not for example this is a Windows machine you are not going to give your C drive to them to go and test it so but here once virtualization came into the picture we can take the image these guys can take the image which contains along with the operating system so whatever the prerequisite software libraries everything is running with that image so they will just use the image and they'll create some instance okay virtual machine and they'll do the testing if anything finds a problem with the logic in the code level again they will tell the developer teams and again they will do the modification coding level and again they'll give the new image and these guys will use the new image Finally, if everything is okay, the same image will be run on the operations. Okay, and uh, once it is working fine here, the same image we can use it to the prod environment also. Okay, this is how it resolved the majority of the issue. But if everything is resolved the problem here, then why we need Docker? Okay, why we need containers? Okay, so this is very good for the legacy applications. Legacy applications means what monolithic applications now maximum companies are changing their application into monolithic application to the microservices Can anyone have idea? What is microservice? Anyone from the developer background or testing background? What is monolithic application and what is microservices? Yeah, monolithic is a combination of several uh applications like a billing payments and everything combined but whereas if you divide it into individual components so it is a decoupling of uh, the total software so that will help if one is down probably the rest of the system will continue exactly okay so whatever Guinness said is 100 percent correct like for example to run a website uh, let's say if i take any uh, uh, website or maybe let's say if you take uh, Uber app, okay. So Uber app uh, contains many features, right? Um, like previously, this is an application. Application like used to have like monolithic application used to have all the code will be available inside this one, okay. And uh, whenever they want to deploy, they'll deploy it on a server, on a physical server, maybe on it's a virtual machine, okay. So now but before uh, virtual machine concept like application used to run on multiple machines so single application to work it it should have multiple servers or maybe single server so every any changes has been done like for example we have uh, uber go uber ride like uber bike uh, uber rental uber pull something like this so all together is like a single application uh, any changes developers will do the changes to this specific feature then to run this we need to deploy all application into this service whenever you are deploying it all together the complete combination of all these applications and uh, for this whenever for example uh, only uber go is a maybe uber pool lot of requests are coming so what we need to do we need to have another server so that the load can be transfer so again this is some complete application we should run on this specific machine so to run on this specific machine again this all applications should be run here all the services but the request is coming only huge traffic is coming to this specific uh, option called uber pool but to share the traffic the complete application should be run on the another server also for high availability purpose then the this application has been changed now and uh, they change it to the models okay so what they were doing uh, instead of the complete single code they divided as, as into the models the application developer so this will be one model this will be one model so whenever they want to change the code they will change the code only to that specific model no need to change to the complete code so that will reduce the time for the developers also but even though that has been changed into the models but again they need to deploy all the application together on a single server so instead of this now why microservices came into the picture so what they can do so they can deploy only this specific application to the server 
and this specific to this one and this specific to another server so like this in a website instead of full fledged application they would have divided it as a separate separate microservices okay basically this complete application is called as a service so micro means small so the complete application they divided into small small services like microservices so like that it might be converted into 100 uh, or maybe 50 30 microservices why because the advantage is if any problem with this microservice functioning over here it will affect only this specific microservice maybe uber pool might be not working remaining all will work because this is running as a separate application separate microservice so it will not have any problem so this is individually working here and uh, it is not going to have it if this is having problem in the code level or any problem maybe huge load is coming and it's not able to perform then this specific option will not work properly for the customers front end users remaining microservices will work perfectly fine okay and another thing is to run this microservice it doesn't require huge capacity if complete application you are running then it needs some cpu and ram but if it is divided into the microservice so microservice doesn't require huge resources so at least we can create a uh, virtual machine with least uh, capacity is 1 gp ram and 1 cpu right but some scenarios in real time microservice doesn't require even 1 cpu also so in vmware we can't give less than 1 cpu okay i want 200 millicore cpus or 400 millicore cpus for my microservice then you cannot provide it so in that scenario the containers came into the picture to save the resources and that is one reason and another reason is to run this microservice each individual microservice need operating system so if you are taking even for example uh, enterprise uh, uh, operating systems like even uh, in linux we have free open source but if you are taking any enterprise operating system then it is a red hat if you are taking you need to pay the license for support compulsory so you need to have licensing for that right so instead of that what we can do here the containers are not going to use any operating system i will explain you by showing the diagram so that is the another reason why docker came into the picture and why we are using here docker just because uh, the applications are converting into the microservices so if it is a java application so java application will use a spring and a spring boot framework to convert the java monolithic application to the microservices so that it will be running on different containers now it doesn't require one full fledged because to run the application it doesn't require when we are installing operating system inside a virtual machine it will install all the unnecessary packages also but to run this microservice we don't require that much of operating system inside that so to run that operating system in the vmware or uh, any virtual machine it will need at least some cpu and some ram and uh, uh, to run that uh, services backend services a lot of uh, unnecessary os services will be running okay so we don't require all these things so when docker came into the picture so you can create containers okay so now let me show you the diagram with the diagram uh, okay if you see this is the difference if this is the virtual machine this is hypervisor it can be anything it can be hyper v of microsoft or vmware company ESXA software hypervisor okay lot of hypervisor are there for example if you are taking ax operating system there is a hypervisor called vio in the linux we have hypervisor called kvm lot of hypervisors are there so famous are vmware and uh, hyper v so vmware might i think most of you guys know about vmware so you can take example of vmware here and this is the container okay so here this infrastructure means hardware on top of that you are installing the uh, hypervisor and uh, you are creating the guest operating systems three virtual machines so when you are creating virtual machine what you are doing you are taking the iso image and that iso image is completely loading and maybe 1 gb or 2 gb of uh, the image content will be installed inside this machine these are like each independent machines and uh, 
on top of that you are going to install the dependent binaries or libraries to run your application whatever the libraries are required to run this application framework whatever it may be required so you are going to install and this machine is going to act like an independent machine this one this one and uh, here we are installing operating system okay so on top of that we are going to install this is called as a docker engine okay so we will install this docker software which we call as a docker engine and here we are not creating any we are not installing any operating system we are creating a container which is going to use this base operating system this is the base operating system and is going to use and uh, to spin up this container to create this container we don't require okay minutes or hours because here virtual machine creation at least it will take 30 minutes of time to install uh, procedure but here it will take not even one minute within seconds this container gets created because we are not installing any operating system here it is going to use this base operating system kernel okay it is going to take the kernel in the container it will have some base image which contains 70 mb uh, 100 mb image it is going to have but kernel it is going kernel and remaining all the services it is going to take it from here only to run this application so it is going to take some uh, base image that we'll discuss in the later on session so creation will be very easy and uh, this container you can allocate like very less resources uh, as i said millicore or maybe 100 mb 200 mb to run that specific application so each microservice is going to run on this specific container so here in this container whatever you want to run that specific microservice or application you can have everything like binaries framework and any dependencies packages is required in that container everything will be available and uh, this container we can uh, create an image and that image can be used by anyone the same scenario here uh, when we are talking like that container if it is an image and even testing as also can run uh, nowadays in even in windows 10 uh, also you can locally install docker and you can test it but uh, in the real time uh, enterprise organizations they might be having some uh, environment set up on top of that we can install or uh, deploy the docker containers and these guys can do the testing on that so that image contains everything we no need to separately install uh, the packages inside that uh, containers everything is ready with the dependencies and the same image can be traveled to pre-prod and the same image can be traveled to production no need to do any changes because it contains os and it contains uh, libraries packages everything is under one package so if it is working fine in the pre-prod the same image will be used over here the same container image will be used here so that is the major reason docker came into the picture because one is to save the resources here the container doesn't require huge resources so whatever it requires, we can allocate them and second thing is licensing here you are paying licensing for your vmware or maybe hyper v so but here you no need to pay any licensing and second thing is spin up is very fast so immediately it can be created and uh, immediately means within a uh, few seconds you can create it within a few seconds you can delete it right and uh, the another advantage is like for example i was talking when this uber uh, pool is uh, getting lot of traffic then this container whatever it is running say here is the content is running so no need to increase the capacity for all these microservices so only this container if you create one more container the traffic is going to be divided to this both the containers okay so this way it will work no need to increase the capacity here so previously when it was monolithic application the complete application need to be run on another machine to get the traffic and to uh, reduce the traffic but now only this microservice container will be uh, auto scale so that the load will be shared to this both the pods or like uh, both the containers so that the traffic will be shared across these two only because this is getting traffic and as i said another advantage if the monolithic application is having problem then it will impact to the complete application like if it is a website 
it will impact to all the website but here if some option is not working only that option is going to have problem okay so remaining options inside that website or inside that app will function as it is got it and uh, the second feature is uh, like it contains a docker hub so means you are going to get lot of uh, images okay so when we are talking about this uh, docker engine so we have another concept called docker hub so actually docker is a company okay so they have both uh, community edition and enterprise edition both will have the same features only the difference is uh, the support okay so if you take community edition then you will not get any support if you take enterprise edition you are going to get the support so they have a docker hub image uh, repository where you are going to get a lot of images predefined images like for example if you guys want to configure jenkins server what you are going to do you will create a one virtual machine whether where it may be whether it's on vmware or aws you will just first create virtual machine you install java prerequisite 1.8 version and you install uh, jenkins from uh, jenkins uh, repository and you configure it right but docker hub will give you the image container image and that you can run it on maybe on your local if you have docker it is installed inside your uh, local laptop or on any machine directly you can just start your jenkins server within a second so like that so we have a lot of uh, images available like redis image is there nginx image is there rabbit mq image is there messaging queue uh, mysql maria db lot of softwares you no need to configure anything okay directly you are going to get with along with the prerequisites with very light weighted images they are going to provide so you just you can take those images and you can use it in the real time as i said this applications what are these applications uh, will be there that we are going to create the images in the coming sessions we'll know how to create images for this application uh, how to write a docker file to create the images all the things we'll discuss so here if you see this is the docker hub and uh, you can see any kind of images over here let's say if i want uh, jenkins So here you can able to get this is official image means Jenkins are providing you the Docker images. Okay, so lot of software like this individual persons also placing their images here. If you see 10 million downloads by this user also, and uh, this is an official image, so it's very uh, less size will be there, which can run on the Docker container. Okay, so here if you the only thing is you need to have docker should be run whether it's on your local or whether it's on any machine So you just if you use docker pull Jenkins then automatically it will connect to this docker app and it will pull that image and uh, When we talk about the images at the time I'll talk about the sizes of this one. Okay, so here anything if you go to nginx lot of images are available which we can use in our organization instead of uh, manually configuring everything. So this is another advantage with that uh, Docker and uh, we have another uh, containerization is also available in the market, which is called uh, Docker uh, Rocket D. Rocket D is also another container technology, but uh, most of the organizations will use Docker only. Okay, so rocket container is also there in the market. So maybe some uh, organization might be using it, but majority will be 95% will be everyone is using this uh, Docker containers. So what we need to have, we need to create one virtual machine. I hope, uh, as I said yesterday, you need to create uh, one virtual machine in the AWS. If you have AWS account, if you don't have AWS account, uh, then Create an AWS account in our YouTube channel. We have an uh, video to how to create AWS account. You should have any um, credit card or debit card. So you should give those details. 
once you created we can use a free tier account only for docker we are going to use it uh, to practice it okay if you have any other methods like if you know good in vagrant okay so you can use vagrant in your local laptop and you can create virtual machine inside that or else simple way you want to go with just create an uh, account inside the data plus and then just create a virtual machine it's very simple just go click click next 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 then you can be able to create a machine so let me create uh, quickly one machine here so in the meantime just let me know if you have any doubts queries yeah one quick question praveen uh... In the mm. monolithic application, you mentioned that uh, multiple people can call. If at all, I deploy that application onto the web, uh, the whole world can call that. So how does it work in case of a Docker? If I create an image and deploy into the uh, deploy that onto the web, and that uh, Docker image need to be pulled as a container, and that need to be deployed in another VM. No, so here that comes the Kubernetes or maybe Docker Swam comes into the picture. So when the individual container is running, this all together will be connected to a application gateway. So that application gateway will be accessed from the external world. So whenever you are trying to access a URL, it will go to the application gateway. From application gateway, again it will redirect to each individual microservice. Okay, so. So thousands of people can use that application, which is on a container. Yes. Okay. Got you. Not on container. Application gateway will be configured maybe in the cloud. In uh, AWS, we have application gateway. In Azure, we have application gateway. So yeah. here, what we are going to give each uh, microservice is going to configure with a load balancer, and yes. that load balancer details will be configured under the application gateway. So application gateway will route the traffic to independent. Uh, internal load balancers of the microservices. Yeah. Yep, that part I got it. Thank you. So let me create one virtual machine. Uh, I have a question. So can you open that image of VM and uh, uh, the Docker image from Google, which you opened? This one, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, you told like in the first image, okay, so this VM, so application one, two, three, all these three uh, things are independent of each other, the left side, VM, VM. Mm. Yeah. Application one, application two, all these three applications, they are independent of each other. It means isolation, right? Mm. So similarly, Docker is also providing the same thing. Uh, application yes. one, two, three, all these things are independent of each other, isolation. So what is the major difference? Yes. Is it only uh, the size of the application or is there any other uh, you know, like important difference? Okay. Because both so of them are say, if the, yeah, Application is converted into a microservice. If that microservice want to run on this VM, so to create this VM to spin up, it is taking time. And the second thing is, it is utilizing lot of resources, CPU and RAM, storage it is wasting here okay but here it is not wasting any resources here whatever you want even milli core uh, cpus you can give and uh, second thing is it is not uh, installed with operating system it is using the bare, uh, base operating system from here okay so it is not going to get any performance issues very quick and fast it will be there and here it contains operating system services are running and it need minimum resources and uh, the scale up also will take time, but here scale up will not take time. And second thing is here you are using hypervisor, which is a licensed. And here also to run that microservices here in real time, if you are installing the operating system, means you need to buy the entitlement of that operating system. So if you are using Red Hat Linux, then Red Hat Linux, you are not going to get it free. You need to pay license for that. So these many microservices to run, you are installing the application. Uh, Operating system in each and every virtual machine, which you need to pay the licensing. But here you are not installing the operating system. You are using this base operating system. Okay, 
so let me show you another uh, way like how it will work so basically mm, this is one container and this is another container this is another container let's say this is a centos container and um, this is uh, ubuntu and uh, this is a uh, uh, assume red hat we don't get red hat but just uh, i'm giving some linux flavors uh, okay so instead of this one let me give debian okay and uh, here the operating system like this is an uh, hardware assume and this is an operating system and this operating system assume this is a centos in the centos you installed a docker engine so here how ubuntu this country is ubuntu this country is debian this container is fedora so you are going to get some base images of ubuntu which contains 70 mb or 60 mb of size debian 40 mb or 50 mb or maybe less than 100 mb of size these images will be available providing by the docker so it doesn't contain kernel and binaries so everything is going in the linux we have 367 flavors of linux so all the flavors can use the same kernel here so this container is going to use kernel of this machine this container is also using kernel and binaries everything from here so this is only to start up it is using some base image which is a very very tiny size around 60 mb to 100 mb size this ubuntu image is providing by the docker okay and the same way this is also debian image we are going to get fedora image we are going to get but end of the day these are taking the image from here okay kernel the binaries because linux flavor will support all this kernel will support to the all the flavors okay so that's why it is whenever it is running it is not going to have its own kernel so it is going to take the kernel from this base image so here when we are creating container we will just give the image okay to run this application which flavor is compatible to that application that image we are going to get from the docker whether it's compatible with ubuntu or Debian or centos fedora whatever it may be in the linux flavor on whichever machine it works perfectly that image we are going to get the tiny image but remaining kernel binders everything is going to take it from here so here you are not paying not going to pay anything to the vendor for licensing entitlement okay so that is a advantage uh, so does it uh, support windows platform containers uh, they have started but uh, i think no one is using uh, docker for windows it will be very good for linux only okay okay so uh, okay. basically um, i think uh, just a quick uh, two points here Whenever you look mm. uh, this application one application to application three on both sides, these are three. Uh, th you look them as three different applications. If you look at the bigger yeah. picture, if you deploy web services, there is a uh, there is something called service mesh which will be used to connect uh, all these uh, microservices. So the real advantage of Docker or Kubernetes comes into picture when it is orchestrated. So that orchestration will give uh much more benef uh, benefits uh in, in the longer run or uh, bigger picture yeah that uh already for these guys i explained yesterday about this advantage like we can do auto scaling quickly uh immediately we can scale up okay and load balancing so when uh, kubernetes is doing uh, orchestration of these containers so many advantages we are going to get instead of running it on a normal virtual machines okay virtual machine. so that uh, you guys can slowly understand when we start completing this docker and kubernetes then you can compare how they were running on the virtual machines and how they are running on the docker with managing kubernetes orchestrator so what advantages we are going to get so slowly you'll come to know about that okay okay yeah no, the, um, um, I, I, I don't remember the name of the person who asked with the question. The question was, what advantage do we get? Is the, only the lighter weight or the sharing of the um, beneath uh, underlying operating system? When you when you compare in that perspective, that's the mi minimal advantage we get. The bigger advantage, 
uh, comes in when we use the orchestration part. That's what. Um, yep. Okay, got it, got it. Thank you. Praveen, one question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, what about the uh, security for containers? Like we will be installing patches, right, for VMs. So how about for uh, these containers? Mm. Security, so, you mean to say OS level security or? No, no, for containers. Like uh, if we have a Jenkins image, there can be some um, mm. uh, unknown calls, right? I mean, there can be uh, uh, content data which See, can increase the traffic. Yeah, that will be come to know when we start about uh, Kubernetes because this containers will be accessing only internal. Okay, it cannot be accessed from the external world. So that's why it will not get any traffic from the external world and uh, the ports, whatever is also accessible. It's only internally it will be accessible, not from the external world. So we don't need to worry about uh, if some hacker is going to attack to our uh, containers. Okay, so if there are any loopholes in the Kubernetes cluster software, then they can come and attack into the cluster. And for that also a lot of tools are available to uh, scan the vulnerabilities of our cluster and uh, we can fix it as an administrator. Okay, so that part when we start about uh, Kubernetes, then I will tell you how to manage this container security. Thanks. Okay, so let me quickly launch instance and this is not about uh, AWS uh, class. So I'm not going to tell you the options. Just I will show you just uh, options what we need to select. Just click and create an instance. And uh, that you can get in uh, YouTube also like creating of instances also. So here you can select any image. I'm going to select the second image. Uh, this one. And D2 dot micro is free tier. We can use a free tier. And here don't change anything here in this option. Third option. Just select add storage. And here also don't change anything. If you want to give any name tag name to your mission, you can give it. Uh, I will give this as an uh, docker server and security group here also don't change anything and then launch and here you need to create a key pair because aws will not allow you to log in with the username and password so you need to select a key based authentication so select a create a new pair and uh, give any name to your key and download so this is like a public and uh, private key authentication the server contains public key and it will ask us to download the private key so we'll save it and uh, Praveen, which image you took uh, amazon linux or amazon linux type? amazon linux second one amazon linux okay yeah so view instance it will be online within a minute let me filter it instant state running. So you need to use a mobile XTERM tool to connect the Linux machines. Those who are new to Linux, you should be good in the Linux because uh, if you want to become DevOps engineer or a machine learning, Hadoop, anything nowadays compulsory is Linux. Okay, so try to learn Linux if you, those who guys don't have knowledge on Linux. So we are going to use mobile XTERM tool. Previously, we used to have a putty tool, but in the mobile XTERM tool, we have a lot of features. So we can use this tool to connect the Linux machine. Okay. So now I think machine is up. Okay, it's up. Just copy the IP address, select it, copy the public IP and uh, session SSH. We are going to establish SSH connection to the server. So here, by default, AWS will give you a user account called EC2-user to connect the machines. So use it and select here the private key. I created with the desktop. 
this is a docker.pem so it's created and this is one of the linux machine and here we can install the docker okay so what i'm going to do just type m install docker it is going to install and uh, if you see here this is ce community edition it is going to install so you can just press yes to install it and whatever the dependencies it is required it is getting installed okay so just remember this picture when you guys are installing just take the screenshot we are going to talk about this container t and runs here also because in the this is docker engine we call it the engine inside this engine multiple parts will be there so one is on c and this is the container d so all the containers are going to manage by this container d service okay and uh, once it is done just uh, service docker status it is in stop for state just start it it is started now you can check for the first command is docker ps to see any existing containers are created so from monday onwards we are going to talk about the docker topics how to create containers and uh, how to create volumes how to create docker network okay what is docker file all these things we'll discuss okay if you have any doubts in today's session just please go ahead and ask me or else we'll wind up for today's session uh, what was the command you fire for uh, the docker installation like was that yum install docker see the one And this version is uh, 19 or 18? It's 19. Thank you. So in the previous session, we discussed about a Docker introduction and we created one uh, virtual machine inside the AWS and we installed Docker. So today we are going to discuss some Docker commands and about the images. So let me log into this machine. What was the key I created for this one? Pain name, let occur. Okay, so once we log into this machine, um, yes, we can able to check with the Docker command. Okay, so Docker PS is the first command which we are going to learn. Docker PS is going to show us the running containers, which are the containers are created, and those containers it is going to show. And Docker PS hyphen A, it will show the containers which are in stopped state also we can stop the containers and we can start the container like how we can stop the virtual machines and we can start whenever we want same way here also we can start and stop the containers so if we are using if any means all means uh, even it will show the stopped containers and uh, ps will show only the start containers so let me create a container first so docker run iphone it like uh, centos bin bash okay so this is the first container i'm going to create and it is getting created and the cento is so let me explain this command so what is this command so docker run So here, 
Docker run means it is going to create a container. Then what is this IT? It's an interactive terminal. Okay, so I equal to interactive and uh, T is terminal means it will create a container and will go inside the container if you see here so right now i am inside the container previously i was inside the aws virtual machine where i executed this command but now i am inside the container okay so if you you can see the difference cat uh, etc os release and this is a centos operating system means i am inside the container to go inside the container we use i interactive okay so that's why we use we can use d also the same command we can use docker run hyphen d hyphen t image name and shell so here d means detached mode so detached means it container will be created will not go inside the container so once we go into the container whatever uh, you want to do you can able to do the activities so this is an centos image because here and this one is the image name and the center is the image name we are going to give and this is the shell so you are accessing the shell so once we log into this container you can able to check with the uh, ps hyphen ef okay basically in the linus we'll check the process ps hyphen ef you can see the shell which we executed here we can able to see that process and whatever the command executed ps only these two processes are seen but generally in linux if you create any virtual machine or any physical machine if you take if you just check ps hyphen ef lot of process will run but in container it is not running any process right so whatever the application we run only that process will run why because this is very lightweighted container which is using the very basic image which does not contain any uh, binaries okay so everything it is going to use it from the where it from it will use the bare metal os okay wherever it is hosted so right now again i'll come back so if you can just do exit come out of this container and you see docker ps it is not showing why because when you type exit in a container, the container will be in stop put state. Okay, if you see here, exited because this is in the stop put state. And right now, again, I am inside the AWS virtual machine. And here, I'll type PSIF and EF. You can see these many processes are running minimum. Okay, so if you want to count it, PS hyphen EF. 85 processes are running. But whereas in container, only one process that is a bash which we use to execute the shell, that is the only process it is running. So that is the difference. Okay. So these containers are going to use the base image like uh, wherever it is hosted, the Docker host, that image it is going to take all the libraries, binders, whatever you want. It is going to take only the basic image. Okay and uh, when i type docker ps hyphen a okay so here this is a container id for every container there will be unique uh, id is going to be created and uh, this is a which image it is used to create this one and uh, the command because the bin bash we were using to log into that machine and uh, that when it got created and the status whether it's running or it's exited and we'll discuss about this uh, maybe a couple of uh, minutes later about ports and this is a name okay so this name by default is given by the docker okay so these names are names of some scientist names okay all over the world the famous scientist names it is going to provide okay so if you don't want these names you can able to give your own name for your container so if you want to know just search this so if you
okay so he is an uh, persian mathematician astronomer philosopher and poet so the scientist names are going to be provided okay so if i create one more container so docker run hyphen d hyphen t centos bin bash i'm giving d why because i don't want to go inside the container so this is the SHA code, 42 digit SHA code. It will be created for container and uh, first uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 digits container ID it will show Docker. PS. So here again, if you see, this is the another name. It has been, it, it stores some scientist names in the Docker configuration. From there, it will pick up and allocate some name to the random name to the each container. And this name also, if you search here, and uh, so he is a uh, is also a mathematician and political activist so this is how the names has been generating okay so if you don't want that yes so uh, <clears throat> minus t is for terminal right this command yes yes and what is this bin bash used for? So when you want to go inside that container, which shell you want to use it? So in Linux, we have a lot okay. of shells, bash shell, okay. on shell, okay, C shell. So which shell you are providing to your container that we are deciding. So if we don't do anything. Anything means so you don't want to give shell. Yeah, it will be created. So to go inside the container, we are using some shell. Okay. So which shell you are preferable? Why I use bash? Because we can use tab, right? Whenever you want to search any files, like uh, just I will tab and uh, it will give the files list, right? So that's why I use bash. So you can use sh also, ksh. So in case if it is available inside that container. So bash means you want to go inside the container and you'll get the shell. So without giving this also, you can have to create in the detached mode. But uh, in the- Later, can we choose that? Yes. When you want to go inside that container, now for example, container is created. Now I want to log okay. into that container, docker execute iphone it and the container Docker PS and uh, this is the one. So Docker execute iPhone IT container ID and this way you can able to log in again. So once container has been created, if you want to go and log in into the container, then this is the command we can use. Okay, okay, great. I understood. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. So you are creating image image, right? So are you pulling this image from any repository or you are creating as a new image? We'll come to that part. I'm not creating any image here. I'm creating containers here. Okay. I not yet created any image as of now. I'm creating a container. Okay. So I'll come to that part about the images. Okay. So today the complete topic will be on the images only. So now this containers has been created and uh, I was talking about uh, this processes and this names. So we can give our own names like when we are creating the container itself in the same command, we can give the names also to our containers. So again, let me come back to uh, from this uh, container. So if you don't want to uh, exit this container, you want to run. So you need to use control P Control PQ. So here, if you see Docker PS, the container will not stop. Okay. One container was created by using detached mode, and this is a container just now logged into that container without it, uh, without stopped. If you want to come out of that container, then Control PQ you can press so that you can come out of the container. Okay. And now you can see in the Docker PS, both the containers are showing it is not in the uh, stop put state. So you can use uh, Docker 
and uh, start container id and docker stop container id then it will stop and start okay so docker ps this container has been stopped so if you want to start it again docker start and this is a container id okay so this is how it is getting created now uh, the question is like someone asks uh, like everyone should have the doubt when i'm executing this command the container is getting created so when the container is getting created it is using some image the base image okay so where it is getting created like where it is getting pulled that image so basically uh, those who are from the infrastructure background they might have idea okay maybe windows admin or linux admin or anyone in traditional data center how we are going to install the operating system like for example let me uh, explain in a detailed way generally <laughs> before devops okay how the scenario was there like um, there used to come some request to the linux administrator or windows administrator and this will be the data center and uh, the administrator will sit somewhere in a remote location maybe the hyderabad chennai bangalore so to the data center we used to connect and we'll have physical machines and it's this physical machines vmware or hyper v is going to run and if we get any request from the application team basically we'll send a mail from the application team and as a administrators windows or linux administrator they will create a virtual machines inside this and they'll have an iso image and with that iso image uh, they'll use uh, if it is linux they'll use a kickstart file to create images automation if you just give the kickstart file it will create an image it will take the iso file and it will install same way windows i'm not sure windows how windows guys will install the operating system maybe they'll also use some automation method so the virtual machine gets created right and this virtual machine uh, will do some fine tuning os hardening uh, and then we'll hand over it to the application team so that they will connect and they will install their application because we create a user account for them they will have access to login and they can able to do their work okay then we can able to uh, give it to the team they will connect and they will install their application and it's their responsibility we will the os administrator responsibility is only to manage the os and uh, the hardware this is how previously but now when in the devops also the same scenario will be there but uh, the devops engineers need to take care now no need of any linux administrator or uh, windows administrator now like whenever the developers are writing the code so they will do the check-in code check-in and um, it will go to the source code management so if they configure webhooks with this uh, source code management so what Jen jenkins will do jenkins will uh, pick up the code and it will do the integration part whether it's a java or a, uh, for php and uh, python it doesn't require a build okay so directly we can execute that uh, code but for java or for dot net uh, it should build okay so java will use a uh, um, ant or maven as a build tool and it will create an artifact and uh, that artifact will be stored inside the artifactory maybe it's an uh, nexus or jfrog so then with this var file now it should be deployed onto the any environment whether it's in development environment or it will be pre-pro environment any environment it need to be deployed so here environment where is your environment is it in your traditional data center or is it in cloud if it's a traditional data center then it will be a uh, as a physical machines and this will be a virtual machines will be created so it should be ready or you can create at the time of uh, deploying also jenkins which is having plugins so it can be able to go and create or else already this virtual machine should be ready so that this artifact is going to be deployed on this machine which contains the os virtual machine os and it will be running and uh, this is one way but now if these are microservices and it should be deployed onto the containers and again same whether this is in uh, on-premises or maybe aws or azure or gcp cloud wherever the customer is having the environment so same virtual machine means same concept 
but in the docker need microservice so what it is going to happen so let's say if this is your virtual machine and inside this virtual machine this is the base os and uh, these are the containers are getting created so containers will be not ready before itself so we are not making ready containers first and then we are not going to uh, deploy the var or jar files so containers get deployed on runtime itself I mean whenever it's getting deployed at the time it will be created the containers okay so here we are using different images for this containers so from where we are getting these images okay for containers it's getting sent to us a lot of images so where we are going to get images so we are going to get images from the public repository okay so this public repository okay so we have a docker okay hub dot docker dot com so this is the location where docker will pull the images so when i'm executing this uh, docker and iphone it like whatever the image name i'm giving so from here it is getting pulled at images okay so lot of images it is providing the advantage the beauty of this docker is you can able to get lot of images okay so here in this previous scenario when i was telling virtual machines concept manually we are installing the operating system let's say if you want any database server if you want any jenkins server if you want nginx application anything you want first you will install the operating system on top of that manually we will install the software okay vmware is not providing us any images we will just install the operating system and if you want http web server we'll install http if you want nginx you you will install that and you need to re, uh, install the prerequisite softwares also if it is expecting any java 1.8 version you are going to install okay if it is expecting any libraries we are going to install but here the docker app is providing the images with a package okay so here centos image is a only os it's an os part but if i type docker run iphone it and the image name is nginx okay then it will give you the nginx image nginx image means what it contains the operating system it's like a layer okay it contains the operating system and top of that it will have the nginx software installed and prerequisites also will be installed inside that image so you no need to do anything you just create a container with nginx and it is going to be running with complete nginx you are not going to do anything so this is one layer the nginx software and whatever the prerequisites it was expecting that will also will be available so these kind of images are providing by this docker like for example mysql mysql database if you want to create a container for mysql database so mysql uh, official image so there will be two types of images will be there one is private images another one is official images so if you see mysql is an official image means providing by the mysql means as it's a docker container okay so to this image you can use as a docker container which will be very less size and you can see the downloads how many downloads are there so if you click on this this is the command docker pull the image name so we'll come to that part docker pull what it will do and this is a description how you can use this image also they will provide you some details so if you see docker and iphone iphone name you can iphone iphone name means as i said it will not give you any scientific scientist name you can give your own name whatever you want to your container okay and these are the credentials we are passing to connect the database once it will create and uh, how to connect the database after creating all these things have been given over here okay so this is my sequel like this lot of images are available okay like for example jenkins you want to create a jenkins server you no need to install anything you can use this docker image and you can create as a container and that will run as a jenkins server you don't need to install java okay so automatically it will be there and the jenkins software will also be there so it will use some operating system image as i said 
so it will use some operating system base os and uh, on top of that maybe it will be having java also 1.8 and it is also having with jenkins software this complete package it is giving as an image that is a beauty of this docker so you will get lot of kind of images apart from this for your own application for your java application microservices you need to create your own image okay so that will be decided inside this uh, ci or cd part like uh, how the image will be created whatever the var has been created by using that var will create an image and that image will go and store inside the another nexus repository or jfog repository and from there we are going to deploy container with that image that in the cicd part uh, we'll discuss how we are going to plan that but as of now we are talking about these images okay hey, Praveen, quick question so what is the is there any difference between uh, this docker jenkins image versus uh, installing jenkins from scratch on a linux server because uh, if uh, this gives everything definitely it's a great advantage because uh, we need not install any dependencies like java and all but whole yeah. world should be using whoever is having docker should they use uh, jenkins docker machine or are there any some uh, drawbacks or disadvantages with this compared to the regular version of jenkins installed on a linux so drawback is only one thing basically we don't prefer docker container as a jenkins why because why we use jenkins to build the um, artifacts right for example yes. the java application java guys will do will write lot of test cases in their applications to run mm -hmm. those test cases it will it, it needs lot of resources maybe lot of cpu and ram it will expect to complete those test cases and to create that artifact so your mm -hmm. docker container you need to provide lot of resources so instead of that it's better to go with a virtual machine full fledged virtual machine so that it will perfect very fine and uh, if the resources are less and uh, it will take a lot of time to complete the build process mm -hmm. so instead of that better to go with the um, virtual machine which can have less sufficient cpu and sufficient ram enough resources are there then it will the build jobs will be completed on time okay got you so one more question yeah okay. So where does this, you know, like all these images set up? Let's say, you know, like uh, I'm uh, uh, doing it on my EC2 uh, Linux machine. So if I do Docker full Jenkins or any any uh, image, okay, hmm. where does it come and set which part? So here we can able to see inside this machine. So you can able to see with the docker images so here when i executed uh, docker run command always i was using the centos for the first time when i executed this one it doesn't have the image in local so that's why you see here uh, if you see here the first time when i executed this command so the docker run iphone it the image was not available in this local machine so unable to find image and uh, it was pulling from the docker up okay so once it is done the next time if i'm using the centos image to create another containers it will not connect to the docker up it will connect from the local itself it will able to pull the image from the local itself so whenever i'm creating another container so it did not give unable to find because it is already available and from there it picked up and it is giving the container okay so in the docker images we can able to see this information and uh, this is the tag also we'll discuss about this what is this tag that is also very very important okay so this no, no, way I, mean, I, have, I, I asked like so this is about the pull which he told okay so what i'm asking is so if i do mm -hmm. A docker pull okay so it pulls from the internet okay and yeah. i mean where does this uh, you know like uh, all these images resides in my machine in my linux machine you mean to say where so this something... huh, where it is stored 
Hmm. So basically everything will be go and stored inside this var lib. So for every version, this location might be changed. Okay. So image. I think it's containers. It's stored by layers, so we can't see them. Varlib so Docker we... containers. Uh, Varlib Docker image. Container. Containers will show the containers information. Basically, it should have a directory called images. So I can see only the name is image. These are only contents. What are the contents we created? It will create the uh, directory structure with that container SHA code and we can see the country information. Basically, inside this image only, it should store under varlib docker there should be a directory called uh, images so maybe in this version of the docker i'm not sure where exactly they are going and storing okay i'll check and i'll get back to you in this one okay are they not in those in those containers if you go into the containers can you see if there is a sorry uh, no you just mentioned there are checking overlay Overlay to is for uh, storage. Okay, so whatever the volumes it gets created to each container, they will be stored inside this overlay tool. Okay. <laughs> so it will be contains the information of storage volumes, whatever each country is getting allocated. So images should be stored inside this image there should be a directory called images so i'll check and i'll get back to you on this okay now in this version where it is getting stored the images okay okay sir. okay so this is how we are talking about the docker images so we'll get a lot of images from the docker hub itself okay so if, apart from official images we have other images also available so we can use them so if you want to create an nginx uh, images we can able to uh, use the nginx images also let's say uh, docker run when it or let me go with the detached mode mm, nginx so nginx this is the first time i'm using nginx this is nginx we can use for as an uh, nginx web server and nginx is also used as an nginx ingress controller so here the image was not available in my local machine that's why it connected to the docker hub and able to uh, get the image and if you see docker ps so this is an nginx image okay if you see here this is the nginx image it is running now uh, we'll discuss how to give the names to this one so docker run uh, iPhone D, iPhone T, iPhone, iPhone name, um, Nginx server, and uh, Nginx. So now if I check Docker PS, if you see this is a name which I provided here. So this way also we can give names to our containers. So what are the name you want? Let's say I'm going to create another container, Docker run iPhone D, iPhone T same name should not be repeated now nginx server one and hyphen hyphen host name i'm going to give host name mm. nginx prod and then nginx this is also created 
so docker ps so what is the difference between this name and this name you see the both this is a name so this is the name of an container and this is a host name means when you connect to that container you will have an host name like for example as of now uh, this is a host name for my virtual machine which i'm logged in right now aws machine the same way container will also have the host name so let me connect to this container docker execute that's it okay so this is a host name or else instead of sh so let me use a bash if you see here in the bash it is clearly showing this is a host name so that is a difference that is a host name and this is a container name both are different container name to identify that container and host name when you log in we are giving some host name so i am going to connect to a container which i did not give host name docker by default it will give some random host name to it see whatever the code is there that is showing as an host name the sha code the 12 digit code it is showing as and for every country it will show the same the, their container um, sha code will be shown as an host name but if you change if you want to change the host name of your container we can give in this way you can give hyphen hyphen host name everything we can give in the single command like in future when we talk about docker networking at that time you want to assign an ip address that ip address also is going to assign from here itself okay so docker and command itself we are going to give the ip we can give the subnet everything we can give it from here okay so now what i'll do i'll uh, docker rm i'll just give the container and this is to delete the containers rm command okay i am inside the container so let me come out docker rm so i'll delete and again i'll create uh, both the containers why because see when they are in the running state you cannot delete them so you should delete them by uh, stopping them docker stop and then you can use the docker rm command both the container has been deleted <laughs> now let me discuss about uh, port forwarding so what is port forwarding so here let's say this is a virtual machine and inside this assume we install an operating system okay any centos operating system we are talking about virtual machine and uh, let's say this is a web server so web server in linux we have two web servers are there either http or nginx right http and nginx both are for web web servers configuration you can use either http or nginx both will serve the same web service hosting the websites so both uses 80 only port number if you installing http it will use 80 and nginx also use 80 port number so as you inside this machine a, uh, nginx is installed okay and it is using 80 port number how we can able to access it the ip of this machine in the browser you will give http the ip of this machine and uh, for 80 we don't need to give the port number by default apart from 80 if your website is running on any other port then we should give the ip let's see simply to understand i'm giving this this way we need to access the Web, uh, web service of this machine so in our scenario we are using aws machine so aws is having uh, two ips by default one is public ip and one is uh, private ip let me copy the ips and uh, this is a public ip and this is a private but in real time you will have only private ips because you will be inside the private ip network range 
in your organization so we don't have any public ips for our uh, machines so we will connect because this ip range will be assigned to your machine laptop or desktop so we can able to connect to this virtual machine with this ip so in real organization you are going to use this way only and this is ip and like port number whatever the port the web service is configured but in the lab in the present scenario we cannot able to access this machine with private ip because we are connecting through internet we are not we don't have any vpn connectivity between this aws and for uh, my location so that's why we are using public ip to access anything right so in our lab scenario we are going to give public ip that is the only difference to access this now <coughs> This is a scenario. If I install Nginx this way, I am going to configure. But in the Docker, this is a machine, virtual machine, same virtual machine, and assume this is a bare metal is CentOS. Now inside this, lot of containers are created, and assume all are Nginx, but different websites are hosting. All are different websites, but all the Nginx is using. 80 port number okay by default they in the configuration file it will be defined as an 80 port number only so here it is 80 80 so then how you are going to access each website each different website so now the same way here also it is going to have that uh, same ip okay so here also let's say 18.232 dot 86 dot 95 and uh, here also 172 dot 31 dot 39 182 <coughs> okay this is a private ip this is a public ip now how we are going to access this specific container which is hosted that uh, web application Assume this six different websites are running from external world. How can I able to access this? So here comes the port forwarding because if I able to access 18 from the website 232 uh, 86.95 like port number if I'm giving to which website it will connect. There are six different websites are running. So that's why we configure as a port forwarding. Okay. So here we are going to use docker run docker run hyphen d hyphen t if you want to name nginx one and uh, this is the image and I am going to give hyphen p 80 80 80 okay and then if you want to connect bin bash or else not required. So what is this P means port? So I'm giving I'm doing port forwarding left side port is to connect from the external world right side port is available inside the container. Okay, so this is like host level access. So host level means what? So here This is the docker host. Okay, so with this IP we are connecting. This is a host level like a 8080 so with this it will come to this machine from internally this 8080 is mapped to this 80 so likewise you can configure 8081 to this one 8082 to this one 8083 so whenever i'm accessing this machine with uh, 18.232.86.95.8080 is the host port so it will come to here and internally it will request map to this 80 okay so this is called as an host port and the 80 is called as a container port so what you need to do you need to allow 8080 port number inside your security group in the firewall if it is a data center virtual uh, data center then you need to allow in the firewall if it is a aws or azure or uh, gcp you need to allow in the security groups because Till host it is coming as an 8080 and internally it is mapping this 8080 to this 80 port number of this container. 
not only 880, you can use any port number. Basically, we have uh, uh, 165,535 ports are available. Apart from uh, 1024, means 1 to 1024 ports, you can give any number. Okay, here 2000, 3000, 4000, 5000, any range you can give. Okay, so basically, we use in the real time 8080, 8081. Okay, so for this one, we will map to 8081. Okay, and then we'll give 8082 for another country. This way we are going to give. So now we'll see how we can achieve this one. Okay. So I'll create docker run hyphen D hyphen T. Uh, I find a name nginx one and uh, nginx I find P eight eighty. Okay, we should give image at the last. Okay, it's created, and uh, for the second time, I'm going to give eighty eighty one. And uh, the name should be two. Two different names I'm giving. And if you check Docker PS, previously, if you see, this was not showing per remaining containers. If you see here, okay. So now this is port forwarding. So this is left side is per host, and right side is inside your container. Now, how to access this one? Now, uh, I need to allow the sec um, inside the security groups. So let me go inside this virtual machine and this is a security group concept. Just open it. I'll just allow the port 8080 and 8081. Open it. So incoming edit. Add rule. Custom TCP 8080. And for everyone, and then another rule I'm adding for eighty eighty one, and then save rules. Okay, so both the ports has been added because it will come to host with this port range. Now let me go back. Uh, so the ECD dashboard and uh, take the IP. Okay, now I took the IP and uh, let me able to access. If you see here, we are getting and uh, let me able to access 8081. Still, we are unable to get. So if you want to see the difference, okay. I'm really connecting to two different containers or single containers giving you the information. So for that, let me clarify it. So let me connect to the container. Docker execute type an IT. Bash. So inside this container, when Nginx is installed, so wherever this page is coming, it is using some index.html. So I'll go there and I'll change uh, some value. I'll add new line. Okay. CD USR share nginx, and inside this we have a directory called HTML, and here we can see index.html. So if you see this index.html, the same web page. Okay, welcome to nginx. The title head of this HTML page, the same thing. Okay, so inside this I'll write a line, but here in the container we don't get all the commands. Okay. Because it is not installing how we will get the commands by installing some packages when you're installing the operating system You will get the commands because the command related RPM packages get installed But in the container you don't get all those RPM packages. That's why it's very tiny the image sizes and you cannot able to get the commands if I type I want VI here VI is not available. Okay The basic cat will be available very basic commands will be available so 
now I can use a cat command to append some line inside that nginx index.html. This double means what? I am going to write something inside the file. Okay, I'm appending some line. This is nginx server one. Okay, if you see again in that cat index, the last it will be updated here. So this is how we can see the difference, right? Now um, etc init.d nginx restart so that it will uh, apply these changes and we can able to see. Now uh, I can see the difference. Now let me go back. It available talker where is server two nginx docker psi funny docker start okay now See, this is a line which I added, okay, which is getting for 8081. And uh, if I use 8080 port number, it is not going to get. Okay. So this way we can confirm, okay, we can able to access this. Again, 8081 I'm giving, it is able to access. Understood, right? So this way in real time, we will do port forwarding to our containers, whatever the, because directly we cannot able to access. To your container because container is not for the external world container in the networking topic we'll discuss detail about how it is going to communicate with your host so it is this containers will only communicate to your host network so what are the ip range you have so this ip range private i forget about public ip in real time we don't have public ips what are the private ip range is there to that ip range this container is able to connect but it cannot able to connect directly from the external world. Okay, so we should connect to the Docker host machine from there internally. We can able to reach the containers. So that's why each port each container we can assign different port numbers so that we can able to access understood, right? So this is about port forwarding. Yep. Can container ports be changed? See here, whatever you assigned to a container again you cannot modify it okay again you need to create a new container and uh, same command you can execute docker run and give the new port and that image name what which your image let's say uh, assume as of now i'm using the sample nginx images right assume in real time this image whatever i'm using here uh, this one image name assume this is an application image okay means which is created with having the application content inside this one so again what we'll do you will give another name to your new container you will create it if you want to change the port number run it and then you stop this old container this way you can use you cannot change the values to your existing container let's say if you don't want to give 8080 uh, 80, running container of this container you cannot give it 8080 80, you want to give 8085 so create a new container with 8085 with the same image and then you stop this old image that's it's possible okay even if you assign an ip address later on you want to change the ip address so you cannot do that you cannot go and modify it to the existing container like how we do into the virtual machine that is not possible you need to create new container with that with the same image and you can stop the old one okay i mean i'm mean, asking about the, the other part uh, can i switch the tab Sorry, I'm asking about the other part. Okay, so there is, I mean, one is host code, the other is container port, right? Yes. And so I'm asking, can port, you're can talking it? about this one, 8080. Yeah, 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 yeah. That you can change in the configuration file. If you don't want 88 default port, whatever they are giving you, you can change mm -hmm. inside the container. Uh, the, sorry, inside the configuration file. 
which configuration file mm, let me log into this container because uh, the first part is at the ec2 level okay host port the other part is at the mm. container level so i'm asking yes so container by default engine is why it is using in 80 because it is defined that go and use 80 port number by default those are default port numbers like uh, ssh okay. is using 22 why it is using 22 because in the sshd <laughs> config file it is defined as a use as a 22 if you don't want just change it that's it uh okay. let me see if uh, I, I mean uh, in real time uh, do we change this uh, uh, container no. ports no, no right? we don't change for application Fine. okay this is os related uh by default, Nginx is using 80. So in your real time, if your application, whatever the application guys, if it is Java application, whatever the port is configured by them inside the Java application, that will be available inside that image. Let's say this is app one is the image of application. So whatever the port they are using in their application, that port will be available here. At the time, we'll give whatever the port they are using. Let's say if they are using 3000 port inside their application, then we need to use 3000 port number here as an uh, application port. Then only it can reach to that container. Okay, so here. Uh, uh, one question. So yeah. we generally have this website using port 80, right? So how hmm. can we configure the website with these ports 8080, 8081? How to? Configure website with 8081 port like galaxy.com. If we type mm -hmm. like we have to address uh, this IP column 8081. Yes, yes. How can we do actually that? That can be configured in the DNS. Okay, okay. So we can configure different ports also. DNS. Yeah, you can give these rules. See, these rules will be added in the address record if you have a DNS. There you can able to add them. So DNS entries, if you add this with this port number, this IP, then it is going to be used whatever the URL you have defined over there. With that URL, you can able to access it. Okay, that will be internal to the network, right? Uh, where you are adding, it depends upon that. Okay, if it is in the public DNS server, then it can be able to access through external world. If it is a private DNS server, only within that private network only, you can able to access it. Okay, okay, okay. If, like good that if we can add uh... 8081 also, yes. right? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, thank Even you. Even in uh, this year, instead of going GoDaddy, if you are using AWS, AWS is having its own uh, domain registry. Okay, there also you can do that. It's recommended because again, your uh, AWS DNS servers, you need to go and add it inside the GoDaddy. Instead of that, you can purchase the domain name inside the AWS itself, domain registration and there only route 53 you can able to configure it so you don't need to go to the godaddy okay perfect yeah that helps okay so here i'm yeah, throwing one more dive yeah yeah uh, actually how uh these containers are getting ips sorry how containers are getting ips that will con every container we are getting ip right so yeah, yeah. Uh, how uh, this container is getting IP? That we'll discuss in the networking concept. We have complete session on the Docker volumes and Docker networking. There I will show you how these Docker's are getting IPs, What how we want to give our own IPs. That we'll discuss in the networking part. There is a separate session on networking. Okay, okay, fine. Okay. So some people are pinging in the chat. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure whether they don't have mic or itself. I don't know. So here in the Docker, whatever uh, we are getting the images. So basically, we'll have a repository. Even in the real time, also whenever we create the images, that images will be go and store inside a repository. Okay, so there will be Nexus artifacts there and um, jfrog artifact will be there if we configure that this will be useful to store the var file or jar file of the application and same way it can also use to store the images okay 
and uh, if you are going to the cloud for example your environment is in cloud cloud vendors are providing separate artifacts you no need to create a virtual machine on top of that you don't need to install nexus or uh, jfrog they are giving you an artifact tree like uh, aws is giving ecr and uh, azure is giving acr uh, google cloud is giving gcr these are called uh, you can store the images container registry we call it as a container registry azure container registry google cloud registry and uh, aws elastic container registry so you can store the images of your applications here what we will do this varpal is created right by using this var file we are going to create a docker image and that image just can be stored inside the artifacts so here we instead of creating a nexus artifactory or jfrog artifactory we can use this public repository like uh, uh, like how we have a github but basically in real time we don't use public uh, github right we'll have our own uh, github server private server there the developers will write the code and uh, they will store it why because why why we will have our own private github server github or bitbucket why we don't use a public repository of github because we do we want to keep we want to keep our code uh, safe and uh, private within, within our yeah. organization exactly so uh, we don't want to put our code into someone else uh, uh, storage so that's why we'll have our own server same way here also this docker hub is a uh, docker is providing a repository so for our personal purpose lab purpose we can able to use them but in real time we don't use the public repositories so here if you see we can able to create a user account same like github we can able to create a user account and once we log in we can create uh, images also and that images can be stored here so for as of no temporary purpose what we can do we are taking for example plain centos uh, image and we are creating a container let's say on top of that i am installing some softwares okay and means from that again from that container i can create an image and that image i can store it inside the repository and why we need to store in the repository why i want to store it here so when the container is created why it should be stored in the repository we can use this image for some other host okay. yes that is a one reason and another reason is if something happens to this local machine then all the images will be erased right so if it is in central location then it will be in the safe side okay that's the reason we will store the uh, images in the remote repository okay so let me show you now um, how to create a image so we can take any image and we can create a container and uh, we can uh, sorry we can take uh, any image and we can create we can install some uh, softwares inside that and uh, from that we can create an image and that image we can store in our own repository okay so like a here, snapshot yes okay let's say docker run if an it centos let me log in inside this one so i am logged in inside the container okay i think here mm yum install http so i am using centos right that's why i am using yum if you are using debian or ubuntu we should use the uh, app to get so i am installing a software now yes http software and uh, to configure it as a web server etc init.t service command system ctl etc init.t
there is no command to start this service okay let it be now some software has been installed right so this software assume them assume this is an application and uh, this is a software which is running now we want to take the image of this container because it's a container now now i want to take the image from this container so let me come out of this uh, container and then we can use docker commit and uh, before that let me capture the container id docker ps this is the one so docker commit container id and then here whatever the repository we created here okay here i created a repository you need to create one repository whenever you create your account we can create a repository and this is my repository Pravin Corvi is the repository name so i should give this uh, same name here repository name and what is the image name you want to give here so i am going to give http server this is the name i want to give for this image what are the image i am creating and uh, then you can give as a tags so tomorrow session still we did not complete about the image part still something is left so tomorrow i'll talk about this uh, tags also it's very very important about the tags and this is a tag i'm giving as a one okay now if you check docker images you can able to see this is the image got created in the docker images with my repository name and this is the image name now how to push this image to my repository so first of all what i need to do i need to use docker login okay because i don't know which repository this local machine should go and connect so that's why we are providing credentials to go and connect to the repository so docker login here the username oh my god i forgot the password let me try okay login successful it's connected to that one okay now what i'm going to do docker push okay and this complete name this way we need to give it here now it's completed pushed and if you want to see here and you just refresh See, this is an image is available here in my public repository. Okay, so the same way you know your organization, what are the Nginx you are using, or maybe sorry, not Nginx, Nexus you are using, or uh, JFrog you are using, it contains one uh, URL. Okay, the location of that, what are the repositories created for you. So, that in that repository, we are going to store the images in the same way. Okay, so where from wherever you, you are creating images and you want to push it. So in that machine, you just use uh, this command. Okay, so when it's with the container, you can able to create an image and that image. So this image contains what? CentOS on top of that HTTP package is running. So in real time, if any changes, basically we don't create images. Okay, because uh, sometimes we create images. If any changes has been done to the application level at that time, it will be created. So this is about uh, images concept. So whatever we discussed, most of the things we use same in the um, real time. Okay. So tomorrow we'll discuss a little bit more about uh, this tag, the purpose of this tag, and uh, the layers, image layers. Also, we will discuss. Hi guys. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so yesterday we were discussing about the images, right? So we need to discuss about the tags, okay? Tags part and the image layer part, okay? So um, in real time, how it will be configured? Uh, before that, uh, let me discuss about uh, tags, okay? So like uh, internally, for example, we. <coughs> we have an uh, our own docker machine here we install docker 
okay and uh, this is a docker uh, engine and uh, we are creating containers and when we are creating containers if we install anything inside that machine okay so any changes has been done then we are we can take the image of the existing container yesterday we discussed uh, with the command docker commit uh, container id and the image name right so in real time the whatever the image is there for example i am doing docker pull centos so it is getting let's say uh, some around 80 mb of size so with this image i created a container so i created a container this is a container and inside this container let's say if i installed uh, m install ip hyphen utils okay some package i installed then this size is around example 20 mb then by default uh, base image is 80 mb and uh, this will be 20 mb so total it became 100 mb now what i'll do i'll create an image with this uh, container and that image again i can store inside the uh, central repository okay so in a private repository whether a nexus or jfrog art factory i can store and again what i'll do i'll install uh, m install some other package okay let's say httpd i installed and this is a 90 mb of size and when i install this package again it's become 90 mb so this one again we can create an image and uh, then again we can store inside this this is a new image okay so when we are creating these images we are going to create as a versions okay this may be version one when i'm creating image and this may be version two right and version two images will be available so while creating uh, images with this container docker commit container id and the image name what i want to give then i'll give versions in this way v1 v2 something like this i'm going to give it. so yesterday to store those images in the um, docker hub so i gave this way the registry name so in real time you need to give what is your nexus or jfrog url that name you need to give it here then only when you do docker push then it can able to push to that specific art factory repository so this way we can create images so for the first time i create this way for second time again i'll just use instead of v1 v2 so like this multiple versions we are going to create so basically this the latest image contains it's like a layer so this is one layer because you installed one package and you created an image so when you used uh, the centos it's a, like a base image on top of that you install one package it is added another layer and again you install one more package and you created uh, an image and that image contains another layer so like this it is going to create multiple layers okay so image contains of multiple layers like uh, if you don't use centos let's say if you are using uh, docker pull jenkins to create jenkins first of all they might use one base image on top of that whenever they installing uh, some software they might be created some multiple layers so for example uh, <laughs> let me create any container now or even if we pull the docker image also we can able to see no need to create containers so why we are discussing this layers because in real time you your responsibility is to reduce the docker image size as much as possible okay so always recommended it will be very good if your docker image size is very less so when you are creating an image so you need to make sure that it contains very less size okay. so you should not install multiple packages unnecessary so here this is a docker host machine and uh, here let's say i'll do what docker pull 
Jenkins. I'm not creating any content. I'm just pulling the image from the Docker Hub. If you see these many layers are available for every layer, it is creating one ID. Understood. So these many layers is providing by the Jenkins. So for every image means those many times it got recreated when it was starting. It was created from that time onwards till now. So it got recreated and uh, this image was created and for every time may, they might be added some new software or might be done some changes. So these many layers is available same way I'm talking here. So it is going to create a layers to your image. So the same image when you store in the Nexus repository or artifact repository the same image for example if I give uh, Docker pull this uh, image name this way then it is going to get all the layers and it will use this image inside this machine if or if if you are using docker run iphone it um name of this uh sort of container one and uh, image name version two in this way if you are using then it will create a container by using all these layers let's say you don't want for example you don't want to go with version 2 if you are using version then in this version one image you don't get http package because in the version 2 itself it contains http changes are available so in version 2 you don't uh, in version 1 you cannot able to see http package will be available okay so now let me try that. Okay. So now what I'll do, I'll take one image to create the container, plain uh, base image I'll take like CentOS. Yum, uh, sorry, Docker run iPhone IT, CentOS one. This is the name I'm giving, and this is a image. CentOS is the image. And I would like to go inside this one. Okay. Oh, service docker status. Docker login. And I logged into the packed machine docker images. Yes. Okay. Docker run hyphen IT hyphen hyphen name CentOS one CentOS. I did not give name here. So it is taking this as an image. It's created because CentOS image is available in the local itself. That's why it did not pull from the docker hub now this when i'm using centos by default if you see here uh, the image size is 215 mb now i'm going to install some package inside this right let's say yum install tree tree this is a, one of the package to get the tree command so that we can see the directory in a tree structure so that is one of the package so now I installed one package and the size of this package is uh, around some 59 KB. It doesn't show much difference. So, what I'll do, yum install uh, IP hyphen utils or net hyphen utils. Hmm. Let me install some uh, VSFTP package, FTP server. Okay, so now I install some other package. This is also uh, not much big size, but it's okay. So overall, uh, some 480 AV is there. Now I'll come out of this container. Now I'll create an image from this container. Docker commit. Container ID and 
this time i don't want to give the name of the repository because i don't want to store in the remote repository let it be in the local itself so now um centos or maybe container one and this way i'm giving version this is as in v1 it's created if you check docker images so this is a container one and the image name and this is the tag is the version one now what i'm going to do i'm going to uh, log in once again docker ps let me log into this container once again docker exit So already it increased from 215 to 247 maybe mb no it's still in the 215 okay yeah this size you're talking yeah yes yeah. this to 247 mb the latest image uh, size is 247 mb now previously it was 215 now it's showing as in 247 so now again i'm logging in and this time i'll install m install i'll do nginx so it contains a lot of packages so size might be also huge maybe 30 to 40 mb it is going to take and uh, etc init.d nginx uh, status i think they removed it from previously it used to uh, able to get it from here okay anyhow so nginx is also installed now let me come out of this one now let me execute the same docker command to create the image but this time i'm going to give version 2 okay so it's created and if you see docker images and this time if you see 290 mb and this is an image name is same but the tag is different so for this tag you can able to see the size is this one because this contains additional package called uh, nginx so when you want to create a container which tag you want to take if you are taking this tag to create a container then you don't get nginx package over there and if you use this tag then you'll get everything the first package is what we installed tree command and vsftp package and along with that you are going to get nginx also so now let me create a container with this one and let me see whether nginx package will be available inside that container or not docker run hyphen it uh, hyphen hyphen name test and uh, container one v1 bin batch so this is the image name and specifically i'm giving v1 sorry hyphen hyphen it's available i created a container now right so now uh, here i'll try to do yum install vsftpd so it's telling already it's installed you no need to install because vsftp is already there m install and uh, tree command this is also already there it's showing already installed i'll try to install nginx m install or uh, let me check whether we can get rpm command yes rpm hyphen qa grep hyphen i nginx nginx is not available rpm hyphen qa is a command in the linux to get all the installed uh, rpm packages from that machine and uh, i'm filtering with grep to check whether a specific package is available or not installed or not and if i check uh, vsftpd so this package was installed so that's why it is showing this rpm package was installed so if you understood so this image contains only tree package and uh, vsftpd nginx is not there so this way we can create tags okay 
so here if you go and check in the docker hub also for every images whatever they are providing there will be a tax till now till yesterday we were using docker run if an it and the image name i'm not specifying any tag over there it means what it will take the latest one whatever is the latest one will be there it is going to take that one let's say if i go to jenkins any image if whatever they are providing so for every image there will be a tax so let me open this image if you see here tax so this is the latest one if you don't give any tag then automatically it will take the latest one and this is the versions okay 2.60.3 2.60.3 help and this is the names of the tags so if you want this specific uh, um uh, tag then you need to specify at the time of creating container docker run if an it and the image name with tags we need to provide so as i said this tags contains some changes okay so there might be done some changes upgrades or maybe any fixes or might be in real time see um you cannot use the same operating system right for example whatever the base centos operating system we took the same CentOS might be having some vulnerabilities. So you need to fix those vulnerabilities. We need to do some patching. Your containers also should be patched. Means whenever we are using the CentOS image, it should be patched. Because maybe in CentOS, if you are those who are worked as a Windows administrator, Linux administrator, you might know, right? Like every quarter or every half yearly, we are going to patch our virtual machines or physical servers from the operating system. Like even your Windows machine laptops also if you connect to the wi-fi automatically it will get updated sometimes whenever you're turning off your laptop it will say don't turn off it is getting updated same way here centos what are the base image you're using your for containers also it might have some vulnerabilities so in real time your containers will be scanned i will tell you when we discuss about uh, the like real time project at the time i will tell you how it will be scanned each container so the scan will detect the problems like your container is having the image whatever it is using it is having some vulnerabilities so we need to fix them we need to patch them right so that's why the image the, like when you do patching means new packages will be installed so when new new package will be installed then it will be added as a new version same way here also they might be added some feature inside it or they might be upgraded it due to that it's changes okay so but how this will work in the real time as of now i created a container and i show you the difference by installing two different packages and i created images with that uh, each package when i install i created a separate separate image and gave versions but in real time we don't connect to containers and we don't do that basically how it will be uh, whenever the developers are writing the code it will be code check-in is going to happen and then if webhooks has been configured then or based upon policm or webhooks then jenkins will connect to the github or bitbucket repository and it will clone the repository it's a ca job build job okay it's a ca job is going to execute it and this is going to be a pipeline and uh, here in this pipeline there will be multiple stages will be there first it will be like uh, git clone is going to happen second stage will be maven build is going to happen maven if it is a, in case if this is a java project maven build is going to happen then once it is built artifacts gets created whether it's a jar or var it gets created and this jar or var okay with the help of this jar and var the third stage will be create docker image so this by using this var file we are going to create a jar for uh, docker file okay docker image we need to create so with the help of uh, docker file we are going to create an image mostly that we'll discuss tomorrow or maybe day after tomorrow about the docker file so with the help of docker file we are going to create an image so the docker image contains this var file this var file will be inside the image so that when we use this image to create a container at the runtime this application is going to run okay 
so image will be created and fourth stage it will be push the image to artifactory whether it's an excess or uh, jfrog anything so push the image to artifactory or it can be any cloud ecr acr or gcr any cloud repositories it is going to push this will be available inside the uh, jenkins pipeline as a ci job so cd job what it will be there jenkins cd job separate it will be there you can use only take the image from the nexus repository and deploy into the some orchestration tool like kubernetes or docker swarm whatever you are using okay so here whenever they are doing this it is getting created image and pushing it to the nexus repository so let me delete this too right so it is getting stored assume this is a jfrog and uh, docker images it is storing here which contains the var file if it is a web application now again they uh, this what they'll do this uh, docker image we can deploy on some environment so the testing team can do the testing and once they confirm like if they find any issues in the logic of the code then again we'll get back to the they'll get back to the developers and developers again they'll do some changes so whenever again they're doing some changes again the jenkins will pick up the code and uh, again the, it is going to create an image and again that image is going to have a different version so in this jenkins job is uh, executing here we are going to write a logic like whenever it is getting triggered it should store with the here manually i'm giving version 1 version 2 but here whenever it's creating docker image automatically it should store as a versions it cannot override the existing one because we want history of the each and every docker image in the artifactory so in the jenkins file itself we'll define for example based upon the build number it will take the build number and will create it as a version tag and will store inside the artifactory so that way every time your docker image is going to be created and it contains multiple changes like multiple layers just now i told you like manually i shown you how to install a package and there will be multiple versions so here also this docker image contains multiple versions because uh, basically in the image only thing is changing in the application level the var file is getting changed so next time whenever the docker image is getting created it is going to get the latest var so then we can decide once the testing team confirms the same docker image we are going to use it inside the different environments like staging pre prod and prod environment because once it is we find that it's stable perfectly works fine and confirmed by the testing functional testing guys then we can use the same docker image in different environments but remaining docker images will keep it as a history right so this is how the docker images are going to be built in the real world with multiple images so when we talk about a docker file that time i will explain in more detail like uh, how we write docker file because in real time we use docker file and uh, in the docker file itself we'll define how to uh, copy this var file into a image and uh, how it gets executed at the time of runtime so that application should start automatically when i deploy this docker image that we'll discuss at the time of docker file so understood right this is about the layers and uh, tags so here also um, it is going to store as a tags docker image it just will be stored in the nexus repository as a tags for example this is one of the microservice so it is going to store as a what are the build number you are using in case that build number one two three so we can pick up any build number latest one and we can able to deploy onto any of the environment so this is about the tags and uh, versions and uh, yesterday when i was talking about uh, uh, docker login right so i did not give anything just i used a docker login if you want to connect to the de default docker hub then we should use this docker login so that it will connect to the central repository and we can able to push the images but in your organization we don't use docker hub we use our own uh, 
private repositories at that time you should use docker login and the url to connect that nexus or uh, jfrog whatever the url will be provided by the tools guys if you are managing that nexus or artifactory as a devops engineer means you build from scratch then you should be having authority guys can you please go on mute those who don't, don't want to speak okay so, so in some organizations you are not going to manage the nexus or jfrog artifact there will be separate tools team will be there just they will create access to us and uh, they, we just use they'll create one repository for us and we use that repository in our jenkins pipeline to push the images in some organizations we are going to build it from the scratch and we are going to have authority to manage it it depends so you need to provide that url if they give with uh, any port number okay url with any port if they give that url port you need to mention and what are the credentials you provide it will be always domain credentials in the real time organization so you need to provide your domain credentials so that from this machine you can push the images to the nexus or jfrog artifacts okay any doubts So this scenario sometimes see um, um, yeah tell me can, can you repeat this again the command the docker login url port yeah actually when i use docker login it it is asking credentials right actually it is showing login succeeded yesterday i executed this command it was asking me credentials so which credential it is expecting by default it is expecting docker hub credentials so i, I have already docker hub credential so i provided there that's why when I executed Docker push uh, the image name, automatically it knows that okay, I connected to the uh, public Docker registry, so I should push the image to that registry. So that is what happened yesterday. But in real time, you don't use Docker Hub. You use your own private registry. Like uh, it can be, as I said, Nexus, JFrog, or it can be ACR or ecr or gcr these are the container registries inside the cloud it can be anything so that url you need to give for example azure dot some acr in azure it will be like azure dot azure dot io something like this will be there so this url we need to give and credentials will be should be provided here okay a pretty non quick question that mentioned mm -hmm. Port, hmm. port, there. port means if it is running one specific port that service then you should use port or else if they have oh. if they are giving the url so if you are managing you will come to know what is your uh, uh, nexus or jfrog artifact url that url you are going to provide here or someone else is pro managing it they will give you the url and the repository name so first you take the url you just use the url to connect it and the repository name at the time of creating image you can use it so that it can able to uh, push it okay got it thank you sir yeah praveen one quick question earlier you mentioned when you uh, get the nginx to build the uh, container you said multiple patches or multiple versions are there that's why we are downloading all the versions that i did not get it because once they do the patches the previous one should get deleted right because only one latest version should be available that's what we download yes so whenever you are doing patching to your machine obviously the previous version will be not the latest version will be there yeah that is correct but when you install that nginx it is showing a multiple mm. lines multiple uh, uh multiple packages or multiple images i believe that's what uh, it is giving one image id for each and every version you mean to say layers oh uh, layers that's true See, layer not only contains about the patching okay i said one mm -hmm. of the example is sometimes if you do patch that is also become one layer but they might be installed some other package or they might change something inside that uh, configuration settings See in the previous batches when I was doing Nginx installation, 
nginx was not by default was started so at that time mm -hmm. i was using uh, etc init.t okay uh, yeah. nginx and then manually i used to start it but now i'm not doing it there might be done some changes so when you're doing some changes then again you are going to create an image from that and that image will be new layer so even though you did not install anything but you go to some configuration file and you do change it and you take mm -hmm. the image and that is a new change right so that will be applied to that new layer of that image okay. so here i am talking about one thing just like uh, i would like to recommend here not only installing the some packages it is going to have a new layer even if you do any changes in the configuration file and to, to take effect that you are going to take the um, image of that container and that is also will be an again another layer it's not only when we are installing the packages it is going to create a layer if you do any simple configuration file changes and again you take the image and at that time you are giving v3 okay version 3 to the new image when you are creating so whenever you are creating a container with that v3 image so whatever the configuration you have done in the changes that will apply to the v3 image so when you create new container the changes will be applied so that is also called as a new layer okay not only when we are installing the packages it is going to be a new layer okay got you so if someone uh, download the image of version 3 so they are going to see version 2 and version 1 also as layers yes that gets downloaded okay got you right thank you okay so this is very very important tags are very very important uh, in your uh, real time because when you are deploying you need to decide which tag you need to deploy and what changes will be there inside the tags will be available okay so that you can deploy that specific application on microservice on the specific environment okay so this is about the images and uh, tags so now we talk about uh, docker networking okay so till now we were discussing about images now we talk about docker networking so let us go to the official document so whenever we talk about docker network we need to talk about network drivers can anyone tell me what are the network drivers are available if someone already knows that grid yes. you mean ethernet no someone telling something apart from uh, ethernet someone said grid something network overlay enforcement overlay mac vlan exactly so those are the network drivers so to see how what are the networks are available this is a command to check docker network uh, ls so we can able to see our default networks okay, here we can see this is the name bridge host and none these are the storage drivers okay so here if you see bridge host none or null apart from this we have many more okay um, where it is so we have bridge overlay mcvlan okay host and none these are the network drivers are available inside this docker is this drivers functionality is like uh, similar or one one driver is having specific functionality yeah, each driver is having specific uh, functionality okay so now these are the network drivers bridge host overlay make vlan and uh, none let us discuss about each individual network 
So first one is bridge. The default network driver is bridge here. Means when we install the Docker, the default network driver is bridge. So if you don't specify a driver, this is the type of network you are creating. So bridge networks are usually used when your application running a standalone container that need to come in. Okay. So here. Pravin. Yep. Yes, tell me. So can you just give us an overview of what Docker networking? What is Docker networking? Can you give us an overview? Yeah, that is what we are discussing now. It's not yet completed. I started Docker network just now. So okay. I'm going to explain you by showing in the diagram. Okay. Yeah. So in the Docker network, we sure. have this network drivers. So one by one, we'll discuss so that you can understand it. Okay. What is Docker network? Okay, not over you. We are going to discuss very in depth of this Docker networking. So, first of all, net you know, right? The basic meaning of networking is for communication purpose. That is the main purpose of networking. So, here, Docker networking, how we are able to access the containers and how containers are accessing internally or how it can be accessed through the external world. That is called like Docker networking. So, when we installed Docker like this is your first bare metal operating system. We choose Amazon Linux or CentOS, whatever it may be. Maybe let's say I selected Amazon Linux. This is a virtual machine from the AWS. And uh, on top of that, I installed a Docker engine software. So this is a Docker engine. Right. And this is called as a Docker host where you install Docker engine is called as a Docker host machine. So now, when you are creating these containers here, how they are connecting, how they are getting connected because when you install the Docker software, automatically what it is doing, the Docker software is creating a small network inside this host machine. So if you see here, um, we have a, a command inside the Docker, Docker inspect network, and this is a network name you can give. This is a bridge network. I'm just checking. It's like a describe command. And if you see here, uh, these are the container IPs, and uh, this is a subnet. So this subnet range means it is creating one. Those who are having good in the networking, then they can understand. Those who are doesn't have networking, it will be tough to understand networking concepts. So you should have networking knowledge. When you want to learn Kubernetes or uh, Docker, okay, because this is something like a, a infrastructure part only, okay. So this is a subnet part. So this subnet and this is a gateway. So what it is doing when the, we are installing this Docker software, it is creating a network for internally for its Docker, okay. So what it is doing uh, here, this is a network. And for this network, it is creating a gateway. This is a gateway IP. So the first IP from this subnet, it's using class B. And from this subnet, it is using the first IP as a gateway. So here it is using the gateway IP address. And from container, it is going to use 172.17.0.2 because already one is used from this network range. So for next uh, containers, it is going to assign this range to and for this one, it will be uh, 0 0.3. So this will be 0 0.3. So what it is going to do, your AWS virtual machine is having some network range. So this is my private IP range where it is. This is the one. And this is the IP for your virtual machine now this gateway what it is doing this is going to come this gateway is created to access with the this specific docker host if you sit in your virtual machine right now i'm inside the virtual machine if i check with if config you can able to see this is the ip range docker zero this is the gateway between inside your machines containers and your host machine Okay, this is a host machine IP address. So internally when we install docker software, it's created this network and this is a gateway to communicate to this network. That's why when I accessing this uh, container Nginx image, 
the nginx container so it comes up to here from this machine it will go inside with this gateway so the request will come here when we are asking assume we are in the office and we are in the private network so in my office when i am trying to access this uh, container but let's say it's an nginx image so now it will come to here and from here to here internet will go to this gateway from this gateway it will go and access this specific container when we are trying to access it and same way this one also so this is the bridge it is going to create and this bridge is having this is the ip address this is a gateway and it is communicating to this machine so your virtual machine in the aws also having a subnet so if you have another virtual machine that machine might have 172.31.39.183 something like this okay but internally this is a docker host and inside this to communicate your containers docker is installing this network and it's creating this as an uh, gateway to access it with the your docker host so docker host with the help of docker host, you can able to access so that is the purpose of bridge here okay the default network driver so bridge network are usually used when your applications run in standalone containers that need to communicate so standalone machines means this is an independent machine so in this independent machine it is going to able to communicate with this machine only understood right the purpose of bridge and uh, in the docker host machine if you execute if config you can able to see these are the two networks means as of now two containers are available so this is the ip address virtual ethernet card for these two containers it got created and inside these two containers let's say if i go and log in and see docker execute if an it <laughs> i'll check the ip address by default uh, uh, it is, will be not available so yum install net hyphen tools i'm going to get uh, if config command you see for the first container this is a ip address okay 172.17.0.2 so for the first container randomly it will give the ip address for the third container it will be three fourth it will be like that so what is the range it's a 16 series means what 65000 ips it can be assigned means 65000 containers also you can create because those many ips will be available so this is about the bridge network so someone asked me what is this networking is it your doubt cleared the purpose of the docker networking is how your containers are accessible to the external world so for that in the docker we have multiple network drivers so which network driver is suitable for you you can use that so by default it is using uh, when you install docker inside your machine it is taking the bridge as a default network driver is it your doubts clear someone asked the overview of docker yes, sir, yes 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 yep and second one is host. so one question yep okay uh, uh... Open the paint. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in the subnet range, okay. So for this bridge, uh, at a, there is a subnet range uh, which is slash sixteen. So uh, in this time, the first IP will always be reserved for this uh, bridge. Uh, this network, right? Yes. Okay. See, it's not only yeah. first IP. Okay. Randomly, sometimes when you are creating network, it can pick any IP, but mostly it will pick first IP or sometimes it will pick last IP also. 254 IP also it can pick. Or if you want to specify the gateway IP, you can also specify. If you don't want one, if you want to specify your own IP like uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, then also at the time of creating bridge, you can specify, I want this IP should be the gateway then it will take that ip also that i will show you tomorrow like how to create our own network so this is the default network when we install docker the it's created one default network and inside the default network 
the containers are getting created but i don't want 170.17 series i want my own series maybe 192 series so for that i will create a network and in that network i am going to create the containers so we can have our own network separate and we can use that network to create the containers also and uh, instead of randomly assigning dynamically assigning the ip addresses i want to assign specific ip address to a container that is also possible that everything We'll discuss tomorrow. Okay. Another thing, so uh, yeah. like we do in uh, EC2 instances. Okay, so if there is any IP which is coming from external OL, so we are mm. allowing it. Okay, so we are configuring it based on that. So similarly, mm. uh, should we do it in containers? You mean to say internally no. inside this machine? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so like we do for EC2 instances, right? So, is there any uh, way to do it uh, for containers? Should it be done or it should not be done? What you want to do? Or EC2 takes care of? No, what you Any want to do? Linux instance, it is some Linux instance. Okay, for Linux instance, mm. uh, there is an IP okay, which is coming from external world. So we are allowing mm. that IP okay, right? Mm. So we are configuring it based on that. So in actual or somewhere. Mm. Mm. Okay. So similarly, uh, so when it uh, uh, when we want to connect uh, uh, to my container, okay, from external world. So should there be mm. any configuration done for that particular IP? From the host level itself, you can configure. If this is an AWS machine, in the security groups, you can configure it, or okay. it, you can configure it in the network NSG rules. Also, you can configure it. Or else, if this is a virtual machine in the okay. VMware world, then you can configure it in the firewall and firewall rules. You can be able to configure. So because so it should be it done at the host, the host level, and from host it is going inside, right? So host level itself, you can block whichever IP you want. Okay, 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 okay. So there, I mean, there is nothing like container level we should do. There is nothing like that, right, sir? No. Because container level containers are not uh, immortal. They are mortal, right? So anytime they can die, the again new containers gets created in the real world. So again, new containers gets new IP. So you cannot configure it from the container level. Understood. Yes. So the second driver is host. So for standalone containers remove network isolation between the container and the docker host and use the docker's networking directly means if you are using a host network driver then you will don't have this it is not going to install or configure this network layer here so directly your containers are going to use your docker host network like for example uh, this will be the containers are going to get created and their will be no network layer will be available here and this is a docker engine and this is a uh, os part and what are the subnet is there from this subnet it is going to assign the ip address so it is going to take host subnet 172.31.39.184 this way it is going to assign the ip address so there will be no Network layer will be there. So there is no gateway required and separate network series is not required. Directly it is going to take the IPs from the host subnet. From that range, it is going to assign the IP addresses. This is about the host. Basically, we don't use them. And overlay. Overlay networks connect multiple Docker daemons together and enable SWAM services to communicate with each other. So this one will use uh, like if you have this machine single machine but in real time uh, what are the contents are running here if something happens to this virtual machine whatever is inside this uh, virtual machine also all the contents will be stopped so your application will be stopped so we don't use in as a single container right so what we are going to use we are going to use it's like a multiple 
virtual machines this way so all together we are going to configure as an overlay network so this overlay network we do when we want to configure docker swam so what is docker swam it's an orchestration tool right so when we discuss about the introduction docker swam and uh, kubernetes cloud foundry so these are the orchestration tools so what it will do if you have multiple machines by default internally they will not this container cannot able to communicate to this one this one cannot able to communicate to this one but if if you configure two replicas inside this single virtual machine if this virtual machine goes down then where is the high availability for your application so that's why what we'll do we'll take multiple virtual machines when i want to run an application and uh, each container is going to for example i mentioned three replicas so one will be created here another will be here and another will be here and all together these three it is going to have the access okay so this way on top of this your application is going to running means it can be accessible if this virtual machine goes down still you have two containers are running in two different machines and uh, if this is also goes down this will be available so this way we can achieve high availability but how this will be communicated with the help of this overlay network if you configure overlay network then this three can able to access so when you are deploying the application it will be running on the streets like uh, those are from the network uh, windows background or unix background like you know veritas cluster or microsoft cluster for your servers for example those are from the oracle dba in the oracle db also we have oracle rack or oracle clusters we are going to configure right this is a cluster we call it as a cluster so this this with the help of this network they can able to communicate this all machines okay so that we can configure with the overlay when we configure docker daemons means what in each machine docker daemon is going to run where when you install docker here here docker service is running daemon here also docker daemon will run so all these docker daemons can run in a single cluster that way we can configure with the overlay and mcvlan networks allow you to assign a mac address to a container sometimes in real world some of the in the previous uh, scenarios the applications was configured in such a way that that application will run on specific mac address means in the application if it is used if you are using the ip address it is not going to run if you are giving the mac address of that machine then only that application will start so if you did not find that specific mac address then that application is not going to start if it finds a new mac address so in this scenario so make vlan what it will give network allows you to assign a mac address to a container okay so making it appear as a physical device on your network so your application assumes that okay this is a physical device and it contains a mac address and that mac address will be registered with that application and then it will run it's a very old uh, legacy application sometimes depend upon that coding it requires okay most of the cases no one will use this uh, option because nowadays if you are going with specific options then it will not work properly okay so none means for this country disable all networking usually used in conjunction with a custom network driver so none means there will be no networking inside your docker machine okay so these are the docker uh, con networking concepts so tomorrow i will show you how to create bridge networks and our own uh, bridge networks how to create and inside that network how we can specifically create the containers and how i can uh, assign specific ip to my container all these things we'll discuss in tomorrow session okay so let me log into this machine so yesterday we were talking about docker networking so today we'll discuss how to create docker networking and how to create our containers in the newly created network okay so here if we check docker network ls these are the default network which is available the bridge network and there is one network called uh, this one this is the one and if we check docker inspect 
network and this uh, network id if you check so here we can see this is a default network got created and this is a subnet automatically it use if even if you install docker also it will use the same subnet everywhere and this is a gateway that is what we discussed yesterday so now and whenever we create containers automatically they are getting created inside this specific um, network so now i want to create my own network with some uh, default uh, separate subnet range okay so how we can create that the so same the docker command we can use okay so, and even docker also uh, provide some official document for that we'll see from there also we can copy to create Good. So this is a one docker network create so here if you see the bridge network to create uh, so if you see here docker network create hyphen hyphen driver equal to bridge so which one you want to create that is you need to mention i've heard driver equal to bridge network we are going to create and which subnet okay and this is a subnet range you can give any uh, private ip range you can define and this is a name okay so what i'm going to do i'm going to create a network with this one but i don't want to give this name uh, i want to give the name is 192 network so that i can easily understand that whenever i look into this network so i can understand okay this network range is 192 series okay so i can able to create it and if you check docker network ls okay if you see the name 192 network and this is a network id and this is also bridge and uh, one more network i want to create and uh, this one in the same uh, command itself you can define uh, your ip range and you can define your gateway also in this command we did not define the gateway so if we go and check with the inspect command docker inspect network and this is a network id if you see here this is a subnet range and by default uh, whenever we start using it it will use 168.0.1 as a gateway okay but uh, even if you want to decide from this network range which ip should be assigned as a gateway manually if you want to assign then you can give this way okay so this is nothing but this is also same command like uh, you can just Remove this backslash. And, uh, you can execute or directly also you can execute. It will work. Okay. So some people might be confused. Those who don't know, like uh, it might be in a different format. So it's not like that. So just a command. Okay. So this is the name. So driver bridge subnet 170.78 is a uh, private ip range so if you remember 170.16 to 170.31 from this range they are private range okay so 170.28 is also private range and uh, iphone iphone ip range from this subnet it is taking like it's doing subnetting inside this one okay so iphone iphone ip range again slash 24 minutes from this only this it's like a doing subnetting and uh, if you see here slash 24 so we don't want the complete 65,000 IP. So we can do what we can doing IP range is this one. So this IP range will be allocated to this network and gateway IP address. You can define anyone. So 254 or one or two or three, anything you can define as per your request. If you don't give automatically, it will take the first IP of this IP range. That's the difference. So this is and for this one also, I don't want to give this one. I will give. 172 network the name will be so that i can understand this network is belongs to 172 network it's created docker 
network so this is 172 network and if you check docker inspect network so if you see from this subnet this is an ip range you can create more ip range also from because this is 16 so you can create more ip ranges because i don't want completely single 65000 network into a for single network so multiple ip ranges also we can create instead of wasting the ips or if you want multiple network and this is a gateway so this is how we configured so now we have three networks so this is a docker host my docker host machine and um, here We have three networks one is default 172.17.0.0 slash 16 and uh, another one is 192.168.0.0 slash 16 and another one is uh, 172.28.0.0 slash 16 okay under this we have a network we can ignore that now these are the three different networks has been created so this is a default one these two we created now whatever the containers are getting created let's say i created two containers over here and uh, some two containers over here and the same two containers over here now internally these containers can able to communicate and we can able to access from externally and these controls also communicate internally and we can able to access from external because because of the gateway ip address okay so there will be gateway ip address for each and every network so this will be 172.17.0.1 is a gateway ip address here and uh, here it will be default uh, 192. 168.0.1 will be the gateway IP address and uh, here we provided specifically the gateway IP address 172.28.0.254 because we define the gateway so with the help of this gateway it can able to communicate with this uh, host uh, network and then this is the host network IP address in the private subnet with the help of this one it can able to communicate this gateway range so externally also if you do port forwarding for this containers then those external ports host ports need to be allowed in the security group so that we can able to access but internally they will not communicate this container cannot able to container communicate with this one this cannot be able to communicate to this one why because it's isolated to communicate with the external world you have a gateway so with the help of this gateway it is coming and reaching here but internally from this network to this network you don't have any gateway to communicate this is a different network and this is a different network right in uh, ip addressing so two different networks cannot be able to communicate and unless you configure a gateway so that's the reason here internally they will not communicate each other and we don't require also to communicate okay until unless if there is a dependency of your uh, application okay so by default they are not going to communicate so this is how it will work internally so these are it's like a separate network and this will be the separate network and this will be the separate network they will not communicate only they will communicate to your docker host and through the external world it can able to access if you do port forwarding okay so this is how it will work and we'll do the testing also okay while creating i'll create one container here and one container here and we'll see how uh, both can able to communicate from the external world and how they will not communicate internally okay so for that so now let me create an uh, container in uh, both the networks okay <laughs> now 
docker run hyphen it hyphen hyphen name let's say ubuntu 192 hyphen hyphen network hmm, 192 network hyphen p I'm not sure whether already 88 is using, so I'm giving 80. Let me give Nginx. Or here the name I can give Nginx. And this is the image name. And this is the shell I'm going to give. Okay, it got created. Now uh, we'll see whether nginx is running or not mm, yes it also okay let it be so now what i want to do i will install some package inside this one let me check which os it is using it's using debian so i'm going to use apt get uh, update first so whenever you want to install any package in the debian or ubuntu first you need to execute apt get update and then you can able to install IP hyphen utils. Mm. What is the package? There is a package name net hyphen utils. Apt get install. Net typhoon tools. Okay. Okay, so install the package and if I check now if config it is working. If you see here 192.168.0.2 IP has been assigned to one of the container. So here in this network when I created so for this container it created this is an IP to this one of the container and now the same what I'm going to do let me come out of this one and check docker ps so this is a container got created and now the same command i'm going to execute but um, i'll just change the name of the container to 172 and network is also 172 network because these are the names i provided and uh, port number is also 86 i'm going to give have a quick question please yes yeah, what's the difference between the iPhone mean, P, the lower case, and the upper case? P? Yes. Yeah. I did not get you. Now, this is lower case. If yes. we use upper case, what is the difference? Mm. Is there any? So, here you're talking about this one the port iPhone P. Yes. Mm, there is a difference. Okay. Uh, I forgot the difference between lower case and upper case P. Okay. Let me come out of that one. I can capital P uh, randomly as a port. Yeah, exactly. So we no need to specify the port. So when you give upper case P, randomly here it is going to assign the port. So as of now, we are defining this specific port, right? that I want this port. So if you are using a uh, per case P, then uh, randomly it is going to assign the port. Okay. So you don't need to specify the port. Okay, so Docker PS. Okay, the another container also got created. And uh, 
now let me log into this machine also docker apt get update and then we'll do apt get uh, install net type and tools now if i check so this is a ip has been assigned to this specific uh, container if you see 28.5 because from that uh, subnet it is assigning the ip address okay so now if i try to ping from here ping uh, i need to check ping which package IP utils hyphen ping. Okay, let me install this package. So apt get install IP hyphen utils. It's not there. IP utils hyphen ping. Apt get install IP utils hyphen ping. Yes, I want to install okay now i can able to get the ping command and uh, what was the ip of the previous container 192.168.0.2 so if you want to try to ping from this one ping so you cannot able to ping to that network okay because internally there is no gateway so two different networks are not able to communicate okay so this is how uh, we configure it and uh, in different networks if you don't want the default network then you can able to use your own networks and uh, you can assign some public range uh, sorry private type range for your networks and you can create it so now from externally uh, to test it yes so uh... I mean, uh, assume uh, we have already, you know, like uh, uh, launched the container, okay, and we didn't specify uh, any of the network, so it will take a default. And yes. uh, after that, we have created a few, few networks here. So, can we attach that container to this network at a point in time? Uh, that is what I said in the previous session also, whether it can be port or image or volumes or network, like once you created the container. We cannot modify the settings of that existing container. So you should create a new container with the same image. So if you want to create in the new network, then you can create a container in the new network and you can delete the old container. That is how it's possible. So you cannot change, modify the settings of that existing container. Okay. So if you want to create it in the new network, then you should create in a new network with the same image and then stop the old container okay. that is how it will work okay so now i would like to access this both uh, from the um, external world so two different containers are running on two different ports so let me access it but uh, i need to allow i think i a lot of full traffic so now i can able to access this one so by taking the public ip of this container uh, public ip of this docker host t85 its security group is not allowed Esther, did I give the full access like all the ports allowed or uh, I allowed specific ports? I don't remember. Yeah, you opened all. No, no I did not open. I opened only 8080 and 8081. So let me allow all the ports so that uh, always we no need to configure it. Add rule. 
and uh, all traffic and for everyone okay now save it now again refresh this one so let me go and check uh, whether nginx is running inside this machine or not docker etc init.t nginx okay it is not started that's the reason we're not able to access the page so now again if i try here okay i started in the 8086 so let me try in the 8086 container okay i can able to access but uh, i did not start it in and if you see the request is also in the logs it is showing um whenever we are accessing this page again if i do one more hit so here we can able to see that so now let me go and start in the another container So externally, these containers are able to access, even if I created in two different networks, they can able to access from the external, but internally they are not able to communicate. Okay. So now again here also let me check whether Nginx is started. No. So this container is running on 8085. And let me try with an 8085 port. yes can able to access so here also again it got uh, this is my public ip from where we are trying to access and logs are getting generated here okay so this is how the two different networks are accessible through the external world but internally they cannot able to access and now only one final thing is left inside this topic that is like how to assign the ip address means by default dynamically it is assigning the ip address so now I want to assign specific IP to the container. So how can I do that? Uh, let me come out of this container. Okay, yeah. So both are in different network now. So that's the reason we are not able to email communicate. So both the containers are in the same network. So we'll be able to communicate. Sorry. Can you please now, come again? Uh, you have showed so both both the containers, okay. So they are in different network nodes. So you have created 182 yes. and 172. So yes. if uh, two containers are in the same network, let's say like both the containers are in 172, they'll be able to communicate, right? Yeah, they will be able to communicate because they are in the same network. So obviously they are going to communicate. Okay, to communicate two diff uh, two IPs in the single network there will be no problem so they can able to communicate so let me try that one also so i mean is there any interface created on docker i mean on the host on the host level yeah so here whenever the containers are getting created one virtual interfaces gets created if you see two containers are available right now so these are the two containers it is showing and uh, these are the bridge networks. So this is a default bridge per 172.17. When we install the Docker, this is a default network got created. So this is a default bridge to communicate with this host. When I created manually two different networks, so this is a bridge for those two networks. And this is 192.168.0.1 IP using as a gateway. And this is a bridge. And this is 5.254, which I uh, manually defined this IP and address as a gateway so these are the two bridges total three so these are two bridges which got created when i created uh, networks and uh, this is a default ethernet card for my virtual machine 
and these are the two again virtual ethernet cards for the containers so how many containers we are getting created those many ethernet cards will be available but if your container is in stop put state then this will be deleted okay again it will be assigned a new uh, ip address and a new container uh, like a new network over here now again i'll create a third container now it will show third virtual ethernet card here for the docker containers If we have like yeah. hundred containers, so we we will be shown. If you have hundred containers, and for all hundred containers, it will show the virtual Ethernet cards over here in the if config command from the okay. host level. So I'm going to create a new container, and uh, for this, I will give name uh, like uh, iPhone one okay the name of the container because already one more container is available with nginx 172 and i want to create in the 172 network it got created now i need to install app get update and app get uh, install net hyphen tools app get install ip utils hyphen ping okay so i got it ping command also so let me check the this is a ip address has been assigned and if you remember for the first container which i created in the 172 network it was assigned 5.0 so now from here i want to ping that 172 dot 28.5.0 okay it's can able to connect okay so this is the first country which i created this is ip so if you want we can able to log into the another container and we can see confirm the ip address whether i'm pinging the correct ip or not docker ps and um, 172 this one Okay, if you see the name, this is the first country which I created in the 172 network. Now let me log into this one. And if you check if config, this is the IP for this first container. So you can able to communicate the containers between the network, but you cannot able to communicate with the different network. Okay and as i said the final thing is to create a container with a static ip it means i am going to define an ip address instead of the uh, docker decides the ip range ip address to a container okay so now everything you we can use what are the options we want is everything we are going to give the docker and command itself at the time of creating so you want name you want volume you want image we want ports everything we are going to define in the same command so whatever is the requirement so again docker run iphone it iphone f name we can give the name of the container so i'll give nginx 172 hyphen 2 so that this is the second container and uh, iphone p 9080 and then hyphen hyphen ip so we can give the ip 172.28.5.100 i want to give 5.0 5.1 is already used and hyphen hyphen network and the network name from which network you want to assign the ip address and then uh, image so i'm going to give nginx image okay and bash network not phone okay so the name is 172 network okay 172 hmm from demo the container name nginx is already exists Then we should give 
three. Okay, it's created one more container with the specific IP address, whatever I defined here. So now again, let me install the package to see the IP address. App to get update and app to get install net hyphen tools. Now, if you check if config. So this is the IP address has been assigned to this container. Okay, so manually we can assign the IP address also if you want or else if uh, Docker let the assign the IP address also then you no need to define the IP address and automatically it is going to define basically we don't want to define the IP address because here containers are not uh, immortal. Okay, so anytime it can die even though we are assigning the static ip there is no use okay randomly it will pick the ip from the network and it will take it so it's no use of that one okay but still we can have sometimes we may want to assign the ip then we can able to assign in that way okay so this is about the docker network if you have any questions you can ask me or else we'll jump into the docker volumes concept Uh, Pravin will be discussing Docker Swarm for multi node those. Docker Swarm actually not yet uh, included in that because anyhow we are going to discuss about the Kubernetes. The alternative for Docker Swarm is Kubernetes. So because there are a lot of disadvantages in the Docker Swarm and a lot of benefits in the Kubernetes, a lot of objects we can find in the Kubernetes. So that's why we uh we are going to learn about the kubernetes instead of docker spam we'll see uh, at least i'll try to talk about some basics about the docker spam and then uh, we can jump into the kubernetes okay Praveen, uh, yeah uh, actually i just want to what is the difference between uh, run command and the exec command run command is to create the container exec is to go inside the container once it is created to go inside the mm -hmm. container we are going to actually yeah uh, while i'm trying to execute uh, docker exec hyphen ip container name and the port mm -hmm. number a bin slash bash this is the command which i'm using but at that time i'm getting one error, like uh, runtime exec failed Okay. Even I, okay. I started the container. You so just ping in the WhatsApp group. Okay. Whenever you are doing anyone, if you are guys are doing practice and you are facing any issues, we have a group, okay. right? So just ping that error or whatever you are facing the issue. Just ping mm -hmm. in the group. Okay. Yeah. So that myself or anyone who already practiced or anyone who already know like this one, someone help me. Like what is the upper case of uh, P? Like that anyone can help. Okay, or myself if I get time, I will look into it and I will also get will do replay. Sure, I'll uh, post that uh, message error message in the group. Okay. Okay, so now we talk about uh, Docker volumes. Okay. So what is the purpose of volumes? I hope everyone knows about uh, the volume. Good question. So here. Hello. Yes. Uh, Pravin, uh, it's regarding uh, the Docker images. Okay. Hmm. So in Docker Hub, uh, there is a image Docker. Okay. Sorry. In Docker. Hello. Your voice is breaking. Am I audible now? Yes, tell me. Mm, yeah, there is image called as Docker. Okay. Uh, so I didn't understand. I mean, what is the purpose of that particular image? Because uh, we are already running uh, the Docker container on top of the Docker. So can we run the Docker image on top of this uh, container? Hmm. 
you mean to say there is an image called docker that is what you are asking what is the purpose of the image docker your voice is not clear yes yes what is it see a container also again can run as a docker like okay. if you are using an image okay and this is an uh, uh, image which we are using docker image means it's already installed with a docker inside that image so when you are using that image as a container so again this is acting like a docker host so like how we are treating this as a docker host so again this is also going to be used as a docker host so that's why they have the docker image which is already installed with the docker software inside that so container will become as a docker host now at that time again inside that you can create docker containers inside that one yes. okay so now we talk about the volumes here basically the containers are ephemeral means they are like mortal if any time they created it's not permanent like how we get our virtual machines in our environment uh, or maybe physical servers but our containers can create any time and they can die any time so they are not uh, immortal so now then why we need volumes sometimes basically the containerization when we choose if your applications are stateless applications okay stateless applications means what it is not going to store any data if it is even though if it is generating any data and we don't want the data because if the container got created and deleted whatever the data it was generated it will be also deleted along with the container so if you don't want that data then those applications are called as in stateless applications basically most of the times we use stateless applications only means whatever the containers getting created here this containers assume this is application container and um, it's generating some data applications obviously will generate some data if you don't want the data if that container got deleted then automatically the data will also get deleted so these are called as a stateless applications but there will be some applications will be there which are called as a stateful applications which means what it need to maintain the data the data is required like database if you are deploying mysql database as a container then obviously database need to have otherwise if the database container got deleted and if the data is also got it deleted then how applications will work back end application will connect to the database and it will get the information let's say if you take um, assume flipkart site okay e-commerce site so we will buy a lot of things from here so front end it will run the application servers and uh, this will be the like a uh, web server and uh, this is an application server and back end it may be running with a database where all the content of this website like uh, iphones whatever we are buying whatever they are available everything will be in the database so whenever we are accessing as a user from this website it will fetch from this database and will give us a pages okay this is what you are searching for if the database is not there data is there not there then how this websites can able to give that information it cannot able to fetch so database need the data so here also if the mysql is the database if you are deploying as a container then it should store the data compulsory otherwise it will be a problem so those type of applications are called as stateful applications which is expecting data should be there so here whenever we are creating a container so it is taking a bare os right base os from here whatever the os was there so it was taking from here maybe whatever the os which is there so it is creating a temporary volumes here like temporary volumes under this varlib docker location and uh, it is getting mounted to a container and whenever this container get deleted and here also they will get deleted okay so like um, let me log into this machine once again
so now <clears throat> docker ps if you see here and uh, docker inspect this container id if you check and uh, see this inspect command you can use to any object you can use it to image you can use it to volume you can use it to container okay you can use it to the network you can it will describe the information means it will give you the information so here if you see these are the directories are available here okay so if you see these are the volume directories so now and if you see this is an overlay tool and we have a storage driver that we'll discuss now so this overlay to and it is going to create a directory with the container id and it is going to store the whatever the files you are creating so when i'm log into this container let me log into any of the container and if you check df-it what it is doing this is the 7.9 uh, volume like uh, is mounted as a slash inside the container so from where it is getting it is getting from the main docker host okay so from here it is getting this volume so whatever this docker host contains if you check in the docker host dffnh so whatever the slash volume is there that is getting mounted so back end it is mounting inside the var lib docker okay so now if i come out of this one if i check dffnh you can see 7.9 gb and this is the usage and if you see these are the volumes so for every container it's created under var lib docker and it is using this volume and it is mounting over here so when the container get deleted the data will also get deleted now what i'll do i'll log into this machine once again i'll create some files touch file one file two file three i got created these are the three files created now i'll come out of this container and right now i'm in the docker host so now it will be available inside this directory and if you see find uh, you see here under this location we can able to see these are the files okay and these are the os related whatever is allocated to that specific container and now if i delete the container these files will be deleted so let me come out of this directory and uh, docker ps and uh, docker rm f forcefully i'm deleting i actually you need to stop the container and you need to delete it but i'm giving f to forcefully delete the container now again if i find the file name with file one i'm not able to get that and if you see here in the dffnh also previously it was showing four and now it is showing only three because whatever the volume it got created it's a temporary volume and it got deleted okay so that's why whatever the data it is generating in the container level as of now if i log in the container if it is generating any logs or any application xml files or anything inside that application level they are not going to be available once the counter got deleted so if the if it is not required then it's okay if it is required then you need to create a volumes and you need to assign it so those kind of applications are called a stateful application so that's the reason now we'll start discussing about volumes how to use the volumes okay so here volumes uh prevent quick question types. yeah so you you said uh, each uh, container is taking around 5g 5 gb hmm. so you mean once the docker daemon is created yes uh, so is it taking from is it initially taking some space for the docker and each container is getting a 5 gb so if, we, if, 
if you create three containers, so is it going to take uh, 15 GB from the overall memory of the hard disk? No. Mm -hmm. Your Docker host contains, mm -hmm. this machine contains 8 GB only. Oh, okay. okay. It contains mm -hmm. only 8 GB. And mm -hmm. that 8 GB, it is using as a slash. When you created this virtual machine, AWS mm -hmm. instance, from this 8 GB for OS related, it used 2.9 GB and it's available is 5 GB. Right? 5 GB, yeah. Yep. Now, um, here, check DI5H, here it is using this one. So now, when you install the Docker, where it mm -hmm. is getting created, under the where lib Docker is the location of the Docker, all the configuration, everything will be available over here. So okay. when you created a container, so this is a storage driver of a, overlay to under this it's creating a directory with uh, container ID and here it's creating some kind of volume type of thing and okay. this is going and mounting inside the container as a slash so where is this where lib docker available where is available inside the slash file system only okay okay so here in the Linux operating system where is where where is not a separate file system where is available inside the slash yes so your virtual machine slash is mounting inside the container so same slash is mounting if you create 100 containers for 100 containers it is going to create uh, this path and it will be mounted inside the container okay so okay let me show you so when you don't want to speak guys please go on mute when you want to speak at the time unmute yourself okay. so this is a container and this is a virtual machine and uh, here you have in the linux the slash root file system which is an 8 gb and uh, we don't have apart from this any other file system so whenever you install docker it will be the volumes gets created under this one okay overlay 2 and the container ID and then it will create some directory. So this is going to be mounted inside the container as an slash operate slash. Okay, acting like a slash. So whatever the size of this Docker host, it is going to show the same over here and the same will be applied to all the containers. So whenever I create another container overlay to the new container ID and it will create a directory and that will also will be mounted here the second one will be mounted here the third one will be mounted here so all this will be creating under where is where where is under the slash only because this is not separate file system so that's why this slash file system is showing as a file system here let's say this container filled up uh, copied somewhere from where and uh, it's downloaded some 5 GB of uh, data then obviously this file system is going to become full. So when this is going to be full, then this container cannot able to generate any data because this is already full. So it cannot able to generate any data because here also this is mounted. Here also this is mounted. This is like a NFS share. Okay. So in this location, if your Docker host is full, then your containers cannot generate any data because whatever the file system it is using, it is from this main docker machine the docker host okay slash so this slash is getting mounted in all the containers got gotcha. you yep thank you so 5 gb is yeah, 5 gb is initially seeing 5 gb 5 gb is available space the total size of this uh, volume is 8 gb among that 5 gb is free as of now so the same volume is getting mounted and acting like a slash inside the every container. Okay, here, okay. here, here. Okay, yeah, whoever takes first like a slash here. Yeah, if this guy is storing 1 GB, this guy is storing 1 GB, this guy is storing 1 GB, from this out of a free space 5 GB, 3 GB is full, remaining 2 GB is available. So, whichever country mm -hmm. is filling the data, end of the day, it is storing over here. Okay got you thank so this you. is now this is how it's happening as of now so now what i want to do uh, i want the data should be stored so for that purpose we want to 
create volumes okay so I mean, to create questions. volumes yeah uh, we can put it in this way right so antennas they are using the aws ec2 uh, ebs volumes right yes See, containers doesn't know whether it's EBS or whatever it may be. Whatever the Docker host is having the OS, the slash file system it is using. This can be VMware virtual machine or this can be your local laptop, anything, your Docker host. So it doesn't know whether it's an EBS volume or uh, Azure disk or maybe sand storage disk. It doesn't know. It is taking the base OS slash file system. And in our scenario, that slash file system of this docker host is using by the aws storage ebs storage okay okay so you think case you know, like the volume you know like it is i'm installing something and it is full sorry okay so how i mean so if i want uh, my volume okay my host volume okay mm. so if it is full mm. How does hmm. this containers I mean, to where they look for volume there? So if I want to run a new container, then you need so to extend this one. Operate. The slash, the slash you need to extend. If the slash okay. is full, then when you create new container, it cannot able to store the data. So you need to extend this slash so that if this is having enough space, then only containers gets created and uh, it can store some data and it can delete it also. See. So if the storing the data is not important, but if the application container cannot able to generate the data, then application will not function properly. So if it want to function properly, there should be enough space in the container, whether storing or not storing that is secondary, but to run that application functional, for example, if your C drive doesn't have space, then you cannot able to access the websites or you cannot able to browse anything because it is going to store some temporary files inside the temporary location. So if that space is not available, you cannot be able to access the websites. Same way here, if the contrast doesn't have enough space, then it cannot be able to start the application. Application will not run. So in that scenario, you need to increase this one. But if the content gets deleted, the application data will also get deleted. That is secondary. But to function properly, the application it should have enough space. OK, so here. The Docker volumes. Um, we have storage drivers inside this Docker volumes also same like network drivers. We have uh, storage drivers also available. So as I was talking about um, Docker volumes. Um, so we have two types of volumes named volumes and uh, bind volumes. Okay, so what we are going to do we are going to create a volume and we will assign that volume to the container so that even though container got deleted if the container got deleted, but still the data will be available inside your Docker host. just now we tested if the container got deleted what of the file i created inside the container got also deleted okay but now if i created a volume the data will be stored inside that volume so even though container got deleted the new container again we can give it the uh, this volume and it can use that volume to get the data so that is the advantage of volumes like um, in the traditional data center whoever from the linux or windows background or maybe from the storage background for our virtual machines or maybe for our physical servers let's say if it is a physical server storage team is going to assign storage okay scuzzy storage to the physical boxes so even though physical box is completely damaged or os is corrupted okay but still we can get the data from the storage okay because logically storage team is assigning storage to the physical servers so everything is getting stored inside the storage not in the physical server because physical server contains internally 100 gb or 200 gb that we use it for the os purpose but externally we are giving storage through the fiber cables logically will assign okay so that if something happens the data will be inside the storage okay so same way here 
the docker host we are creating volumes from the docker host from the docker host we are going to give it to the container so container got deleted still we can able to access the data so as of now we'll discuss the storage drivers in docker so tomorrow we'll see complete practical about this storage okay so this is a overlay to and um, auto fs device mapper loopback lpm and uh, so these are the recommendations okay <clears throat> the storage drivers so by default we'll use overlay 2 so overlay storage driver is deprecated in docker engine means now no one is using this overlay it's deprecated so the latest is overlay 2 okay so like um, in linux operating system we'll have a file systems right uh, ext3 ext4 xfs the logical volume manager to create the volumes the same way here also to create storage so we have a storage drivers like overlay 2 and uh, back end if you see okay these are things so supported back end file systems if you see overlay 2 means xfs and ext4 file system in the linux and aufs means again xfs ext4 again same file systems it is using os level file system these are okay so vfs means any file system so these are the storage drivers so by default it is going to use uh, overlay 2 so tomorrow i will show you how to create volumes this named volumes and how to attach it and how to store the data and i'll try to delete one container and uh, create new container and i'll attach the old volume to the new container to see the data and uh, how to attach a single volume to multiple containers like a nfs drive so all these things tomorrow we'll discuss so yesterday we discussed about uh, docker networking and today we are going to talk about uh, docker volumes Okay, so as discussed yesterday, the Docker volumes, the purpose of the Docker volumes is to store the data. So whatever the applications are stateful applications which need to store the data, then we need to create a volumes and uh, we need to attach the volumes to the containers so that the data can be stored. Okay, so again, even if the container is deleted, then we can attach those volumes to the new container so that it can able to get its own data that is the major reason we need to create docker volumes so the containers which is not required data then we don't need to provide any volumes so containers will be get created and uh, it will get deleted automatically so in this scenario now we'll see how to create uh, volumes and uh, how to attach it to the containers and uh, we'll delete the containers and we'll see if we add new container how it will work okay so now we can create volumes in two ways first we can create volume and at the time of creating container we can attach the created volume or else during the creation of container itself we can create the volume so both ways we can do so first we'll see during the container creation will create the volumes so before that we can just check with docker volume ls so as of now we don't have any volumes are available and this is a driver name already we discussed the driver names yesterday the overlay to overlay v vfs so these are the drivers in the docker <coughs> and we don't see any volumes as of now so now uh, <coughs> docker so i don't see any containers docker run if an it if an if a name let's say so give some name to your container 
hyphen v slash data nginx bin bash so here the volume will be created hyphen v means volume it will create a volume and this slash data is going to be mounted inside the container okay the volume will be mounted inside the container the slash data in your organization if whatever the requirement whatever is the mount point for example basically the application or database would like to store the data so whatever they are expecting the mount path so that mount path directory structure you need to provide here as of now we don't have anything like that so we are giving just simply as a slash data so container has been created and volume will also will be created and if you check with df <coughs> and if you see here this is the data has been created and is mounted okay so if you create any data inside this uh, file system just i'm creating some files and come out of this container now i came out of that container and if i check docker volume ls so now you can see this is one of the volume which created again it's assigned uh, a shark out to the volume and uh, this is a driver and now um, find so from in the docker host it is going to store these files docker inspect i did not create with file one okay i did not create it with file one that's why it is not showing inspect and the volume name so we can just check so okay if you see here this is a location inside your docker host okay and uh, th this is where it is mounted and if you go and see here you can find the data so these are the files which are created right so now in the docker host it is created a volumes if you see docker volumes and this is a uh, directory structure and this is a directory and inside that we can able to see the files now what i'm going to do i'm going to delete the container and we'll see whether these files will be available or not okay so now i'm going to delete this container docker rm f So still I can see the data even though after deleting the container you see still we can able to see so there is no such container is available now so now let's say if I want to create a new container and for that container I want to attach this volume so how can we attach that so docker run if an IT say uh, if I have a name, give some name, hyphen V, and whatever the volume name it was showing, copy this volume name and uh, give. You can give any mount point inside the new counter which you are creating. So let's say I'll give data one nginx batch okay i created a new container okay but i attached the old volume which was available with the old container and i mounted inside the container this data one so now if i check this is a data one and if i go inside this so 
so i can able to see those files so this volume you can attach to the container okay so there is a reason even though if the volumes get deleted sorry hunters gets deleted the volumes can be attached to the newly created container and uh, it can use the data which is inside that volume so not only in this way we can attach the same volume to multiple containers also okay and this data can be accessed by the multiple containers if you assign this volumes to the different containers still you can able to access it okay so let's say what i'll do i'll create one more container so i'll just change few things in the previous command okay i think i'm inside the container now let me come out so here one point i'll give data to and uh, the name i'll give different name something else so this is the name of the new container and the same volume i'm attaching to the new container so now if you check it is mounted on data 2 and you can able to see the same files so here we created two containers so two containers contains the same volume as a shared volume and uh, both the containers can able to access it okay so this is how we can use these volumes but the problem here is uh, i don't want for example by looking into this docker volume ls by looking into this volume i don't know to which container this volume is belongs to so what i can do i can give a name to the volume so that we can easily identify by looking at the name that okay this volume is belongs to this specific container okay so we can recognize easily okay this volume belongs to this containers so we call it as a named volumes so now what we can do docker run iphone it open if a name give any name iphone v uh, first underscore container underscore wall okay just i'm just giving as a uh, first container okay so you can give any name based upon the application whatever the container belongs to you can give that name so i'm giving this name and uh, inside that i'm going to mount it give the image name and the bash okay it's created now if you see same so it is created the volume has been created and if you come out of that container and if you check docker volume ls so now you can see the volume name is first underscore container underscore volume okay so this way we can create a volume by giving the name instead of automatically assigning it some name with a sha code so we can give a name to the volume and if you check docker inspect and this volume name so you can see this is the location where live docker and volumes under this this is the name of this uh, volume and this is the data here the content will be stored whatever the data is going to be stored it is going to be stored here okay so this way we can create I means at the time of creating containers directly we can give the volume or else before also we can able to create before creating the container also we can create the volumes let's say docker volume 
create second underscore container underscore wall so this way also we can create it's created now it's created another container so this the uh, another volume so this volume we can give it to any of the containers okay so at the time of creating container directly we can use it like docker run hyphen it hyphen hyphen name give a name hyphen v and this is a name volume and where you want to mount shell it's mounted and uh, see this is mounted inside this container okay so this is how we create named volumes these are called as a named volumes so uh, by default all will get created under the where okay so varlib docker so you cannot change the directory of this because backend in the docker host so it is getting created inside the varlib docker so if this is a docker host so wherever we install docker we call it as an docker host and we are creating containers inside this machine so whenever we are creating volumes okay so here it will be slash data and uh, inside that container uh, if it is slash data then here in the docker host it will be this way these are the volumes which are creating under the docker host so these volumes are going to be mounted inside the container with the slash data what are the names we are giving so it is taking this location okay where lib docker location so you cannot change this one so you need to make sure that the size of this uh, uh, where means should be always enough space is available just a second guys i'll be back in a minute okay so this is how we create uh, named volumes okay so we have another concept called uh, bind mounts okay so what is bind mounts here we are creating volumes empty volumes it is going to create empty volumes and that yep uh, so uh, you created uh, uh, volume okay so 
by default uh, we will not be having uh, any volumes when we create a container right yes okay so i mean how does it you know like decide how much uh, space is available for this volume uh, let's say you know like uh, you created one volume so it is showing mm. 2.5 gb something so who decides that how mm. it is decided the other question is mm. how do we know you know like which mount points are available so to which point we should mount uh, this volume how do we decide that how do we know which mount point is available i mean where to mount this volume so how do we decide that I did not get your question. Can you please come again? Okay. First question is, uh, so, uh, I mean, how how the storage yeah, is allocated for this volume? First question is understood. Yes. The second one. The second one, so, uh, 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 underscore data, that is a mount point, okay? So, you have mounted this mm. volume to that mount point, okay? Mm. Right. So, I mean, how do we figure out, I mean, which mount points are available? Which mount points are available means, see, we want a mount point because why we are creating volumes to store the data. So where you want to store the data and who owns the data, either database or either application teams, not the DevOps guys, right? So they are going to give us, this is our mount point where the data is going to be stored. So they will give that name like whether it may be uh, multiple directories like slash data slash something uh, app something like that or maybe slash oracle slash apps something like that they'll have the path where data is going to be generated from the application level or maybe from the um, what is it database level so that name they will give to us so that is going to we provide at the time of creating content so the volume is going to be mounted on that path, whatever the path we are giving. It's a directory, just a directory where we want to mount the volume. So in real time, that directory is going to be given by the application guys or maybe database guys because they know that where their if the application is started, that application might be configured with some directory structure to store the data. So the same name they are going to give it to us. And that name will put it here to create and configure it. That's it. And second thing about the size, you are not specifying any size here at the time of creating volume. So that's why the, by default is taking the Docker host. The Docker host, uh, just a second, disconnected. The slash uh, file system, it is mounting directly the complete file system, it is getting mounted. So if you see in your Docker host, this is the this is a default slash file system. And uh, whenever you go to any container, so it is directly creating this uh, under this varlib uh, Docker and uh, volumes. So that is going to be allocated to that container with a slash only directly. So if you want to specify the size, you can specify the time of creating volume itself. So let's say if I'm Docker. So if you see here, this is a slash file system of your Docker host. So directly, we did not specify the uh, size. So directly it is taking this complete uh, slash as a file system, okay? So it is going to have this much of free space now. So this container can be able to use. Same way, if you create multiple volumes, for every volume it is taking this slash and because it's creating a directory and it is mounting it on that specific container. So if you want to specify the size, then you can specify the size at the time of creating container. Sorry, creating a volume. So it will be like a Docker 
volume create third underscore Device name missing required action. Okay. So if an FM Mm hmm. What is the type here? Driver is the type. So let me check why it is not able to create. So type is none, we need to give this to be try. So we're not getting proper information. 
so basically we should give this uh, with the size option okay so that uh, we can limit our size but now maybe in this version maybe expecting some other options to be added inside this docker volume create driver okay so maybe this is not allowed for the driver local so we need to have different driver uh, because what are the drivers it is using storage drivers those drivers may not allow to have the size so if you see here this guy is using convoy as a driver and he downloaded it from the some web page okay so i'll check this and i'll let you know so maybe it, it is not possible with the uh, the default drivers which are available from the docker maybe we need to have the separate uh, drivers should be available so i'll check and i'll update you on this okay so that way you can uh, have volumes can be created with a specific size if you don't want because uh, if the containers because it's like a disco quota kind of thing because containers if you are using this complete uh, slash of your uh, docker host if any of the containers is continuously filling the data then it is going to fill up the docker host if the docker host slash is filled up with everything then all the containers which are running inside that uh, container uh, inside that host is not going to work properly so always that's why it should not be uh, filled up with 100% so we can uh, give the limitations like whenever they create the docker volumes we can give the limitations with some specifications okay whether it's need uh, how much space it is required based on that we can allocate it to it so i will check that and i'll update you tomorrow okay about that uh, how much whether it's possible to give the size for the storage drivers which are available default by default Okay. Um, one quick question, uh, Pravin. Like, uh, yeah. while container is running, at that point, uh, can we mount uh, these uh, volumes which were created before? Is that possible? Contents were running means already it started. Yes. No, as I said yesterday, you cannot modify anything to the existing container. So you can create a new container and you can delete it the old one okay 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 you cannot do any modifications to the existing container okay and uh, volumes can be decreased and increased is this possible after creation of volume so that is what just now i said like whenever we are creating just volumes automatically it is taking the default size of the uh, slash file system of docker host uh -huh. we are not specified the size so yeah, just now what we tried size. is like uh, uh, we are creating a volume with a specific amount, right? So a specific. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, what I'm asking is after creation of volume, if hmm. uh, you know application people were asking for uh, some more GB, so at that point hmm. uh, can we increase the size of the volume? The existing volume. Yes. The existing yes. volume we want to increase. Uh -huh. so I never tried. I never tried because we never used the individual Docker uh, increasing the uh, what we say uh, Docker size, the volume size. Okay, because backend we use uh, Kubernetes, so there we are going to use the resources orchestration. So we don't run individually Docker on any platform to run the applications. Okay, because okay. so from using no Kubernetes features. it can be possible. Yes, it will be possible. Okay. Okay. So that's why we don't focus uh, independent uh, topics of uh, like a Docker only because we don't create volumes and uh, and Docker is not going to run as a standalone applications because uh, whenever something happens to the Docker host, the complete uh, contents will be down. So compulsory, we need either any of the orchestration tool in the backend which will manage all these things like volumes or maybe CPU resources or maybe um auto scaling load balancing everything lot of other features orchestration tool will manage it so that's why okay. we'll run the docker along with the orchestration tool okay so okay. 
Yeah, Can you. we mount multiple volumes to a single container? Multiple volumes. Yes, yes. Yeah, we'll try. I never tried that. So Docker run hyphen it hyphen hyphen name hyphen v. I think we can mount it uh, first. Before that, let me take the names Docker volume ls so docker run hyphen it hyphen hyphen name and then hyphen v and uh, this is the one slash data one hyphen v data two nginx bash Yep, it's created. But it's mounted only one volume. It's not mounted the second volume. It did not give any error, but uh, it did not mount the second volume. Only one volume it created. Okay, so even though it is not giving any error, it's not mounting two volumes okay so maybe back end it is both the volumes are taking from the slash maybe that is the reason it is not mounted the both the volumes so only single volume is mounted So now we talk about uh, bind volumes. Okay, so bind mounts we can say. So the advantage of the bind mounts is, uh, see here, whenever we are creating volumes, specifically it is creating volumes under this location, where live Docker volumes, and uh, what are the name you are giving to a volume, it is creating, it's an empty directory. And this empty volume we are attaching to the container and uh, application can store. So bound minds are like a, a NAS share or NFS share. Like those who have idea about NFS share will have uh, NFS server and we'll create a share here in the, some directory, okay? So this directory we are going to share across uh, multiple NFS clients, which wherever you want this content should be available. So we are going to mount it by using mount type and TNFS, like how we will mount it so that we can able to access the data, whatever is inside this path, it can be accessible across these machines. So same way here, bind mounts also in the same way from the Docker host, you can create anywhere. Okay, maybe you created some file system. Let's say this is an AWS machine and you allocated some 30 GB volume now and with that volume internally you mounted this 30 gb to some file system okay some file system you mounted so under this you can create a directory and uh, that can be shared as a bind mounts to your containers okay so here there is no dependency of the directory structure here you can create anywhere any uh, under this docker host on any of the volume you can create a directory and that directory you can share it to your uh containers okay so whatever the data if you want to share it from your docker host to your container then we should use the bind mounts okay so for that first of all what i need to do i am going to create a directory uh, let's say so this is the name i am creating and in, uh, inside this what I'll do I'll I'll create a file okay index.html file so just I write something inside this
Okay. Now, before I use bind uh, bind to any of the container, whenever we create any nginx con uh, container, so it is getting some welcome page, right? So let me Docker run iphone it nginx. Okay, so I created nginx container and uh, I'll go to the cd usr share and uh, nginx inside this we have a directory called html and there we can see this uh, web page index.html and this is the page that's why we can able to access it right so this is a content which is able to access when we are accessing nginx web page and this is some other file okay now whatever the file i created inside this location okay so here under this uh, docker host i created a directory called nginx underscore home and here i created index.html so i want this index.html should be used for this nginx container so it should not use whatever is is inside that default nginx so i want to use whatever i created here just to uh, show the an example how we can share the data from our docker host to the container so this index.html should be placed under uh, this location usr so usr share nginx uh, html uh, it should be copied not copied it should be available over here okay so for that we are sharing this to this location under this one usr slash usr share uh, nginx html so it should be available here okay so for that we are going to create a bind mount and that bind mount i am going to use this as a source and this will be the destination okay let's see how it is going to work so for that i am going to create a new container now docker run iphone an it and then hyphen f name nginx this is the name I'm giving and uh, hyphen V slash root slash nginx. Where did I create that uh, directory? Oh, I think I've entered the container. Okay. So docker run hyphen it hyphen f name nginx score bound and uh, iphone v slash root nginx so this is a path because inside that file is available and uh, then where you want to mount it slash usr slash share slash nginx slash html okay so this is the location and uh, nginx bash this is the image and uh, this is the shell so here inside this this location we are mounting because in the nginx this is the location where it contains index.html so whatever the index.html is available here now that will be available over here now it's created and uh, if you go and look into this path usr share nginx html you can see this file and if you open this file this is my file okay so now you can able to see this is my file so how it got it got it from this volume it got it from mounted from this volume and whatever the if if this location contains multiple files all those files will be available here but I created only single file and that file is available over here now. Okay, inside the Nginx. So let me check. Nginx status. 
it is in failed state start and now let me copy the IP address okay we did not do port forwarding so it is not going to be accessed right we did not do port forwarding so that's the reason we cannot able to access so let me give uh, the port forwarding also iphone p 8080 80 okay the name is already available okay now etc init.t and uh, nginx started and now let me try So this is the web page we are able to access. So this way, just an example like we can um, share whatever we want from our Docker host to the containers. In the named volumes, we are not sharing. We are just creating empty directory, empty volume, and we are sharing. We are giving it to the containers, and they are the application will generate the data and it will store. And here, if you want to share any data from your Docker host to your uh, containers then you can give it and the same thing you can give it to uh, multiple containers also okay so if you want the same thing will be available for different containers now i'll give another port 881 to the different container and i'll give bound to so it is created etc init.t nginx start now i'll try to access with 8081 it is another different container so it is also able to accessible so like this you can assign you can attach this bind mounts to the multiple containers okay so this is the purpose of uh, bind mounts any doubts Can you show me the command ones? So is this a uh, pretty quick question is this something like EFS on AWS? Yeah, I said uh, instead of EFS we can take as an example of NFS NFS might be aware by most of the people so okay. EFS is uh, and only those who are aware about uh, AWS only they yeah. might know. Yeah. Network so price. EFS. Okay. Yep. Okay, got you. Thank you. So you can share the data among multiple containers if it is expecting something inside the container. So what are the content we change in uh, root slash uh, nginx home? It will be reflected mm. in all the containers, right? What wherever we mounted uh, this mount. Bend yes. Volume. Yes. Okay. okay. So, if you want to share any data to the containers whenever it started, if it is like some application is expecting some configurations or something, so then we can uh, instead of at the time of available in the container, we, we can pass it through in this way so that it can get its data. Okay, to start that application or whatever it may be. Okay. okay so this is about the docker volumes mostly if i get time today if i don't have any work in office then uh, like i'm going to search about that size maybe i think um, it is expecting a different uh, uh, driver to provide the size maybe default drivers doesn't provide that size so i will check and i'll get back to you so tomorrow we talk about uh, the docker file 
okay so which is very very important because till now whatever we discussed we were using the images of the default images which are providing by the docker hub whether it may be ubuntu CentOS, nginx and we are creating containers but in real time um, if you want to create an image okay so the for the application we should create an image so how we are going to create an image so with the help of docker file only we are going to create an images in the real time so it's very very important to understand the docker file to create image because what are the application is required these are like all our uh, created images we are using as of now the nginx okay so in case if you want to configure nginx in your organization then we we'll use this image but for your microservices java applications or any applications if you want to create an image then you are going to use the docker file to create the image so what are the things it is required what are the software it should be available because these images are created by someone else okay so the same way and uh, let me see whether it's available Sometimes they'll provide the docker files of the images which we are using from the docker hub also how it got created that uh, image Okay We'll see whether it's available Okay, if you see here uh, for this specific version, this is the Docker file they created. So they installed respective packages, creating user accounts, lot of things are involved by using this Docker file that the image is getting created. So in real time also, we need to create uh, images for our application. Okay, so where file gets created. Okay. So where file gets created means if it is Java application where or jar file gets created and it will store in the Nexus But how we can create image from that? So what are the things are required? What are the specific uh, softwares are dependent? Maybe that to run that application it is expecting some softwares So how you are going to install them inside the image all these things you are going to write a docker file Which is very very important so that we'll discuss tomorrow. Okay, so if you have any doubts in today's session Go ahead and ask or else we'll wind up this session for today okay so today we talk about uh, docker file okay before that let me power on the docker machine Okay, so till now when we were practicing docker and we uh, created a lot of containers and uh, we were using the default images which are providing by the docker from the docker hub repository, right? Whether it can be Ubuntu or whether it can be CentOS or uh, Nginx Like different uh, images we were using and we were creating containers to practice the uh, container how to create the content but but in real time Okay, when we talk about uh, CICD, right? So, what is going to happen? Like, whenever, assume if it is in any kind of application, let's take uh, uh, Java microservices. So, if the developers are writing the code and uh, they have multiple microservices, and uh, <clears throat> for each microservice in the GitHub or Bitbucket, Whatever it may be in the source code management, they'll have separate repository for that. Okay, so the code is contains over there, and the developers will write the code and they will do the modifications to that code. 
and uh, that is going to be whenever its code check-in happens it is going to trigger a build job so what it is going to do it is going to create an artifact it will complete the validation and it will complete it will create a package and it will create an artifact of that uh, java code and uh, if it is a var or jar whatever it may be it, it will be created so once it is created basically uh, if you don't talk about the uh, docker if you're talking about the virtual environment then this var file is going to be stored inside the nexus repository and then parallel we are going to deploy it into the environment okay whether it can be your own data center or it can be any of the cloud whether it's aws azure or gcp so it is going to be deployed on a virtual machines this var file maybe by taking if it is a web application then our application server need any tomcat or jboss or any middleware applications then we can deploy this application so that it can be accessible this is how we do it on the uh, virtual machines but when it comes to the container so here we don't have the container ready here okay the container should be created at the time of deployment so before that what is going to happen in the ci job so in the ci job so the steps if you are writing okay the pipeline scripts so the first will be git clone and then it will be uh, build is going to happen like maven build if it is java application maven build is going to be there so maven commands will be executed and uh, the code will be completed with the uh, test uh, package install and create an artifacts right and then it will create a docker image and then the docker image will be pushed to artifact tree okay whether it can be nexus or jfrog or as i said it can be any cloud artifactories like KCR, GCR, ECR. Okay, so this things is going to happen in the CI job, and then these are belongs to CI job. After that, the CD job will be deployment. Means whatever this image is going to be stored over here, and that image should be deployed okay so if you are using uh, what kind of orchestration tool okay as of now we are not discussing orchestration assume if it is at only uh, virtual machines or instances then it should go and deploy that image and it should create a container over here okay that will be part of cd job so ci job will be part of this one so now in real time it can be any application as node.js applications or any kind of java applications or any applications maybe php application so it should be uh, if the php application is there then uh, it doesn't require any build okay php and python doesn't require any build whatever is coded directly we can go and execute that so this will be skipped build is skipped so docker image will be created and pushed to artifactory now how this docker image will be created how application because as a devops engineer we are the responsible to create the docker images okay developers will write the code but nowadays even developers also involving inside the devops source they are also because in my previous project their developers were showing more enthusiasm to work as a devops engineer okay so that is very dangerous okay, because uh, if developers can able to do and if they are willing to do then uh, they are stealing our job okay if developer write the code and uh, he will create the docker file and he will create this virtual environment and he can deploy if everything he is going to do then there is no requirement of devops engineer right so they can also do easily this work if uh, he can write the code it doesn't matter to write just a docker file and to build the environment right so for, as a devops engineer it's our responsibility to create this image how to create this image how to create this job ci job so we create uh, either pipeline or maybe normal job also we can configure but nowadays everyone is preferring pipeline jobs so in that how this step is going to be written docker image so docker image is going to create with the help of docker file so in the docker file we'll define the instructions okay so we'll give syntax so that it will create the docker image and that docker image is going to be pushed because till now we were using 
existing docker images someone like docker hub is created those images and they are giving to us and we were using that but in our organization we don't use those images we need to create the images of our own application and we should write the docker file and uh, to create the images so now we are going to talk about what is docker file how it looks like and how we can give the uh, argument syntaxes to create the images okay So if we go to the Docker uh, docs to take the reference of uh, Docker file. So Docker can build images automatically by reading the instructions from a Docker file. So what are the instructions we are provided in the Docker file and it, by taking all that instructions, it will create an image. <coughs> a Docker file is a text document that contains all the commands a user could call on the command line to assemble an image. So using docker build command we are going to create the image with the docker file so users can create an automated build that executes several command line instructions in succession so we can use docker build command by uh, here dot means in the present working directory the docker file should be there and one thing we need to remember here is the file name should be docker file only if you, it contains what are the instructions you are writing you cannot give any other name or any other extension to this file it should be same like this one d uppercase and remain docker file it should be same okay so then only it will create an image with this file so we should use docker build dot means this docker file should be in that present working directory then what are the instructions we provide inside that it will create an image based on that instructions okay so here when we are uh, creating this so it is going to create a layers so whatever the steps you are defined over there so if you see these are step one means from step two maintainer step three step four so these are the steps it, whatever how many steps you are going to define it will give you those many steps when you create an image and each step is a layer if you see this is one sha code and this is another sha code each step is a one layer image layer okay so how many steps you define those many image layers will be created only we discussed image layers at the time of uh, docker images when we discussed right so here see these are the some um, instructions we use okay we have very less instructions but how effectively uh, we use them it depends upon us the first one is from okay so from means the from instruction initializes a new build stage and sets the base image for subsequent instructions so when we are writing an um, docker file the first one will be from so from means when you are creating an image for what purpose you are creating image for your application it's like for example you have a one virtual machine or one physical machine to install an application so first thing what you are going to do you are going to install the operating system right on that operating system you will install the recommended applications and uh, necessary dependencies libraries you are going to install one by one but first of all you required on your virtual machine or on your physical machine you need an operating system so how you choose operating system again it depends that application uh, compatibility uh, which operating system whoever developed that application so while developing that which flavor they use so which one is uh, good for that application based on that we'll choose whether it's CentOS or whether it's Arc Linux or maybe uh, Ubuntu it depends okay so here docker is also giving us some base images okay so like um, uh, Alfine and um, 
like CentOS, Ubuntu, and uh, Open JDK, Alpen Open JDK. In, okay. Apart from this, again, lot of other images also they will provide. So it's up to us which one is suitable for our environment for our applications. Okay. So uh, I'll take one example. Mm. Open JDK image. Okay, if you take this Open JDK. Mm -hmm. Any image if you take this open JDK image, okay, so uh, In one of my project I was using this open JDK image, okay, why we are using this image because see Always preferable for my application. It's in Java microservice. So for that obviously that microservice need to run uh, JDK open JDK for example, if we want to install Jenkins on a virtual machine Prerequisite is Java Java 1.8 is required then only Jenkins will work properly because it's a J Java application even Maven even Nexus also Java application. So without installing Java in your that machine Nexus or Jenkins or uh, Maven will not work. Okay, so same way if you are working on a Java application then uh, that application needs Java so what we are going to do for example i will write from and um, let's say centos okay means the centos base image will it will take and then the next command i am going to use run run m install java 1.8 something like this okay my fun y so it will install java okay and then the remaining steps to create our uh, um we'll write the steps to build the image for our application instead of this one of the image is giving us along with the operating system a java okay so why i need to add one more step so you can reduce here the step okay installing the image uh, installing the java so that's why we use this open jdk which contains operating system and along with that operating system we are going to get the Java also. So these are called some base images. So you are reducing one layer here. Okay, so that's why we use open JDK. So like that it depends upon how you want okay for your application. So Alphan. So in interview sometimes they'll ask you among these Docker images which image contains very uh, smaller size. So Alphan is a very smaller lighter weight uh, image we have in the Linux. Okay over here So sometimes if you want your image size should be very less so we use Alphan and inside that we are going to uh, Use the commands to install some other packages so that our application will be available. Okay So you can take any of these base images apart from this lot of their uh, images will be there so again here when you are using these names if you don't give beside this uh, image name then you are telling that use the latest one okay so we are telling to use the latest one okay so uh, Okay, so we are using the latest one if you want to use specific version then you can use specific version also let's say uh, Node docker image 
So this is Node Docker image for Node.js. Okay, any Node.js application we want to use the Node. Uh, the name image name itself uh, Node. Okay, so it contains uh, if you see these many tags are available. So which tag you want to use if any specific tag only you want to use so you can use let's say if this is a 14 hyphen alpha and 3 dot 10 tag you want to use then uh, you should give in your uh, docker file from node and then uh, this is a alpha 3 dot 10 this way we need to give what are the tag we want to use so whichever image we want to use if we want to use specific version then uh, specific tag then we should use that already we discussed about the tag so lot of change contains one uh, tag maybe some changes has been done so that's why we have multiple tabs if you are recommended to use specific tag then we can use this tag or else if you're not giving any tag means it will pick up the latest one and uh, if you see how this image has been created again it was taking the alpha okay so i am going to create uh, this docker file by using this one okay node and this is a tag and then from this if i am going to create an image so it will be like for example uh, alpha 3.0 with this it created node alpine 3.1 and like uh, after creating this docker file when i built an image i will use some name let's say um, while creating this from this name i have actually one docker file for this one like this one not this one node.js okay so here if i give from node and then alpine 3.10 if i give this way by giving some instructions we'll discuss about them later on and i'm going to create an image with this one like let me show you the command docker build iphone t uh, node.js app okay and like this if i give means docker file so what it's going to do it's going to create an image node js app from where it got created from using uh, node alpine 3.0 image and how it got created alpine 3.1 okay here if you see it got created from here so these are called as a base images so initially this was created from this image and we are using this image to create our own application by using some instructions so how are my application content is there that will be available inside this location and uh, this is to start the application okay so like this using one image again we can create another images after creating this image then maybe in future uh, I can use this as a base image like uh, in from I can use this one and then I can use some more instructions over here again I can create an image so this way we can keep on create okay so when I want to create some this node.js application so I am using node as an image and I'm using this version okay like tag so if you go to this talk so how it got created it was also created by using this uh, some instructions okay so these are base images so right now we are talking about the base images so here in real time when you are creating a docker file first of all you need to work with the developers okay to check what application you are working and uh, which image is suitable for them what are the prerequisites okay so these are some uh, basic uh, base images we use if you want to do it from the scratch or else if you want to uh, use some other images again depend upon the application then you should use those images 
okay this is the concept of from and uh, the next one is hmm run okay so run command what it will do it will execute any linux commands okay so here when we are writing the docker file so as of now forget about this one run can execute any command any linux command if i check in the docker file here if you see run in the run command it is executing um, this commands okay so it's creating one user and uh, maybe that user is uh, adding into a group and then um, this is apk as a package manager like uh, yum okay for uh, alpha and operating system and it's executing these many commands and it's also executing in a script kind of thing and everything it's executing under a single run okay so run will execute any command so it, which is preparing your image with more options like if you see here this is an alpha image but inside this it's creating making ready for your node uh, to run your node.js application it's creating a node image and finally if you see the cmd node is there and uh, these many commands it is executing and it's preparing this machine as a to run as a node.js application okay and then they are making it as a name as a node okay so it is installing if you see python make command linux headers libraries okay gcc g plus plus all these packages they are getting created so whatever the steps we do manually it's like a script it is executing inside this docker file by using the run it's very simple when you are if for example till now your applications are not uh, dockerized assume they were running on the uh, virtual machines so first time you got opportunity to create a docker file because it's from application level they converted into its uh, microservices now for each microservice you need to write a docker file because how you will do you need to sit with the developer and how the functionality will be there and you need to same how we write a script first you will do manual steps and that manual steps you convert into the script the same way how this application will run on a virtual machine what are the steps are involved what are the prerequisites we install everything those things you will convert inside to a docker file that's it it is very simple even this is not a scripting also just you will define for example uh, you want to create a jenkins uh, server so what you'll do first you'll install uh, java then you'll install if it is java application then you need to install maven and you need to install git right because it will do git clone so what are the prerequisites manually you will do all these things and then you will install jenkins the same way that you will define inside this run command okay install java install or better to take open jdk so you don't need to install uh, java and then install uh, maven so same way here also you need to define how that application will work those things will be defined over here okay prerequisites okay changing of any permissions of files to function properly after that we'll create an image and we'll execute this image and if it is not working again we'll see there is where it is went wrong and again we can come back and we can modify these docker files okay that's how we'll write so you can take the reference of any um, default uh, images docker files okay we have nginx docker files and node.js what are the images they are providing so easily you can understand how we can write the docker file okay so one thing we need to remember is here whenever we are writing a docker file so we should not give multiple run commands here if you observe here why they are using only single run command and in this run only they are added multiple commands to execute see this is one command this is one con one command for every command they gave this ampersand and a backslash okay why because here very important is uh, if you are giving uh, multiple run commands also it will work not a problem but every run command is going to have a separate layer image layer so if you are 
as a devops engineer you need to make sure that your image should be more smaller like you should make it as a smaller image so and you should not have multiple layers so if you make these many layers if you make run option for all this command then these many layers it is going to be created so if it is created these many layers your image will become big and to download whenever you do docker pull command it will take a lot of time to cross check each and every layer to pull that image so that's why whenever you do docker push or docker pull so we recommend use only one run command and maximum one or two mention all the um, commands inside the single uh, run command only by using ampersand and this backslash so you can execute multiple commands in a single run okay so run command will <coughs> execute all the linux commands so that is the purpose of run command and uh, next will be there copy command okay so let me go here after run cmd is there actually basically it will be copy will be there so we can use copy so copy what it can do it can copy from your docker host to your uh, container whatever you here if you see we are getting a directory inside the container and whatever you want to copy from your docker host to inside the container we can use copy command okay so any files you want to copy you can copy and we have another option called add also okay so add also is going to do copy but the difference is add where is add here so add what it will do uh, instruction copies new file directories or remote files urls from the source and adds them to the file system of the image so add speciality is if anything should be copied from the remote url from any website basically we use uh, uh, in the linux we use duplicate command and the url right to download it from the website directly it will be downloaded into your local machine same way add if you give any url http url then that file will be downloaded inside the container okay so that's why we can use add and another syntax is expose so in cont in application in your java application application guys define which port to run that to test it so if they are using 8080 port inside the container then we should use we should expose that okay otherwise if you don't expose that we cannot able to access the application okay so we should expose that port whatever the application is using inside that whatever the developers define inside that application that application port should be exposed otherwise after creating image what we'll do we uh, we use docker run iphone it and then iphone p okay if inside also it's 8080 then we use 8080 because inside the application it's 8080 then we use 8080 and then if we use a image then it's not going to be accessible from the external world because from internal you are not exposing that port so even if i give this it will not work so it should be exposed so that is port expose and uh, this is environment variables it's not mandatory these are optional if you want you can give for uh, environment variables or else you can ignore it depends okay and uh, apart from this um, add copy expose uh, and the maintainer is see they are selling is deprecated no need to give the maintainer inside the docker file basically we can give maintainer equal to who is created this docker file if i'm created 
so i can give my email id over there it's not mandatory sometimes if you want you can give that okay so labels it's like a tax you can give so this is also not mandatory the main important um, here is uh, from env run okay copy any data expose and final one is entry point okay so here cmd and entry point first we'll discuss about cmd so what cmd will do so cmd what it can do so cmd will whatever the command you are going to provide in the cmd that will be going to executed and going to create a container after creating the country it will be executed as a runtime okay so what are the command you give for example uh, you have an application how that application will start for example we installed a service in the linux operating system how will start it uh, system ctl enable that service name or in the previous version service service name start then it will start same way java application also should be started any node.js application also should be started start stop will be there right so those kind of uh, commands will be defined inside this cmd okay so when container is created then during the runtime that application will be started okay so that application will be started those kind of things will be defined inside the cmd but what is the difference between cmd and entry point both are same both are for same purpose only the difference is uh, in cmd you can overwrite the entry uh, like what are the entry point you have given inside the cmd that can be overwritten during the creation of container but in entry point you cannot do that okay don't worry i'll show you the practical how we will do that but first of all we need to discuss uh, each and every arguments whatever we are using here the syntax that we need to understand okay so sometimes people use cmd or sometimes people use entry point so if you want to overwrite during the runtime creating the container then we use cmd if it is not required then we can use entry point also so that that application will be started so what i'm going to do i'll log into this um, uh, docker Raveen, i have a question yep uh, so what is the difference between this uh, run and cmd run and cmd run will execute at the time of creating image cmd will execute inside the container once the container gets created at that time it will execute okay when building the image run command will execute and what are the steps you define all these tasks will be completed when you are using these are the two different commands we are executing okay one is docker build command and another one is docker run command to create container from that image so run command will execute during this time and cmd command will execute during this time when you create a container with this image let's say docker and iphone it node.js app and bin bash so once the container gets created at that time the cmd command will execute and the application will be started and run command will execute what are the prerequisites you are giving over there creating user account creating a group and adding that user to the group or installing any package everything will be defined inside here the run command and you can use multiple run commands but you cannot use multiple cmd commands okay cmd you can use only one time even if you give multiple cmds here let's say if i give another cmd here so it is going to take only the latest one okay so it will take only this one it will not take this one only one cmd we can use it okay So there can be only, yeah. Can I use uh, CMD and entry point both in my Docker file? Yeah, you can use. And uh, what will execute? Like uh, CMD will execute or entry point will? Execute? CMD, if you give both, okay, means if you mention CMD and if you give entry point, it will take CMD only. 
so sometimes people will use uh, it will take the value from the cm like it will be like key pair value key value pair so in the cmd you will give the command and you will take the values from the entry point that way you can use but if you define both cmd and entry point it will take only cmd So there can be only one CMD instruction in a Docker file. If you list more than one CMD, then only the last CMD will take effect. Okay. So the main purpose of a CMD is to provide defaults for an executing container. So these defaults can include an executable or they can omit the executable, in which case you must specify an entry point instructions as well. So if you want to give that execution should be inside the entry point, then we can use it or else on the CMD also we can use it. Okay, so now let's try to so create some Docker files. Hmm? Which which is a better command to use CMD or entry point? As I said, if you are not interested to overwrite, then you can use entry point. In future, if you want to overwrite, okay, then you can use CMD. At the time of creating container, if the values are going to overwrite, you want to give some other values, then at that time you can give CMD. Okay, so in this page on the CMD command, so it is written as add default parameters to entry point. So what does it mean? Sorry. So in this page under CMD command, mm -hmm. it has three mm -hmm. forms: CMD param one, param two. Mm -hmm. So as default parameters to entry point. So what is the relation between CMD and entry point here? So entry yes, point. Sir. Just now I told you right. The difference between the CMD and entry point is entry no, point no. you cannot overwrite. Okay, the values whatever you defined at the time of front time you cannot overwrite. And this is in entry point basically use in this way. Okay, in the brackets you are going to give this way, and uh, directly if you are using CMD then you are going to use in this way. If you check the entry point in entry point you need to define in this way. Okay, in, under the brackets, and we are separating with double quotes in the entry point. And uh, directly in the CMD, you are going to use like a command. It's, if you see, like this is a shell from. Okay. So let me log into this Docker machine. In the meantime, let me uh, power on one more machine also. Mm. This one Jenkins server. So I'll show you uh, the CA job, how it will create and execute, and it will create a Docker image. So in the meantime, let me log into this one. So what we'll do, we'll create just a simple uh, Docker image of Nginx. So now uh, Docker PS, if you check, nothing is going to run. So now we'll create an um, Docker file for Nginx. Okay, how we can create our own Nginx? Okay, VI, or else we can create a directory called images then i'll go inside this one and here i'll create a, a docker file okay so the name should be the docker file and d should be the caps and here from and uh, we can use the base image any image so basically uh, 
which in, uh, base image will choose by the nginx we'll see that okay so let me come out of this file so docker run hyphen it mostly it will use debian images so we can also use the same images docker run hyphen it nginx cat etc os release and this is a image name they are using okay debian so i am also going to use the same one so let me come out of this one now vi docker file from debian okay let me take the latest version and then this is a base operating system inside that i am going to uh, install nginx so nginx obviously debian means what we are going to use apt get install and the package name but in the debian or ubuntu or first of all we need to use app to get update and then only we should use app to get installed as i said whenever we are writing uh, a docker file first of all always we should um, do the manual steps then only we can uh, write the docker file so let me directly go inside this uh, nginx image and um, or else maybe not nginx one not why should we go directly docker run hyphen it ubuntu bash plus plain uh, image i'm going to use not nginx so here i want to install nginx then manually how i can install in a ubuntu machine so app to get install nginx so if i try in this way it will not work because in ubuntu and debian always we need to use app to get update and then only it will install any packages so app to get update and then app get install nginx now it is installing so Why is asking these questions? Please select the city or region corresponding to your time zone. It should not ask these kind of questions because uh, if it is Docker image, then uh, we need to give these values over there. Okay, I'm not sure why it is asking Nginx to install this. So this way it will work. So same way now. So these are the manual steps to install. So same way, what we need to do, we need to write in the same manner, like uh, from, let's say, Debian, and uh, then if you want to use any uh, tag of the Debian, then you can use it, or else it will use the latest one. And run app to get install. Sorry, app to get update, and then I'll use run app to get install nginx fun y so here i'm giving two times i will show you when i create an image what will happen okay so now we can save this and uh, here it is a docker file i'm going to create an image so docker build hyphen t uh, nginx app dot so it will take the docker film from the present working directory service docker status it's running maybe we choose maybe driven spelling is wrong okay the spelling was wrong so now it is taking it contains three steps if you see here first step is the from step and second step is uh,
okay successfully created and if you see here this is the third step install nginx and y and uh, and this is the second step okay so when it's creating each step if you see this is one layer and under the third step it is showing another layer so these are the two run commands so it's created three layers for this image but as i said we should reduce the layers and you should make sure that the docker image size should be as less as possible okay for that you should not install multiple uh, things or execute multiple commands with multiple run commands okay you should use everything in a single command okay run command so now total three steps was there so now what i'm going to do the same thing again i'm going to create and uh, before that let me change the docker file and uh, here i'll delete this hmm app get sorry app get install nginx hyphen y okay so in the single run command if you are using and then docker build hyphen t nginx app 01 dot So if you see only steps two, only two steps it's created it means two layers. So image layers is reduced from three to two. So previously it was showing three and now it is showing. Where it is. okay here so step one from debian and step two single run command is showing both in a single layer so this is how we can reduce so now what i'll do i will show you uh, one real time example of uh, java applications okay so mm, this is assume this is one of the repository in the real time for developers for one of the java microservice okay or maybe it's an application so this everything is contains related to the uh, application okay this mbn commands everything and this is the source code where it contains java application main and test test cases they are going to write out here and main application which is contains here all the content of this application is available over here now we want to build this and once it is built it will create an uh, var file or jar file and that we, by using that jar file we can create an image okay so what we are going to do so inside this uh, source code wherever this is available actually this is only application part but here i created a directory okay if you see inside this docker directory as in devops engineers we need to create that and this is a docker file if you open this docker file what i am trying to do uh, from open jdk we are using because this is a java application so we should use uh, java compulsory so that's why i am using open jdk and what it is doing add or you can use copy also okay so star dot jar naming it as an app dot jar so from where this is getting so here if you go to this uh, jenkins file if you see here in the jenkins file these are the steps has been written okay so what it will do this is the pipeline scripts it will do uh, clone and it will it will clone the code 
and it will do what it will execute a maven command and it will create a package and once it is created package it is going to uh, copy the jar file into the docker directory because when this complete repository has been cloned in the jenkins server so this repository contains docker directory and application directories everything so this is copying the jar file where it will be get created in the jenkins jenkins home user under that workspace slash and the job name what are the job name you executed under that the target directory will be there and inside the target the jar file gets created and that jar file what is got created after executing this command is copying into the docker why it is copying because once it is copied the build docker image so what it is doing we are executing docker dot build and this is a repository so whenever we are executing here docker build command basically in real time use your we give tag in such a way that your repository name will be there repository slash image name okay so repository slash image name we are going to give so that when you use docker push command then this will push to the nexus or jfrog wherever you created there it will be pushed okay so here we are executing docker dot build and then we are using the docker file which is inside the docker command uh, docker directory after that so when we are executing this docker file to create docker image so in the docker already it contains this jar file so that's why inside this let me go back one step back so if we go into the docker directory as of now only one file is there but at the time of executing jenkins job along with this docker file the jar file gets copied over here why we need to put it here because in the docker file you cannot copy file from some other different location when we are talking about here copy command this way in the present working directory wherever you are this docker build command is getting executed in that present working directory whatever the file is there only that thing you can copy to the container but you cannot copy file from other some other different location to your container it's not possible so that's why we are using a copy command of jar file to the docker directory so that it will come and place it here so when the docker file is executed to build the image why this is getting stuck just a second guys it got stuck Can you able to hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes, yes sir. Sir. But the problem is my screen got stuck. It's not moving. So just give me. I think maybe because we have so many applications, I mean, opened. So many browsers. Oh, I don't know many applications are open, but not sure maybe. Even taskbar is also not working. We have to shut down or close or something. It may be due to Chrome, kill it. So I deleted the Chrome, so let me go back again. So here, GitHub.
okay so i was talking about this docker directory and here we can send a single file but uh, as per the uh, jenkins file so it will copy the as per the jenkins file if you see jenkins file is available here as per the jenkins file it will copy the jar file from target location to docker directory so when it's creating an image so what it will do it will take that var file so that's why this option is available here in the docker file okay here if you see inside this docker file when the, it's creating image so start or jar basically as of now in the present working direct is not available but at the time of jenkins job it's executed this file will be available and we are naming it as a jar file and in the entry point we are giving java and jar like to execute the java application so java and jar and uh, we are using this jar file name okay whatever the jar it got created so that application will be started so this is how it has been written and then once image has been created then we are going to do what we are pushing that image to the docker registry so these are the docker registry and these are the credentials we are passing and uh, we are pushing based upon the build number when the jenkins job is executed what was the build number for that job based on that build number it is going to be stored inside the repository it can be any repository or docker hub or nexus or whatever it may be we can provide it here so this way it will work so now what i'll do i'll uh, execute this job so that uh, we can see the console output how it is working and how the docker image will be created so let me log into my uh, aws account to log into the jenkins server Today my machine is working very slow. I don't know why. <laughs> so this is the Jenkins server. Okay, let me take the public IP and uh, open GUI. Okay, here I already have these two jobs and if you see this is one of the job I created for CI job and um, if you see in the configure like how to configure uh, pipeline jobs inside the configure it's very simple um, we are going to just configure here in the pipeline pipeline plugin should be installed nowadays by default in the Jenkins versions pipeline plugin is already installed in the previous versions this plugin manually we used to install so here we need to select pipeline script from ACM and then give the repository URL if it is a private repository then give the credentials and uh, in which branch the code is available in real time there will be multiple branches develop branch um, uh, release branch feature branch will be there so based upon which branch you want to test it you can use that which code because every branch code will be little bit of different code will be there so which one you want to test it you can configure the job and uh, the location of the jenkins file so in the repository present working directory itself jenkins file is there if it is in some other location then you should use the path okay where exactly this is available jenkins file that's it and we can execute this job Now I'm going to use build now. So let me see the output. So first it will clone. 
and then uh, so it is executing mvn clean install package so mvn command is getting executed if this is the first time then it will take a lot of time to download the necessary dependencies libraries jar files from the maven central repository and uh, once mvn clean is completed the task the next thing is it should copy the jar file to the docker directly before that it is doing some test cases whatever has been written So again, in real time, it depends upon uh, the test cases, whatever has been written by the developers, uh, how much capacity is there. See here, build is successfully done. Okay, here, the Maven build is completed and the next step is copy that uh, jar file. This is a jar file, it's copying this jar file to the Docker directory and then it's executing Docker build hyphen T and this is a repository name. Okay, Pavin Corv is a repository name and this is an image name. And uh, once it is done, once when it got executed, this is the three steps from OpenJDK, add this file from the local, from the Docker directory to container, and it is executed this one. Okay, and then it's executing Docker login, I find you, username, password, connecting to this registry, and uh, Docker tag. This is the image name with the repository. This way it is tagging. Okay, because if you see here, whatever the image it got created, it is giving a tag name eight because the build job is eight here. The number is eight. So that's why what it is doing. Docker tag. What are the image it got created? Basically, it created. This is the image name. Latest. So Docker tag. We are giving additional tag to that and the tag is eight the field number and then it is doing docker push registry okay and this way it is pushing see this many layers it's having it's pushed finished and if you want to see hub.docker.com Oh, see updated a minute ago. You see here, this is the image. Uh, so, see all. So, eight image is the latest one. Last updated two minutes ago because based on the build number, this is the latest attack. Okay, so this is how on the Nexus or JFrog repository docker images will keep on store because whenever here the developers uh, do the changes anything they do the changes like already testing has been done and then again uh, the qa guys recommended few changes again this guy did uh, some application changes again it will be created a docker image so that docker image contains what some changes in the application level okay which works perfectly fine so that way multiple docker images will be stored inside the artifactory okay as a history we can use which image we need to use okay the stable versions will note it down somewhere and uh, we'll use those images in multiple environments so this is how we do images creating images and once you jump into the real time based upon your requirement only you can start thinking how efficiently you can write your docker image okay <clears throat> so this is about the docker file and you can take a lot of references how the docker images has been written by give an example just now i shown you node and uh, um, jenkins or maybe any image 
example you can take they'll have a docker file they will provide you the docker file also but looking at that file you can see uh, how they have written what the steps they followed so if you search for anything in node.js nginx or uh, all these applications you can see this is the docker file they are also taking open jdk and run command okay by using multiple uh, commands here and arguments so to run the jenkins are also they are using these many commands okay so if you understand them then you can write easily how to write the jenkins file for your organization okay for your application images so any questions we will do some practice and come back Praveen, with questions yeah you need to yeah try to write your own jenkins files and try to build images so as i said when we are trying to build docker build at that time we will give uh, so this way so docker build hyphen t the um, what we say repo name okay with image name and the tag okay this way we'll give so that when we use docker push the repository url then it will go and push the images because we use docker login and the what do you say that url okay and we'll give username and password so that's why when we give docker push and the image name then it will connect to that repository and it will push the images okay manually when you are trying to do it for testing purpose you have one one linux machine and you have docker and you are testing and you want whatever your the testing image should be under your repository then you should use this way so today we talk about uh, docker compose okay So what is Docker Compose? What is the purpose of Docker Compose? Can anyone tell me what is Docker Compose? To deploy container multiple containers uh, i mean which have dependencies we can use compose yes. exactly see um, with docker file what we are going to define in the docker file we are going to define to create an image we are not even creating a container we are creating an image with the docker file so whatever you define inside that we can create an uh, image with that and with that image we can create a container but uh, the docker compose is for creating multiple containers okay then the multiple containers means if they are as uh, someone said it's a dependent like for example you want to deploy some applications like for example we have three tier application will be there right front end uh, will be there uh, middleware application will be there and back end database will be there to run any uh, dynamic web servers so these are the architecture we use so all three are this compulsory to run single application so front end and uh, middleware and back end these three are required so if you want to do the same thing in the containerization then three containers are required to achieve this so whatever the front end the website is accessing uh, it will access through the middleware and then back end will go and store in the database okay so this kind of scenarios all these three containers requirements can be specified in the docker compose and uh, if you uh, execute the command docker compose up then uh, 
what are the things has been defined inside the docker compose it will be created as a containers okay so in these scenarios for example lot of examples we have so uh, wordpress if you take wordpress if you want to create wordpress server then uh, it will create multiple containers okay so for that we have a predefined docker compose file is there okay so if you take a main stack application we have a predefined uh, docker compose file is there so main stack application we can achieve like we have lamp stack same way we have a main stack also okay so like this default uh, files are available but in your organization whatever is a requirement for your application how many containers are required and what should be the backend if the database is there all together you can write a docker compose file and uh, you can create the containers by using that docker compose file so here we write this docker compose file in the yaml format i hope you guys are already aware about the ansible right so ansible we use a yaml format it's a very simple uh, format compared to json or uh, html format uh, xml format yaml format is very easy to understand it's very simple it's like a key key value pair format will be there so it's not complicated like json or xml formats it's like a, it's not a programming language it's a syntax based uh, files will be there so yaml file so docker compose file also we use we use yaml syntax okay yaml format okay so by default docker compose will not be available with the uh, docker installation you need to install the docker compose and uh, so if you go into the documentation of uh, official website so compose is a tool for defining and running multi container docker applications with compose you can see use a yaml file to configure your application services then with a single command you create and start all the services so all the things will be defined inside the yaml file so with single command uh, you can create all the containers requirements inside that file whatever is defined <coughs> so here Define the services that make up your app in Docker Compose so that they can be run together in isolated environment. And this is a command means wherever this file is there, Docker Compose file, go to the directory and execute Docker Compose up. So it will trigger this file and whatever is defined inside this, it will get created. <coughs> and uh, let's see. WordPress Docker Compose. Mm -hmm. So to have the WordPress server, uh, we can have a, this is a Docker Compose file. Okay, if you see this is a docker compose file for that one and uh, This is a WordPress and this is a database. It is getting created and this is a per WordPress container It is going to take these images and it's creating volumes also So whatever is required to run on and if you see it depends on if it is mysql So mysql container also should be created for this one and one is creating created for php my admin it is getting created so these many containers it is getting created if you use wordpress okay so all this together will be created in a single go or else if you can take a main stack application so main stack uh, application is for MongoDB, ExpressJS, Angular, and Node.js. So that is the meaning of main stack. Like LAMP stack is there, like uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, okay, and uh, PHP. 
these are called as a full stack applications so if you want to achieve mean stack application and uh, if you see this is a angular is a client front end and back end server and this is a database so whatever the website runs dynamic websites the data is coming it is going to store inside this mongodb database and it will create three containers for node.js and express.js it will create one container and uh, front end client it will use uh, angular and back end database it use mongodb so if you want to create individually then you should have three different files docker files and these are the docker files we can use them okay so this is another docker file but if you use docker compose so you can use by default docker compose will not be available so you need to install we can use this command to install the docker compose and then this is the simple file to configure all these three containers and if you see here uh, service so angular it is going to be created with this particular port and uh, express js and this is using 3000 port number like you know right port forwarding how we do the same way it is doing and uh, if you see here links it is going to link with the database and database it is going to be created image it is taking mongo okay so with this it will create three containers and uh, database container will be created express js container will be created and all these three will be linked so we can able to access the website if it is really having any website in real time so you are going to have your own images your uh, for uh, Pradeep, example yeah uh, one question so uh, yeah. so if we launch containers from this uh, so database will also be exposed outside right if we uh, launch container from this uh, docker compose file so mm. database like uh, 27017 that port will be exported to outside outside uh, i mean yes uh, yes you can able yes. to access it from the external world okay we have to block it right i mean if you don't want you can you should not export the database port don't export the port so that you cannot able to access from the external world uh, how to access from only the front end in this what what you want to access from the front end uh, i want to access uh, database from only web uh, web server only from web server hmm so how can we map the ports in that case i did not get you i think he is asking i think he is asking there are three containers right the from the first container which is a front end and the hmm. middle one is the middleware and the third one is database if we block hmm. this port from the external world but how can i access from the first container See, from, yes, it's very simple in Linux machines. Assume these are Linux machines. So, from one Linux machine to another Linux machine, in one of the, um, one of the Linux machine, if you are accessing a database is there, and there is another Linux machine. So, how we are going to access the database? How you will access? Port user ID password. Yeah. The same way you are going to use it internally they can communicate you if you are not doing port forwarding then you cannot able to access from the external world but internally you can able to access it because here containers all are running on the same host and its port is there so how to connect mongodb what are the commands you use okay so those commands you use from the container web container whatever the web container you want to use log into that and you can use the commands to connect access the uh, database what are the mongodb if it is mysql then mysql life and h uh, the name of that container and then uh, port number if a new username so that it will connect to the mysql database same way some commands will be there to connect the mongodb same way you are going to connect by logging into the this container if this is the case, then we can able to access it from the external also. Okay, so these are the simple uh, example 
files which we can use docker compose so that we can create multiple containers so what i am going to do first of all i need to install a docker compose so with this curl command i am going to install it so before that let me log in Okay, so the command whatever we got the docker compose has been moved to USL local bin so that we can execute that command Now if you check docker hyphen compose So this is the command and these many options will be there for docker compose build bundle config depend upon the requirement you can use it Okay, so docker up create and start containers means wherever your docker file is docker compose file is there there should go to that particular directory like how we were executing a docker build iphone t and the present working directory of the docker file same way so we need to execute docker compose up means wherever in whichever directory we are present working directory there docker compose file should be there so that it get executed and um, docker down stop and remove containers means whatever the components got created with the docker up everything gets deleted also stop and it will get deleted all the components whatever it gets created and uh, start and stop is docker compose service will start if you use docker compose start and stop will do docker compose service will be stopped okay <clears throat> so and many more uh, options are available based upon the requirement you can use it so now let me uh, copy this file this one so let me create a directory or so let me create a file here itself and this should be inside with the yaml format okay so here we can execute docker hyphen compose up Hmm. Root Express server either does not exist, is not accessible, or it is not valid. You are think uh, his name is wrong. Uh, Docker dot compose dot by and Merit. It is three docker files should be there one is with angular app another one is express server and another one is mongo So this let me go with the wordpress okay so this is the one we can use it so wordpress uh, you would like to access hmm mk dir
so here let me execute uh, docker compose in the wrong compose file version specify supported example or yes, maybe it's like a yml is yml no uh, not sure but in kubernetes it will take yml or uh, yml it can take anything okay let's see It is staying inside the file, what are the version I defined? Uh, 3.6 is not supported. So that's why we need to change the version. Okay. So let me change the version here. 3.3, .3. the supported version is 3.3. .3. Means what are the Docker Compose version we are downloading and what version we are defining inside the compose file that matters okay previously for uh, main stack it was using three that's why we installed as per this uh, document we were using uh, three version okay so but now when i'm trying to see here this is a three so now to use this WordPress, it is expecting 3.6. So that's why whatever is got installed, which is not supported. So if I use, because now it's telling okay. specify supported version 2.2 or 3.3. Okay. So whatever is this? There is no official, let me check with Bitnami. Okay, now it is getting created. So one of the provider is Vietnam is also one of the good provider. So from there we copied the Docker Compose file. Okay, so which contains, if you go here, the Docker Compose file. So this is for same WordPress and this is a MariaDB database it is going to create and you can see the Docker image. If you have your own private repository, then you can use that location and it's going to create one volume and environment variable for username and password. And for WordPress, it's getting created the image from here, the WordPress image. And uh, this WordPress image is this uh, the ports we can able to see. Okay, and this WordPress is dependent on this MariaDB. And these are the environment variables have been configured for this one. Let me see. Mm, MariaDB installation commands are not there in that YAML file, right? See, here the image is there, right? Where is that? That WordPress. Uh, I this guess is there the is image. another file uh, with the name MySQL in the GitHub. If you get the image, then automatically it contains a MariaDB. Okay. We don't need okay. to install manually. Okay, MariaDB and version is mentioned yeah, here. Right? Okay. MariaDB image it is getting downloaded and it's getting okay. created. Two images are there. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. First image is MariaDB and second image yes. is WordPress image. Okay, got it. Yeah. 
so this is how it got created and if you see the volumes uh, we discussed about docker volumes so the local storage driver we're using it it's creating uh, two volumes which will store the data because database means uh, data should be available what are the data is coming okay so here let me go and see how many countries got created So these are the two contents got created one is wordpress uh, and one is mariadb got created and uh, so if you see here this is not port forwarding was not done for mariadb so if you see here internally it can communicate means container can communicate it's a wordpress container or any other container can able to access because if they are in the same network they can able to access this mariadb database with 3306 port and uh, this one if you see port forwarding has been done for wordpress okay so now we can able to access with this uh, ip of this virtual machine whatever we are using so it's an aws machine so obviously it contains one uh, public ip this is the one so let me access it So welcome to WordPress. This is your first post. Edit or delete it. So this is a WordPress uh, web page has been opened, and uh, whatever we want, uh, we can able to do it in case if you are uh, very good in the WordPress. Okay. So with this. Is this finished? Pravin, yeah. is this installed in the EC2 machine or the container? Container. This is a container. Mm -hmm. But where container is running, how you will able to access it from the external world? The machine IP, right? If the you install IP? in your laptop, yeah. Docker mm -hmm. you install in your laptop, and uh, you created a container, let's say Jenkins container you created, how you are going to access in the web browser by using the localhost, right? Because it is installed. Yeah, localhost, localhost with some port, I believe. Why we are not but using port? Doing... Because here port forwarding it's using 80. So for HTTP, we don't need to use by default 80. Okay, got it. Yep. Obviously, we will use 80 only. If apart from 80, another port, if the websites or any application are using, then we should give that port number along with the IP. But here, yes, got it. internally, it is using 8080 container, but it's port forwarding as an 80 only. So that's why I did not give any port number here to access it. If you give 80 also, it will not show you. <laughs> it will take by default, right? So it will not show you. Yeah. So that's why we can able to access it. So if uh, this is one container, if you are creating, you cannot create another container with same 80 port forwarding. Okay. You might be using some other port. So at that time, I will use uh, that port number with this IP so that I can redirect to that container application or whether it's a database or whether it may be any other application so we already discussed about this in the port forwarding concept right so this is how we can able to access and these are the two contents got created so the main purpose of this is um, to create multiple contents which are interdependent on each other so in that scenario we can able to use docker compose so all together will be created okay so very rarely we use we'll get uh, use of this docker compose in the real time so very rarely we may use it okay but even though if you want to use we need to know how uh, we can write it so it's very simple it's like a docker file uh, different between the docker file syntax and this syntax is different so here it's a complete yaml format it's like a key pair uh, key value pair we need to give it and if you use docker f1 compose can we scale this application scale means i mean like uh, two containers of uh, web server and two containers of db no Duplicate. that will come as an orchestrator okay. the next what we are going to discuss from tomorrow onwards which is a called Kubernetes. 
so in the orchestration tool it is possible to scale up scale down all these things individually you cannot do that so docker compose stop will stop the docker compose service okay uh, Praveen. <clears throat> yes so um, uh, regarding the scaling part okay so we mm. we, uh, we will mention one as web server other as db okay in our compose file and mm. uh, can we you know like uh, give that command like web server so we have already written let's say uh, we have written a docker compose file okay which has configuration of web server and database server okay Hmm. And after that, we'll do Docker Compose up. So at that point in time, so can we mention how many web server containers we need, how many DB server containers we need, and uh, we can run that? No, we cannot run replicas over here. Okay. So that will be possible only if you are using either Docker Swam or maybe any orchestrating tool like Kubernetes. There you can define, but here you cannot uh, run. Okay. So here we have an option called scale set number of containers for a service. Docker yes. compose. Let me check what is this option. This command is deprecated. Use the command with type and scale flag. So Docker hyphen compose scale. Mm. Maria DP and uh, driver fail programming external connectivity. Port is already allocated. So maybe it is not allowing to create port, but maybe this is uh, possible with the scale command. Okay, so we can use uh, the value, whatever the values we want to give. But if there's one container is using one port, how come another container is also going to use the same port here? Okay, so that's why we, if you see here, we cannot start service WordPress driver failed. External connectivity on endpoint WordPress, it is giving error. Port is already allocated. So, whatever the port is used uh, for this specific container, so if it is getting created another container, then for that container, it cannot able to use again same, it cannot use internally, it can use, but it cannot do the port forwarding. So, 88, 80 on 80 port number, two containers cannot run. Okay. So if you see here, it is not possible we to do to the say, port forwarding. Uh, we need to modify the YAML file, uh, you know, port numbers then, uh, in order what to. What is the point? If you are using, uh, if you are using another container with 81 port, then there are two different things. Then how we will you able to access it? Okay. So that's why this FAM or orchestration tool comes into the picture. So if there is any not port forwarding concept is there, then you can scale it. But in real time, if any application is running, if that application is using some port, okay. So maybe if this is an 80 port number and uh, this, if you are, if you want to scale this application, so here also it should run 80. So front end like uh, multiple countries if you are scaling up, Overall, this should have like a kind of a load balancer from here the traffic will come and it will access and it will send the request to each individual containers. But here without Docker Swam or Kubernetes or any other um, orchestration tool, 
it is not possible because when you are trying to create container it is telling in the internally it should not again you cannot use you cannot expose 80 port number this we discuss in the port forwarding so one container if you are created with uh, port forwarding 80 and uh, again you forward to 80 and another one should be like 8081 or 8082 you should use so if there are two different ports then externally they cannot be accessible together they are like two individual components okay two individual containers so if there is no port concept then you can create but again as i said they are not together they are like two individual containers only okay so there is no concept of your application scale up and scale down whenever there is a high load then uh, another container should be created and another uh, so both should be serve the application so that is not possible because here both the countries cannot have the same ports okay so if we bring down docker compose uh, our containers will also come down so as i said docker hyphen compose here down means what it will do it will delete whatever the components it gets created and it will remove all the containers or networks or whatever it got created everything it gets deleted okay and uh, if you do docker stop okay then only docker service will be deleted but whatever the components it's there so it will be available but it will be not in the accessible state okay so if you see two volumes also it, it has been created means in the compose file it is defined to create volumes also means it's created to containers and volumes and if you see docker images it's downloaded a docker image the wordpress image and mariadb image so these images will get deleted and volumes gets deleted and contents get deleted if you use docker uh, down docker stop means only that docker compose service will be stopped okay docker compose hyphen stop if you do only stop the docker compose service okay it will not delete any of your resources that is the difference okay okay so this is about uh, docker compose so um, tomorrow onwards we are going to start the kubernetes sessions so before that just i want to give like someone asked me in the previous sessions about uh, i'll give some overview about docker spam okay so as we discussed till now whenever we are creating a container okay it is creating on a virtual machine one virtual machine and this content is getting created so we don't have any kind of high availability for this container let's say if it is having a, we configured this container with put 880 exposed and we are accessing from the external world if something happens to this virtual machine then uh, there is no chance of again recording this machine so how we can achieve high availability how we can run multiple containers which serve the same application and uh, whenever anything happens to this one uh, how will auto scale how to create volumes all these things we can achieve with the orchestration tool so already we discussed orchestration tool are available docker spam and uh, kubernetes and uh, mesos and uh, cloud foundry these are some um, famous enterprise level orchestration tools are available so why we don't use docker spam because docker spam will have limited features and kubernetes having lot of features compared to docker spam and that is the reason and a uh, lot of uh, communities also there for support so which can help us uh, troubleshooting the solutions and uh, it's a free of cost open source so that's why we use kubernetes instead of docker swam but just an overview how docker swam will work so basically we don't need to install any separate uh, package for docker swam so you can use docker swam in it to initialize okay how to link with the db db container and web, web container how to in the wordpress uh, automatically it is uh, defined if you see here here in the wordpress it is depends on if you see here depends on iphone maria db and these are the environment variables which we are using inside the wordpress 
okay so mariadb port number and mariadb host here we are defining so that's how it is going and connecting to that database okay. so docker swam just if you execute docker swam init command it is giving a command to join the nodes so whatever the nodes you have let's say if you have multiple nodes so this is one machine and uh, it's the same way you have multiple machines assume we have four virtual machines okay so all the machines should be installed with uh, docker software and very simple so this docker should be available in all the machines and once i executed a docker swam and in it then what it is going to do it is going to initialize this cluster and it will give you this command so what we are going to do we need to execute this command in all this work on so this all will become one cluster and uh, at that time it will create the network okay overlay network previously we were talking about bridge network right then it will create overlay network so once we execute that command in these machines then this will be part of this cluster and this machine wherever i executed docker swam in it will become as a manager node and these are will become worker nodes okay so the docker swam is going to manage from here and these are called worker nodes okay so as of now let me see i have a lot of other servers so i will use one of the server by installing a docker let me use tomcat um, no, i want to use this one So I will install uh, Docker inside this machine. Let me connect to this machine and uh, Mostly, I think nowadays no one is using this Docker Swarm. Let me check what is the key for this one. Patch. Okay, so yum install docker. So let me copy this command with this token, it is going to add that particular node into the cluster. Sorry, service was not running. Service docker status, service docker start, chk config docker on. Okay, service is up now. Then, just simple, we need to execute this command. The node joined it. Sorry, your screen is not visible. My screen is not visible. Uh, we can see. Yeah, we can see. Everyone able to see uh, Ben? So please check from your. Yes, it's so once it is done, uh, Docker node ls 
this is a command we can see how many nodes has been created so the wherever we executed the docker swam initialization command that is going to become as a manager which is showing as a leader and this is uh, showing as an uh, worker node okay and this is a unique id it is going to generate whenever you add a node to your cluster it will be created okay so this is how it will be created and multiple nodes you can add it here again you can remove it this node from the cluster also and you can add multiple nodes and um, basically this docker is having uh, different components okay this docker swam so like uh, docker swam components service is there task component is there okay so nodes services and task a service is a definition of the task to execute on the manager or worker nodes so it is a central structure of the swam system and the primary route of user interaction with the swam okay so what it will do services means what you want to create you want to create a web application or you want to create anything so it will be created inside the manager node means uh, here so in the manager node we are going to execute this service and it will become as a task and will go and deploy inside this work node if you create a if you want to deploy an application we will create a service here inside the master uh, this one manager node so once we execute that service and it will become as a task and it will go and execute on this particular worker nodes so let me see docker spam you see here docker service create hyphen hyphen replicas one hyphen hyphen name of that service and this is the image okay so when you execute you can able to execute it this will create a service So this is a service it is got created and it's created one replica and a docker ps if you see and uh, uh Pravin is service a container see here service means like uh, it can be anything you can create container you can create volumes you can whatever the components you want to create with the help of the name the component name is service with that you can able to create anything you can create containers also okay hmm. web application so you created service in master node or in worker node see that we execute in the master node from where we want to create these services these commands will be executed on the master node so manager node from there it will go and uh, it will tell to the worker nodes to deploy whatever we are creating okay and the worker nodes it will be a task whatever the service has been created so that will be a task to a worker node so it will go and create those components whatever you are defining with the service so it will get deployed created inside the worker nodes okay um So this one docker service create nginx so nginx image it will take and it will create one container and you can see the 
docker service ls command manager node means where you are going to execute all these commands docker service create or whatever the commands you're executing there you are going to execute this command and uh, what are that this is this will become as a task to the work node because you are telling to create nginx so in the work nodes it will go and create this nginx container inside any of the work node so if you are mentioning replicas 3 then it will go and deploy inside this uh, machine as a three replicas okay so here when i created this command docker service uh, create one replica so where it got created when i executed it from here if i do this command here so i have two machines so it might be created over here so let me go and check there okay this is the container got created so now let me remove this all this uh, meaning too so i have two uh, machines one is manager one is worker node i mentioned uh, docker uh, what was the command so this was a command okay so when i'm using this command what it is doing it is creating one replica so docker service create hyphen and replicas one the name of this service what we are creating alpine with alpine image it will create a container okay so one replica means what it went and deployed on the worker node if you define two then it will create on these two machines so now what i am going to do i'll create a two replicas okay mm, the same thing i'll use nginx here and replicas will be two i'm executing this on the manager node already exists okay sorry this service name already exists so that's why it is giving error nginx world this is the name we can give I'm preparing two containers. Two tasks. See, overall progress two out of two tasks means when service is created, it is a task. Means we are telling that create two containers with the Nginx image. So this task will go and deploy on the worker node. Now, if you check Docker PS. You see here one nginx is there and uh, in another container in the another virtual machine we have docker ps is there. so nginx so two containers has been created so lot of things is there in the uh, this orchestration tool but we are not focusing on docker spam so like uh, how to access it what are the other components we can create uh, if you have enough time then you can do r d with the docker spam so we can uh, because anyhow we are going to learn the kubernetes orchestration tool so just for uh, time being i am showing you how it works so it will also take a lot of uh, sessions if you want to learn about docker spam then a uh, lot of components are there in the docker spam so you can do r d if you have enough time so tomorrow onwards we'll start with the kubernetes okay the introduction and from tomorrow onwards regularly we'll start the kubernetes sessions okay if you have any doubts you can ask me one for you yeah yeah uh, is there any possibility of uh, you know manager and uh, worker node uh, is in, uh, can be in a one instance manager yes it's manager possible and, okay. yeah possible and uh, so manager can also like... become as a worker node also okay okay and the other query is like uh, can we do ftp to any container is it possible what is the purpose of ftp uh, no it's like you know i have personal interest on that so i just no, i'm just asking what is mm -hmm. ftp why you want to do ftp like uh, if i'm working on wordpress no 
<clears throat> sometimes i need to edit uh, you know uh, php files so i wanted to do ftp to the container yeah see when you want to do ftp you need to install mm -hmm. ftp package inside that container right okay. vs ftp if it is a vs ftp package is there ftp package need to be installed so ftp will listen on which port mm -hmm. 2021 okay so 2021 port should be exposed so you need to do port forwarding for that container 2021 also should be able to accessible from the external so once okay. it is done then you can able to access that ftp okay okay so okay. it's it is same like a normal instance okay yeah only thing is you need to do port forwarding otherwise you cannot able to access it from the outside or else okay. on internally you can able to access means from one container to another container you can able to access it but from outside you if you want to access it then you should do port forwarding then only it will be accessible okay got it thank you thank you uh, so praveen i have a question yeah so can you please explain the difference between entry point and uh, cmd once again with some example the entry point cmd both will do the same, but only difference is uh, CMD can be modified during the runtime and entry point. We cannot modify whatever the value you are giving that is not going to be modified during the runtime. That is the only difference between CMD and entry point. I have a question. Okay. If you want. If we need to troubleshoot any issue with the container, I mean, how do we go about that? I mean, what are the basic command that we can use to troubleshoot? Yeah, you can use Docker logs and the container ID. So these are the logs you can use, whether the country is having any problem, any errors you want to see. So the Docker logs is going to help you the docker log command and the container id it will help you to check what is happening with that container to troubleshoot uh praveen one thing more yeah like uh, when we write uh, these linux commands so in some commands you use a uh, bash at the end like for shell and somewhere uh, you use sh somewhere bin bash so uh, is there any difference or like are they same see bash, there is a difference between bash and sh okay but bin bash or uh, only give bash or sh that doesn't matter okay it will take bash also directly if you give bash it will take the bash shell or if you give only sh it will take sh shell no need to give bin always okay so sometimes basically i prefer bash because uh, uh, bash is going to have tab so if you use tab once you log into the container so tab will work with the bash shell that's why i prefer bash shell instead of ssh shell so you can use any shell that container should be have that shell if that container doesn't have the shell then uh, what are the shell it is available we need to use it so mostly every container will have bash so preferably we can use bash shell itself so what how do we decide how do we hmm? decide like uh, how do we know that uh, we should use a bash over here or sh or uh, some other see that we can't tell uh, it completely depends upon the image uh, for example if you are using jenkins if you are using jenkins container or engineers container back end you don't know which uh, os they might be taking whether they are taking debian ubuntu or centos or alfine we don't know so we just need to try by before logging to the container we should uh, check that 